although I was too young to fully understand the sacrifice made by my parents in uprooting their lives and that of their children. Over the years, I eventually put the pieces of the puzzle together to discover that one of several main reasons which promoted them, which prompted them to immigrate to the US was to ensure for better opportunities for the education and future for their children, but especially for their two daughters. It was a complicated, difficult move, with only, which only over time, truly over time, I began to understand more fully through conversations with my parents and my siblings. My parents were members of a minority religious community that was ill-treated, persecuted, and at times violently attacked by government and clerical decree. My parents' belief system viewed the education of all children as obligatory, gave precedence if a choice had to be made to the education of girls, and promoted the equality between women and men. In large part, it was these ideas that motivated my parents in their mid-40s to contemplate a radically different life for their children and themselves. The choice to uproot the family was not easy, and a new life in a new country was, as it always is for many immigrants, filled with obstacles, trials, and challenges. In the end, I believe my parents were happy with their choice. Their three children were given new opportunities and freedoms. They received the good education that they had hoped for, including the education of their daughters, which had been a source of anxiety for them back in Iran. <clears throat> I share this story not because I think it's unique, but because it is a story about the different forms of freedom, individuality, and self-distinctiveness that can take and the different human yearnings for these forms of being. The freedom of thought, of conscience, of opportunity, of choice, of movement, of belief, of individual expression. For women, Freedom and individuality continues to shape their history as women continue to struggle to achieve full equality and at the same time to be their genuine, authentic selves. The social realities of women's lives are always undergird deep-seated historical philosophical, social, and religious notions about women belong, about where women belong, how they belong, and who they belong to. Over the centuries, women have been treated as chattels, confined to narrow spheres of activity, excluded from participation, deprived of a voice in public life, denied educational opportunities, and submitted to the further indignity of being forced to support and maintain the same patriarchal systems that treated them as second-class beings, as subhumans, embodiments of sin, witches, or soulless entities. To paraphrase Simone de Beauvoir, who in turn paraphrased Sartre, an ontology for women ought to determine a priori what a woman is, uncontested, unrelated, before definitions. Yet by placing women into a situated system before their identity is affirmed, women's identities are rooted in a prefabricated ideal. <clears throat> from an ontology that endorses male supremacy comes an epistemology that benefits masculine identity and a taxonomy that symptomizes female exclusion. <clears throat> Sameness is not what we need among women. More than ever, we must be aware of each other's dissimilarities our beautiful diversity 
and individuality. We must be generous and supportive in the latitude that we allow each other and gracious in our lack of judgment. Nothing, I believe, is more freeing and authentic than for an individual to have the space and freedom to explore and come to terms with their own selfhood and individuality. This is what we need and this is what it takes to keep an entire civilization afloat. Respect for each other, support for one another, women alongside each other and alongside all others, seen or unseen, leading, guiding, following, escorting, carrying through the breach. The world is getting exhausted. And yet women have the unique ability to present a vision of what a different and better world might look like. As has been so often seen throughout history, when the world gets exhausted, when violence and destruction <clears throat> have brought loss, devastation, and ruin, when all else has been attempted, people, communities, and nations have looked to women. They have embraced times when alternative voices are needed. They have looked to those who can chart a new course. <clears throat> Gospel singer Mahalia Jackson is a stunning example of how a woman's words and a woman's presence shaped the fabric and grammar of a uniquely American occurrence. A proud, God-fearing woman, Mahalia Jackson, was standing, as so many women often do, just off to the side during one of history's greatest moments. As Martin Luther King gave his famous speech on that march uh, on that, at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, King's advisor Clarence Jones recalled that at that moment when Dr. King was con contemplating the ending of his speech, he wasn't quite sure if he had the right ending. Mahalia Jackson cried out, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. <clears throat> His reaction, his um, advisor later said, his reaction to it was to look in the direction of Mahalia Jackson, <clears throat> to look in the direction of Mahalia Jackson, but then to take the prepared text that he was reading and slide it to the left side of the lectern. A voice of a trusted and distinguished woman changed history on that day. Soviet dissident Irina Ratushyanska turned her ghastly years in a labor camp into a triumph of the human spirit. She was 29 years old, a 29 year old physicist when she was sentenced to seven years in a labor camp for voicing her concern about human rights violations and for writing a disturbing set of poems. In the gulag, she abided on a diet of rotten fish and broth and stale bread, nearly dying as a result, refusing, as she said, to allow hatred to take root. She wrote poetry by using burned matchsticks to sketch poems on bars of soap. When I finished, she said, I would memorize it, meaning the poem, wash my hands, and send it down the drain. She transferred her memorized poems onto cigarette paper, smuggled out of prison to her husband, who had them published in the West. Irina said about her tortured years in prison, they can't confiscate your brain. In one of her poems, Smuggled Out, she wrote, I'll live through this, survive, and they'll ask me how they beat my head on the prison cot, how it froze during the nights. Later, in the same poem, she captures an elegant instance of beauty 
on a prism window in prison. And she says, and I'll tell them about the first beauty which I saw in this captivity. Window in frost. Irina defies the brutality of her incarceration and instead turns her attention to the frost on the window. Look close, she says. You'll see it begins to blossom even more. She ends the poem by telling us about the violence of prism ice, which she then turns into a holiday and a gift. As a captive, she acutely appreciated life and never lost control of her dignity. May we only survive, she said. And a decade or so after her release from prison, she reflected, in a way, it's lucky to have a turbulent life. When everything is too easy, sometimes people lose their love of life. They lose enthusiasm. In a frigid garden, a measure of freedom still bloomed. The Iranian poet, Simin Behbahani, puts it this way. To stay alive, you must slay silence. Behbahani lived long enough in Iran to witness mandatory removal of the veil, and then the compulsory wearing of the veil, and then the removal of the veil, and then the wearing of the veil. Her poems give voice to the oppressed. They rupture the muffled, silenced lives of Iranian women. In her poem entitled From the Street, number six, Behbahani commemorates a woman killed by state in a moving poem and refers to the way the judge examines the law, which is hidden in his hand. The stark difference between the openness of her poem and the closed realm of the judge's law is stark. Behbahani combines the crushing forces of religion, law, and patriarchy to describe an episode in which a woman is slayed by stoning. When the woman confessed for the fourth time, stoning her became necessary. As commanded by religion, the judge had opened this knot with his own hands, revealing the, he seek the, revealing the hidden secret to the public. Behbahani's poetry and her voice speak to the rights of every person, avoiding engagement in party politics and never resorting to violence as an answer to repression and injustice. Behbahani, like so many women, defied the grinding, crushing, violent control of tyranny. In May 2008, May Mahfash Sabet was arrested along with several others they were sentenced to 10 years in prison, primarily for adhering to a religion that promulgated the idea that men and women were equal. And thereby equal before not only God, but men. Detained in a 13 by 16 foot cell, she noted, and I quote, a prison does not merely consist of high walls and barbed wire. They accuse you, threaten you, abuse you, curse you, humiliate you and you have to endure it all, knowing that this could lead to further charges, more indictments, longer imprisonment ahead. Worse than this was that they wanted me to forget who I was. They wanted me to forget what I believed, forget my identity. This will sound similar to some of our own remembrances of an at times difficult latter half of the 20th century in North America. As will her means of preservation and solace, she says, I found that I could express my deepest feelings through my poems. They could contain my misery and my suffering, my anguish at being separated from my friends and my family, and in addition to recording painful moments of crises, they became the place where I could record my little victories. And in one of her poems, she writes, what are they going to do to us in this perilous place in prison of loss? But what can they do to a handful of dust in the middle of chaos? 
If they cut open our veins, red tulips will blush like, flood, like blood in the fields. If they padlock our lips, the mouths of a thousand spring buds are unsealed. The last example, and I'm coming to a conclusion, concerns the 45-year-old African-American woman, Harriet Tubman, who in 1868 asked the United States Senate for three years back pay for hired work she had done during the Civil War. She had worked as a nurse, as a hired work, and uh, I'm sorry, she had worked as a nurse, a cook, and commander of several men. During the Civil War, she was appointed commander of an expedition in South Carolina where she and several men who were assigned to her penetrated enemy lines and successfully destroyed railroads, bridges, cut off major supplies for the rebel troops. On July 10, 1863, the Commonwealth, a Boston newspaper, reported the following. Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers under the guidance of a black woman dashed into enemy's country, struck a bold and effective blow, destroying millions of dollars worth of commissary stores, cotton, and lordly dwellings, and striking terror into the heart of rebeldom brought off near 800 slaves and thousands of dollars worth of property without losing a man or receiving a scratch. It was a glorious consummation. That's the newspaper story. The mission was led by Harriet Tubman. You know, she was born a slave in Maryland, in Dorchester County, Maryland, where she escaped slavery and became a major force as an abolitionist on the Underground Railroad. The Boston newspaper wrote of Ms. Tubman's campaign, it is significant as the only military engagement in American history wherein a woman, black or white, led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. The whole venture, the newspaper said, owed its success to the complete preliminary survey made by Harriet Tubman, Tubman's espionage troops. So now, writing about this incident more than a century later, the late, great Toni Morrison wrote, 30 years after Miss Tubman, black, female, mother, daughter, nurse, cook, wife, and commander of several men, Asked a room full of sexist, I'm quoting Morrison, asked a room full of sexist, bigoted, class conscious white men for her back pay. They granted it. Morrison explains that the reason she chose to write about this incident in one of her talks was because, and I quote, the key to feminine oppression is most clearly seen in the response of her stand a response that gathered together the full force of the special brand of American racism and sexism. And don't think she didn't know that. Don't think that she wasn't aware of that. They gave her $20 a month for life. She was 75 years old then. And they probably did not expect the pension to have to last very long. Stubborn as a woman. She lived 13 more years. Toni Morrison goes on to say, if you took the gaze of the white male, or even the white female, but certainly the male, out of the world, it was freedom. You could think, and you would think anything, go anywhere, imagine anything. There was no longer the problem of looking through the master's gaze. Women, I guess what I'm trying to say, have never shied away from making their contributions to the world, even under the most difficult of circumstances. As women continue to advance their goal and desire for attaining equality, as they bring their influence 
and capacities into every corner of the world, women will have, in my opinion, achieved the precondition to the attainment of peace. I think in large part, my thoughts about the subject matter began when I was asked, um, when, well first when I decided to organize this conference on, about women, um, it triggered something in me um, that I think I had buried for a while. But also, I think what happened was that I was asked to write an article for a sociological journal about freedom and the Iranian women. And writing that article did something to me. Um, and, and it was good. It was, it was one of those moments where um, things awaken in you that uh, help you understand things better. The assignment was very difficult, but very illuminating. Iranian women, like so many, many around the world, are breathtaking in their acts of courage, strength, and endurance as they live day-to-day -day lives under laws of censorship, suppression, and control. Self-expression for Iranian women and so many, many women around the world can be a matter of life and death. They lack legal protection and their basic human rights are unprotected. They, like so many other women around the world, endure psychological, physical harassment, beatings, torture, and are subject to untold injustices. But despite all that, despite all of those restrictions and boundaries that restrict them, they demonstrate their astonishing, sensitive, emotional, and intellectual creativity through expressions in poetry, literature, film, and other artistic forms, and they support each other. Their nonviolent movement for selfhood, for individuality, for their freedom, has persisted for almost 40 years. Like many other suppressed women around the world, they courageously persist through their bold actions in advancing their peaceful, nonviolent, and moral movement to obtain nothing more than their full equality. In all of our analysis of the lives of women in the world, let us make sure that we continue to remember their example, their bold actions. Let us also pay tribute to them and honor them. Let us be reminded and challenged by these stories. The conference set for today and tomorrow, as I said, features scholars who represent multiple disciplines and whose topics explore many sides of why women have not yet achieved full equality. As we hear their presentations, we will have a more robust understanding of the important topic of women's equality and its relationship to making the world a better place. Thank you. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, Galia Golan. You, <laughs> you have her uh, full bio in the program, but just let me tell you, she is Professor, em she's the Darwin Professor Emerita, formerly chair of the political science department, founder of the Lafer Center for Women's Studies, and of Israel's first women's studies program in 1981, all at the Hebrew University. She is well, very well published. She has written many articles, many books listed in your program. I don't want to take any more time but to invite her to please come to the podium and she will talk about what blocks equality for women. Dr. Golan. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, okay. 
First of all, I'd like to thank Oda and, and Kate uh, for inviting me and taking such good care of me. I might get used to it. It's lovely. Um, and I guess the thing that was missing from the introduction is that I'm a peace activist. And that's so much a part of my identity that <laughs> there it is. Um, I was actually going to begin with a um, with uh, mentioning something that Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada said, but I think his image has been a bit tarnished recently. But I will uh, quote him anyway. When he was asked, as I'm sure you all know, when he was asked why he insisted on having 50% of his uh, cabinet to be gendered equality, he said um, simply uh, because it's 2015. And that's, of course, the case. But still, the truth is that here we are in this conference still asking why we don't have gender equality. And I think it's, I don't need to go into details or statistics. I think it's quite clear that in most countries, if not all countries, um, we do not have gender equality. And there have been, of course, many explanations for this from the biological explanations of lions and tigers to the psychoanalytical that you know, boys need to separate from the mother. Um, some explanations were found in the dichotomy of the public and private spheres where women's place is in the private sphere, obviously, home, children. And by the way, in some religions, uh, that's considered a privilege, an honor. A woman is in the home, she's the queen, she's on a pedestal. Um, that's in fundamentalist Judaism. The, um, but this public-private dichotomy is that women are protected by the public sphere, they're protected by the men, but they also happen to be excluded from economic life, from business life, from politics, even from the arts. And of course, there have been exceptions over the centuries, but I think that we can still see that there are two levels, two levels of status, of opportunities, of expectations. And this is pretty much still with us. Um, and of course, we still have many explanations for this. Feminists in the 20th century began to understand this as a situation or the result of patriarchy. Because most of us live in societies wherein the institutions and the norms have been created by men according to their needs, their interests, their inclinations. And I don't think this is necessarily out of disdain for women or contempt for women. Um, I'm not even certain that it was intended to preserve their power, although some would argue that that was the reason. But circumstances were such that most societies were or have been shaped by men, and the result is patriarchy. Namely, priority for men. Entitlement, if you want to call it that. Or at least the institutions and norms that suit men, mainly. And in many cases, these things aren't even seen or grasped as male-shaped uh, or oriented institutions. In many cases, these things, these norms, are in internalized and have been internalized for centuries even by women, even by women, and viewed as natural, as totally natural. But in looking at all of this, I've been searching for one of the things that Hoda mentioned, of course, is how we change the situation. How can we achieve equality and break down the barriers that stand uh, before us and prevent gender equality. I acknowledge that equality um, is an ideal. It's, it's not necessarily a reality. Obviously not all men are equal. Uh, in most countries, there are many inequalities by class, by race, by religion, by ethnicity. Uh, even men are not all equal. But I do think that we can talk about a universal principle, a universal principle 
that is clearly enshrined in the system of democracy, a principle that entails equality before the law, equality of opportunities. And uh, in fact, what we get out of the Protestant Reformation in Europe is equality simply as human beings. In the revolutionary movements, the late 19th century, 20th century, revolutionary women tended to be universalists, uh, anarchist Emma Goldman or uh, Marxist like Rosa Luxemburg, these social revolutionaries. They believed that revolution would end classes and with the end of classes, you would have cre equality for everybody. Uh, the idea being that if there's no longer exploitation, everyone has the same relationship to production, we'll have equality, including gender equality. So although they did speak specifically of the rights of women, they did believe also that this would come as part of this overall redemption uh, and reorganization of society that would presumably benefit everybody. Of course, we have seen where that actually occurred, where there was a revolution, where there was a total reorganization of society, and the expected equality certainly didn't result. My first 20, 30 years in academia, I'm a Soviet specialist, uh, and I can assure you that the revolution did not bring equality. But if we look to the early feminists, the first wave of feminism in the late 19th century, early 20th century, especially if we look at the suffragettes, not all of them demanded the vote uh, or equality as uh, a matter of principle, or rights um, that go with democracy. Of course, many of them did, in fact, speak about the principle. Uh, but there were those who also said that women should have the vote because women would do things differently. They would clean up politics. That was one of the slogans. They were more moral than men. They would bring their qualities from home, their nurturing qualities, into the public sphere, an ethics of caring. But whether they demanded rights in the name of democracy, that is rights, the principle of rights, or if they acted out of this claim that they would bring something better, something different. They, um, the idea was certainly to gain equality. They, I guess if we look from the perspective today, we would say they were liberal feminists. They were dealing with or advocating liberal feminism, basically saying, let us in, let us in. The way to break down the barriers was simply to join the existing institutions and to create equality from within. This, some people call this, you know, add women and mix kind of thing. Let us in. This was the idea. But I think the deeper analyses went further. And um, there are a few key phrases that, that I've sort of uh, grabbed onto in studying feminism. Groundbreaking statements, in my opinion. One of them was Cynthia Inlow's, where are the women? Where are the women? And she asks us to ask that question all the time. Are they invisible? Where are they? They weren't counted. You may remember, uh, I think it was Bem who said women were left out of statistics, in sociology, in medicine. Women weren't there. And of course, Cynthia Inlow was talking about it in terms of war. But the idea is women weren't in the picture. They were theoretically affected by what was going on. And they certainly weren't in the decision-making circles. And so that's one statement that stays with us. Where are the women? Where are the women? We have to ask that. The second one that I like is Carol Gilligan's In a Different Voice. Uh, she basically, in her work, was countering, trying to counter the claim by, uh, that was fairly prominent, 
in psychology that women were less moral than men. Um, she didn't say women were more moral. She said they were simply different, speak in a different voice, and that was what she brought. Women's experience is different from men. It's not, it's not necessarily better, it's not necessarily worse, but women may, in fact, bring something different. And um, that's, I think, another really very important thing uh, or, or insight that's, that's important in feminism. The third groundbreaker is from Catherine McKinnon, who's sort of something of my idol. In answer to the liberal approach, uh, where she was dealing, she's a law faculty, law professor, she was dealing with uh, the labor code, where basically the idea was in, in employment, all things being equal, pick the woman. But she said, all things aren't equal. Our things, all things are not equal. We do not begin equally. It's not an even, an even playing field. All things are not equal. And we might call this uh, the beginning of, or the core of radical feminism. It looked at patriarchy and it said, we don't just join. You can't win there in their game. You have to change it. You have to change it. You have to counter patriarchy head on and rebuild society because we can't, we don't and can't compete equally in the society that they built according to their norms, their interests, their inclinations. I'll give you an example of this where it finally struck home. Not terribly long ago, about 20 years ago, um, a, younger, a young woman law professor where I was teaching um, one time stopped me on the campus and said, you know, you didn't do us any favor. I didn't exactly understand what she meant. She said, you early feminists in Israel, um, you, you get, get this, We're, we go out and we work and we can work in any profession, but you didn't change anything else. So we've got all that other stuff. We've got the double burden that I'm sure most of you know. You didn't change society. Society wasn't built for us. In Israel, the school day ends at one o'clock. What's a woman supposed to do? All kinds of things of this nature. Even transportation, public transportation. Women are the ones who mainly use tra public transportation. Is it organized according to their needs? This is the kind of thing that she pointed out. And it was sort of like you know, on the, the bell, the, the, the light bulb up there. All of a sudden I realized that she was absolutely right. It wasn't just let us in, let us be professors, let us be doctors, whatever. We have to change society because society was not built for us. And so it's not just a matter of the legal system, the laws are important, but I'll give you a second example comes home. We had a very famous case. We created a, a women's organization in 1984. And one of the things that we did was to bring a case to the Supreme Court in Israel. It's a famous case of Alice Miller. And this was a young woman who had a civil uh, pilot's license and she wanted to take, so when, when she won her, her regular army service in Israel, she wanted to go into pilot training. They didn't let women into the pilot training course. They didn't have to take women into the Air Force as pilots in Israel. So we took it to the Supreme Court, and the court not only decided that, yes, she had the right to take the course, but the reason this case was so important was two. One is the judgment was on the basis of equality, the principle of equality. The second was they said the Army had to change. Okay, it's hard for you to accommodate a woman. You have to change. You have to change. You don't bring her into your system that doesn't really work well for a woman. And that's, that was, I think, the importance of that decision, at least for me. It was that we've got to change society and not just bring women in. Then the new challenge came in what we call the third wave of feminism 
and that was an attack on essentialism. Not all women are the same. <laughs> As you mentioned, not all women are the same. There were different classes, races, ethnic groups, religious groups, not all the women are the same. And that's what we see today. We talk about intersectionality. Uh, I was once on a panel at the university, and one of the women was an Arab woman, a Palestinian citizen of Israel, and she explained a very interesting touch of intersectionality. She was a woman in Arab society where women were not on an equal level, and she was an Arab in Israel. So she was, as she put it, right there at the bottom. She was an Arab, which is bad enough if you're in Israel, in a minority, and within that minority, she was gender related. So we, uh, you in America know intersectionality probably better than most, uh, but certainly if you take a woman who lives in an area of conflict, in a militaristic society, a woman is going to be even more disadvantaged because the male, of course, has a certain position, entitlement that goes along with the position as the warrior, the protector, who may actually sacrifice his life for others. But another feminist thinker whom I like, although she's less known, is the late Susan Oaken. Accepting the idea, of course, not all women are the same. But what she pointed out was that in every class, every ethnic group, every whatever the group or category might be, women's experience is different from that of men. Maybe entirely different from a woman from another class or another race or another ethnic group. But in every one of these categories, in these groups in life, women's experience will be different from that of the man in the same category or the same group. Her point of view, where we stand, how we experience our day-to-day -day lives, the way we look at the things, all of these things will be different from the way in which the male experiences them or Carol Gilligan's in a different voice. It will be a gendered view somehow affected in this thing in terms of how we interact with the world. And so a feminist approach is one that breaks down a situation, an event, a law, and analyzes it from the point of view of relationships and of power relations. That's the essence of feminism. Where, where are we in this? Where am I in this? And this brings with it this breaking down this situation and looking at the power relations brings about, or can bring about in any case, sensitivity to the marginalized, to the what psychologists call out groups, or maybe it's the sociologists who use that term, makes us sensitive to hierarchy. So Gloria Steinem said, it doesn't really matter if you call yourself a liberal feminist or a radical feminist, a radical feminist. What's important is this gendered view, this basic approach that looks at relations. It looks at power relations. By the way, this is one of the major contributions of feminism to modern philosophy. This, the idea of breaking down reality or situations and looking at gender relations, looking at power relations. And it's not only how to, it's not only a question of analyzing a situation with a gendered view, looking at power relations, but also how to deal with the situation how to transform the situation. And here, I think from the earliest days, feminists looked at who's in power, who has the power in politics, in economics, in society, in the home as well, and of course in the world in time of war. So a strong element of the early feminists was anti-militarism, anti-war, and actually pacifism. Jane Addams and the women who came to The Hague to oppose World War I and created the Women's Peace Party, they spoke in the name of advocated negotiations, mediation, nonviolence. 
but they connected it to a very basic factor. They connected it to their identity as women, arguing that war was a women, woman's worst enemy. War brings men to the center of things, uh, as the defenders, as the heroes, as the warriors. But they also are the decision makers in time of war, and I can tell you this from experience, in time of war, leadership decision-making circles contract, so women are even more marginalized in a situation of war. But more than that, militarism, it could be argued, creates a sense of entitlement even for boys as the future saviors of the country. Even if it's only implicit, it gives a sense of entitlement. It gives an added value to the male adult. His experience, his service leads to a certain respect and privilege or advantage in society. It gives value to power, to strength, to the stereotypical male attributes. But it's not just the idea of qualities um, or attributes, but it's also, if we look at it in time of conflict, the military, the military is a quintessence of patriarchy. It's based on hierarchy, it's based on orders, commands, it's power over the use of force, it's power over. Hannah Arendt used to say the distinction was for men it's power over, for women power comes by working together. That was her take on it. But certainly militarism, <coughs> the military institution itself is a quintessence of, high, of patriarchy. And militarism was seen by these early feminists as a major barrier to equality for women, and that's one of the reasons that they were pacifists. They were opposed to the exercise of power, to violence, to slavery, to male domination, to war, and the idea of conflict between genders or between nations. For them, the link between feminism and pacifism was not because women were peaceful by nature. Their pacifism was the result of everyday experience of oppression, of oppression, and opposition to any form of oppression. Now, there were those who did claim this in the name of uh, women being more peace-loving, in the name of motherhood, women are mothers, they're nurturing, they seek harmony in the family, the more stereotypical uh, explanation, so to speak. And I think uh, we need to examine this. I think that the importance of the stereotype and the way in which it does uh, determine much of our gender relationships, I think it is extremely important to look at. Um, we've had many discussions about the United Nations Resolution 1325, an extremely important resolution. Trying to improve the situation of women by at least demanding that women have a role be brought into decision making that has to do with war and peace. But 1325, as much as feminists really worked very hard to get it, was based on three sort of justifications. One was the rights argument. Human rights, it's our right to be equal, to be part of this. The second, the second basis is we're the victims, or we are amongst the victims. Wars affect us. War and peace affect us, and so we should have a say. But the third justification was we should be part of the decision making because we bring something different. And the implication, at least was implied, is we bring something different, we're more peace loving. Well, in my opinion, this is the old stereotype at work again. We, this idea that we should be at the table because we are empathetic, we are caring, we are trustworthy, we're fair, we know how to cooperate. This is a very different way of looking at it. And research 
in the United States and in Western Europe did indeed see and has seen uh, a gap, a gender gap, between when men and women, when you come to questions of peace and war, the use of violence, the use of force, with women more than men being opposed to capital punishment, women more than men being opposed to war, specifically Vietnam, uh, Iraq, uh, women more than men being opposed to the use of force. By the way, this does not correspond necessarily with voting habits, um, at least not until the 1990s, but then voting habits also began to go in this direction of a gap. And the gap was usually explained by socialization. Uh, gender is socially constructed. Uh, girls are socialized to be more peace-loving, more called dovish uh, in their attitudes. So, okay, I studied all of that, and then I said, well, what happens in a society that's at war, a conflict society? conflict, armed conflict every so many years. What happens there where socialization in a militarized society, are we going to find the same gap? <coughs> and uh, I conducted a study with a colleague, Nomi Khazan, and then very recently there was another study. And it was puzzling. Uh, it was a study conducted uh, by uh, Professor Michal Shamir from Tel Aviv University. And she found, and she does really very serious work over the years, mainly voter studies, she found that women were more hawkish than men on certain issues. If you took the specific issues in our conflict, of borders, uh, security, the very, very nitty gritty of what would be, what's a contested in our, in our conflict. And she found that there was no gender gap as a matter of fact, most of the studies people tell you in Israel is no gender gap, no gender gap on these issues. Men and women comes out pretty much the same, hawkish. But when she asked people to put preferences in a hierarchy or list of priorities of values, of democracy, peace, settlements, which is part of our situation, Jewish majority in the state of Israel, so to what's important to you, women more than men put peace right at the top. Much more than men. Now this was startling. We don't know which was more startling, that women were hawkish on the issues, but put peace as the top priority, as distinct from men. Here there was a gap. We don't know why. We're still discussing this, and we have different ideas. I personally think it's a f question of fear, where women feel less competent to control what's going to happen to them and therefore are more fearful of war and more in need of or seeking peace. But I, I, have no, I have no explanation. But one thing does seem to be clear. If it's socialization, that may well account for the fact that on issues, men and women are in a conflict situation, militarized, socialized in a similar way. But What's more interesting for me, since we don't have the answers to, on the attitudes, is what happens, what about actions? What happens if women are in power? What happens if women are at the peace table? And we have some research on this. First of all, one of the things that happens, apparently, women in power is they adapt. Golda Meir, Margaret Thatcher, they adapted. They adapted, they sort of took up, they were hardliners, they took up the hardline positions. We can have many explanations, psychological explanations as to why if you want to go into politics, you have to do that. That was one thing. Another was they adopt a very interesting piece of research by a former student of ours, uh, Orna Sasson Levy, looked at women in the, in, in the military. She's an expert on this and she found that women who went, in, who, who went into combat positions. We worked hard to get women into combat positions on that idea of joining, get in there. And what she found is when they, women got into these combat positions, they became like men. They lowered their voice, stood differently. They adopted male 
way of acting, even to the point of saying if somebody was doing something wrong, you call them a woman, you call them a girl, a sissy. They adopted. So that didn't seem to be the answer. And then we know that there are women perpetrators. Uh, in Rwanda there were, there are women terrorists. We know that there are women perpetrators. Um, I and mean, by the way, an interesting thing is even being in combat, we've seen with uh, Kurdish women, Eritrean women, um, Palestinian women, even when they have been warriors, they haven't changed anything. They go back to their communities and very often they're rejected because they've been corrupted by their experience out there. And by the way, the male commanders exclude them when it in, in DDR, where they're deciding who's going to get what, they're demobilizing the warriors, suddenly the women who were there aren't counted when it comes to the, the benefits that you're supposed to get or, uh, and so forth. So we find this, we find this almost everywhere in every, uh, every av avenue. Um, and so even if we reject this as a, a essentialist view, and it is clear that not all women are the same, but we do, I still ask, would it make a difference if women were at the table? Um, would it make a difference? And that's our 1325 again, which is really very important, I think. Now, there have been some very, very interesting, really thorough studies. The most uh, thorough study I've seen was done by the, here in the United States on the Council on Foreign Relations. And they did an enormous study on women and peace. It's, in, it's uh, on the internet. Um, they found something that you'll find in a, lot, in a lot of pieces of research, and that is that societies that have relative gender equality or gender harmony will have lower rates of violence and uh, lower possibilities of actual wars, whether they're internal or uh, state wars. High percentages of women in legislations, they found, will lead to fewer state conflicts. Um, they also found that if you have something like 35% of a parliament is women, you won't have a relapse of fighting. And this is, I think, one of the most important findings that they, uh, that they came up with, is that peace agreements lasted longer if you had women involved. Uh, and this was a study that they did from between 19, looking at all the conflicts between 1980 and 2003, and they found that the, this relationship between gender equality in the society led to a longer lasting peace agreement. Um, there was a study done, I think this one was by Miriam Anderson, of 181 peace agreements since 1989 when uh, women participated in the peace talks. The agreements lasted longer. They lasted at least 15 years. So that's, and study after study showed this, which I think is amazing. That if women were at the table, the peace agreement lasted longer. So we look into why, and there are some explanations given here and there, and there's some that we can figure out. One of them is um, that women tend to be involved in, in civil society, uh, which means they have grassroots connections. Um, and very often it means that they're a little bit more inclusive. They might even work with people across battle lines, so to speak. So in that sense, maybe one of the reasons these agreements last longer is that the women have these connections. A second is that women tend to bring issues of human security this distinction between hard security and soft security, or human security, of the looking at the issues that, uh, that women are, are, are uh, absorbed in on a daily basis, of food, getting food on the table, shelter, and so on. And if they are more inclined to look at these human security issues, they make sure that they are in the peace agreements. And if these issues are in the peace agreements, Perhaps that's one of the reasons that they last longer. 
And they found also that women, because they were involved in these peace talks and in these agreements, they had the, these connections, so to speak. Um, they also rendered the agreements a certain legitimacy. Um, they, you had fewer spoilers trying to spoil an agreement. Uh, we, don't, we don't know if these are the reasons that peace agreements last longer when women are at the table, but a number of researchers have proven this, have demonstrated this. Uh, there was one really fascinating piece of research that was done by a former colleague of mine, Ifat Maoz, looking at women at the table. And she took a group of Israeli men and she presented a couple, many groups, four groups, and she presented them with a peace proposal for our conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. She presented a peace proposal. She told them it was presented by a man, a Palestinian man, and it was generally rejected. She told them the same proposal was presented by a Palestinian woman, and it was accepted. And in questioning them, I guess she worked with students as sociologists tend to do, when she questioned them, why did you like this proposal that was presented by a Palestinian woman? Well, it seemed fair, trustworthy, the, all the stereotypical stuff. If it was brought by a woman, the stereotype came with it. Well, it must be fair, it must be um, just. Uh, and this is mind boggling absolutely mind-boggling, in my opinion, that the stereotype is so strong that they would accept this proposal if it came, uh, if it, they thought it had come from a man. By the way, I have also heard, I was talked with uh, somebody who was involved in the negotiations in Colombia, their peace counselor, they had a, a, a governmental peace counselor, peace commissioner, and he said that actually uh, when the women's issues were brought in, didn't uh, work so well because it was adding a burden and made it harder to reach an agreement and some people in the public were opposed to having women's rights brought in there. But Marian Anderson, who's a, a young researcher, um, did find, she looked that when women were there, not only did she find the, what others had found that the peace agreements last longer, but they made a difference in the agreement itself. She looked at um, 195 agreements between 1975 and 2011, and she found that 40% of them, when women were at the table, 40% of them had clauses linked to the status of women and women's rights. And I, I raise this because Yes, we look to see if women are at the table, will it make a difference in how long a peace agreement lasts? But I also look to see, is this going to help us in terms of women's rights? And she found that in 40% of the cases, women were there in the peace talks. There were, there were clauses in the peace agreement on the rights of women and the status of women because women were there. But the whole trick here, of the course, is which women? Which women were at that table? If they were feminists, if they were feminists, then you got an advancement. You got some advancement of women's rights in that agreement or some effort to deal with the barriers that were holding women back and preventing equality in the past. And I did a bit of research. I compared legislatures in Israel over the years, and I looked at proposals, laws, proposals dealing with women's rights or in any way related to women's rights. And exactly the same thing came out. It wasn't how many women were in the Knesset or parliament at the time. It wasn't a question of numbers. It's not a question of numbers. I personally think it's a good thing to have lots of women elected. I think numbers are important so people, the public gets used to seeing women in these different positions. But that doesn't advance the cause. What advances the cause of equality is so they are feminists. And they might be men. 
They might be men. It was ideology. It was feminism. Whether it was a male or a woman, it was a question of who was putting, the, the people who were putting forth these bills that affected the issue of equality positively were feminists. And so I always ask, it's not just numbers, it's which people, which woman are we putting there? Now, it may be more likely if it's a woman, because a woman does have this everyday experience, and in many cases, it's an experience of oppression, an awareness, as Jane Addams saw it, an, an awareness of oppression, an awareness of power relations, but that brings me back to a feminist perspective to make a difference. By the way, as an example of this possible connection, the Norwegian government gives, or at least it used to give, and while well, it still had oil, uh, a good deal of foreign aid. And when it gives foreign aid, I found, it links it to a demand. It conditions it on a demand for gender reform, that certain legislation be passed. If you want our aid in, in, in many countries, this is the demand. No, the Norwegians make the demand. Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, she not only created a new position at the State Department as the advisor on women's issues, every time she met with a world leader all over the world, she brought up the issue of gender equality, gender relations. And today we have a Swedish foreign minister who's a feminist um, and talks about a feminist foreign policy. We have to see, it's interesting to see what she does with it. So, uh, good old Trudeau who says, yes, half of his cabinet should be women. Of course half a cabinet should be women in terms of the principles of human rights, of democracy, of equality. But I have to add every time, which women? Who are we bringing in? Uh, it's not biology. It's not biology. It's a consciousness of power relations. It's a consciousness of what, what is at stake. And this is, uh, this is I think, the, the crucial matter. I, I don't know that we can always ask this, but I think that uh, for myself, I believe that whether it's a man or a woman, I think there is a tendency for a woman to be more likely to be aware of these things, of to break down a situation and look at it, simply because of our daily existence, but it could also be a man. But what it is, is feminism. It's looking at the world, looking at our day-to-day -day reality in a different way. And I think this is what brings the difference of a woman at the table and a woman at the peace talks and a woman in a peace agreement. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very insightful talk, Dr. Golan. We will now take some questions, and there are, uh, you need to line up, there's a microphone in the back and one here. Uh, if you would just line up, and um, we'll entertain questions at this point. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yes. Would you Thank you for your talk. Um, just your, your last comment was uh, really interesting about, you said it's not, um, not biology, but an awareness I of. I am hard of hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Sure. So your, your last comment was very, um, was, was really interesting about, you, you said uh, it's not, not biology, but an awareness of um, power structures and power dynamics. Um, and you said, you know, this is sort of the essence of feminism and it's the ideas. Um, and it would seem that also parallels, you know, perhaps if you, one looks at sort of quote unquote minority issues in general, meaning is there something, you know, biological in my skin color, which grants me 
you know, some kind of, kind of ideas that other people don't have, like, like a superpower? Or is it through my experiences and awareness of power differentials that give me insight, social insight or intellectual insight in certain settings which can benefit not only me but others and could benefit the society at large? And so I guess my question is, if that applies to both you know, let's, feminisms or minority-isms, is there a broader <clears throat> sort of, um, sort of a, a, a more ancient forebear that sort of precedes these? And if that's true, you know, what is the nature of that? How do we talk about that? Um, you know, what, is, what does that sort of mean? I think my answer would be yes, because your daily experience, in this case it's race, not gender, yes, that does inform. Now, how conscious that becomes is another thing. I think it's the, I guess it's the sociologists who talk about in-groups and out-groups. And that, it doesn't matter whether it's gender-based or race-based or ethnic, I, th I think there is that. And there are many, many similarities apparently between women and other out groups, whatever they may be. And I think it does, uh, I, I, th I think my answer would be yes, is that your experience informs you and can, now it may not happen in every case. Many people go through life and they don't notice. I mean, they, they know if they're something, they're not getting a fair shake, but they don't draw conclusions from it. But yes, I think I, it has nothing to do with biology. It's, it's definitely your experience. And your experience as a male and as a black male is entirely different from my experience. Entirely different. And we could be in the same uh, class, middle class, whatever, but your experience and my experience are entirely different. And, and that can then translate into an understanding of the other can. It doesn't happen automatically, though. I think there's something conscious that has to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks and a very sweeping um, overview of some of the evolution around this thinking. I had a, a question that somewhat builds on what we just, was just being discussed, which is this question, feminism has contributed so much in this understanding of lived experience and situated knowledge, and it's been such an extraordinary contribution. I'm wondering whether uh, scholars um, who are concerned with equality, advancement of women, feminism, are thinking also about processes, educational or otherwise, that brings this needed consciousness? Because there's a way in which I feel more and more people lapsing into this idea that it's only an exp experience of oppression that can bring about this consciousness. And then surely that's not the ideal and not <laughs> what we want to create. So I'm just wondering where thinking is around processes that raise this needed consciousness in men and women. Well, yeah, I, I guess it, I put up too much emphasis on oppression. It, it is, it's a question of power relations. But it's really an appreciation of difference it, when you get right down to it. it it's, it's, much of it has to do with expectations. You know, you know, with a lot of studies about teachers in a classroom and calling on the boys or calling on the girls. There have been studies of this. Your, your expectations, which have been to a great deal, um, to, a, to a large degree, determined by the stereotypes. But um, so I think expectations are, are a very big are a very big part of it. But it's um, it's an awareness of this, uh, whatever whatever the setting. And that's why I think that the um, I go to feminism because it's it's it doesn't necessarily have to be based on power or oppression. But it is this whole new thinking in, in philosophy of breaking down a situation into component parts and analyzing it in a different way. We talk about analyzing it from a gender point of view, of course, but I think that that's, that goes way beyond gender. And I know it does in terms of philosophy. It definitely goes way beyond gender. Um, 
And I think that's the major contribution that feminism has made to um, political philosophy, certainly. It's not just looking at power relations, but breaking this down and looking at all the components of it. And then redesigning things. Redesigning, redesigning education, redesigning transportation. I mean, one of the important things that we feel in the political realm is uh, looking at the laws and analyzing them from a gender point of view. It, and it can be any law. <laughs> I mean, it's not just a law that deals with women's rights, which may have something to do with the success of the peace agreements. It's looking at other things. And, uh, and that's what women, they claim women are bringing to the table. Now, in Northern Ireland, we know that was the case. The, the women when looking at the difference in negotiations and the women will say, yeah, we were thinking more of the sort of day-to-day -day stuff, a little bit more practical things, that human security element. But those are things that can make the difference in a, in a successful agreement. So yes, I think it can, it can go in many areas. But I'm prejudiced. <laughs> I'm a believer. Thank you so much for your insights. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your insights. I'm wondering if in the research you have done, if there is any uh, association with the biological difference between men and women, uh, estrogen versus testosterone, that can contribute to certain characteristics that we experience. I believe we're going to have some talks of people who know something about these. I know nothing. Okay. Uh, I, I've asked questions a lot, parts of the brain, and I think we're going to have somebody speak about that. I imagine there are connections. I mean, there are difference, hormonal differences. There are physical differences. Um, in the areas that I've looked at, politics, uh, peace agreements, well, Politics, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I'm not qualified to answer. I have not been persuaded, uh, I guess because I've known too many feminist men. Uh, I'm not persuaded that, that biology has to control us, but I, I, I'm not qualified to go beyond that. OK, thank you. Thank you for your talk. So there was a lot of things that you said, but um, I wanted to comment on representation. So yes, it's helpful to be at the table, obviously, from a numerical standpoint of view, but also looking at who's at the table when you say that. The diversity, when we look at, oh, sure. you know, we look at class, a lot of times we won't admit it in America, but class matters, ethnicity Absolutely. matters, culture Absolutely. matters, religion matters. Yeah. So a lot of times we're not looking at that. No. We're at the table, but then when you look around, if everybody's looking like you or everyone's from the same class as you, you're not, that's really not diverse. Yeah. And so in any of our spaces, you know, to make sure that we have that representation across the board so it really does look like either the society that we're living Absolutely. or a global society. So whatever that goal is, but you know, a lot of times, and even for me coming today, is making sure representation. And so, and when I stand before people, for them not to make a stereotype that, okay, an African-American woman, you know, obviously I'm Baptist. Nope. Baha'i. You know, you know so sometimes we, 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 we make a lot of assumptions, even within ourselves and our groupings, and how that person is going to represent. So. You raise a very interesting point when people dealing with democracy talks about representation. What does that representation have to be? Does it have to be... A woman has to be there in order to represent women, or could a man represent her, or could someone from Mars represent her? It's a very interesting discussion in the early days of feminism. But I, I fully agree when, it, it, I just give you from our own experience in Israel, um, the women, some of the feminist members of the uh, parliament got the 1325 put into law in Israel. But they made a change, and they added diversity. In our case, what they wanted was women from different ethnic groups in the society. They wanted, uh, they wanted lesbian represented there. 
they, they were looking for diversity, and that's what they put in, diversity. They didn't say which groups. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. And by the way, I don't know of any studies on peace talks that have dealt with diversity, which obviously they have to, or should, uh, because gender isn't the only dividing factor in, in a society. Um, some places, of course, where you have different ethnic groups, that's an obvious thing. But then it goes back to the question that you raised of representation. And uh, in, in order to have a legitimate representation, do you have to have people from that community, that group, or can they be represented by someone who has an awareness? But I think, and we're looking at peace talks, it's certainly been, a, I think, pretty much agreed that you have to have, uh, you have to have people there. You have to have diversity. I also want to thank you for your remarks, and I, I appreciate you emphasizing the, the nurturing qualities of female and the, the ethics of caring. What I'm concerned with is that when women do get a chance to sit at the table, that they feel the obligation to let these traits go and to behave more like men. That's kind of a fear I have. That, uh, we and it to, happens. We, it, it happens. Yeah. It's just amazing, this becoming like the men. But there's another very interesting thing. There's research done on expectation. And if you tell, the, the research has been shown is that if you tell a man and a woman that they sit down to negotiate, if you mention before they make them aware of the stereotype, the man will try to be less aggressive and the woman will try to be more <laughs> aggressive. This expectation thing is, I'm not a psychologist, but I find it fascinating the degree to which the stereotype or expectation of what the other's behavior should be uh, plays a role. I think, I think it plays an enormous role. Uh, if, but the research that I quoted about a Palestinian woman offering a peace agreement and these Israeli men accepting it where they wouldn't accept it from a Palestinian man because they believe women are more, are more fair. And they said that. Uh, yes, I think, I think it, it, it's amazing. Um, I, I was once talking to a student about saying women are more dovish. And he said, well, it's a good thing you're not making peace. You're not at the table. <laughs> he was afraid I'd give up everything, which I would. Well, that's good. I, I hope we continue to celebrate those nurturing qualities and, and emphasize them and not feel like we have to become more aggressive. No, I agree. I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with them. I have a problem with the assumption um, but I, I, I've done a study of peace groups, which I find it's very interesting, women's peace groups, because I've created some and been involved. And when they use a mother motif, it works a lot better. But one of the reasons I think that it works not bad is that men don't feel challenged. You know, I come up with my political science background and I start talking about settlements and I talk about where the border should be and this security issue and that. I'm on, in their playing field and they don't like it. But if I come and I say, look, I've got sons, I have grandsons, one who just went into the army. We've got to end this, con Th that's fine. It's amazing that it works. Professor, I really enjoyed your talk, so thank you so much. Um, I have a question for you, um, and really for us. So you opened up with uh, a conversation about Justin Trudeau, and you talked about his track record when it comes to gender uh, equality and his commitment to gender equality. But I wonder if you can problematize it just a bit more, because certainly um, there's some complexity considering his recent appearance in the news with brown right. face and black face incidents. Yeah. And so if we're going to talk about intersectionality, which you mentioned in your talk, I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about your sort of personal thoughts on this um, and also your professional thoughts, but how we can reconcile that as we sit here and we think about women of the world in this new paradigm and we think about intersections of not just, again, gender, yeah. but also about uh, race and other things. See, I think they are connected. I prepared this very seriously about a month ago, and then Trudeau, <laughs> all this came out. 
and I decided, okay, I'll leave it. But I think there are, I think that it's connected. I have this strange view that I think human rights are human rights, and they're very basic. And it's, they're all of these things, all of them, whether, whether it's class, whether it's ethnic group, whether it's religion or color, I just, that's, I start with that, with human rights as human beings. I think, by the way, um, you know, I'm Jewish, but I think the, Re the Reformation was perhaps the most important turning point in, 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 in history. This idea that we are, in fact, we've got brains, we have reason, and all the rest is, is, is just poured on us. Yes, I do think there's a connection. And, and I'm really sorry <clears throat> that somebody who sees himself as a feminist it was, was at one point anyway a racist, maybe he isn't anymore. People do change, I'll give them that. Uh, but I do think there's a lot of connection, yes. And I, I think that there's a way of looking at the world, and I'm speaking very personally here, it's simply a way of looking at the world. And I think human rights are absolutely, that's the basis. And, and everything else comes out of that. Your views on war, your views on peace, on that it, conflict, or that it all comes from that. Um, and yeah, that sort of messes up Trudeau. <laughs> but I'm waiting to see the Swedish feminist foreign minister. I think that's fascinating. Now, we saw it a little bit with, with, uh, with uh, Hillary Clinton because she definitely was a feminist, and she did make changes. Now, did that make her a pacifist? No. On our issue, by the way, we were at loggerheads. She was hawkish. So, you know, you have to be careful. I know you have to be careful and not just assume that a person is good on this issue, but she might not be on another. But I do think there are certain very basic things that, are, that in a person, uh, where they come from, I have no idea. Sometimes religion. Sometimes not. Hi, so my name is Catherine. I'm actually an intern with the Baha'i Chair this semester. Um, I actually really did enjoy your talk. Um, I, uh, speaking to this, yeah, Mike, because I'm hard of hearing. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, um, and it did make me think of some other prominent uh, feminine philosophies that I have read from um, a Nigerian writer, Chiamanda Adichie. Um, she mentioned that in order to truly comprehensively bring women to the table to reformat society to make sure that it's also inclusive of the opinions and the thoughts of women, we have to start with the lowest rung of this particular group, whether that be disabled women or minority groups. Um, and I just wanted to know if you thought that that was a pertinent and prominent part of the prescription of making society more inclusive and more um, I'll tell you, um, we need everything. Um, you know, the, 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 we often discuss this uh, in our women's movement. Where do you begin? It's education, there's no question, education, kindergarten, preschool, it, but everything needs to be changed, everything. Uh, it's, it's hard to know, so you, I mean, uh, my kids tease me, and I'm, I stop trying to save the world. I just want to save our little part of it. Uh, you choose your battles, um, and and you. Sometimes I think that you can do it all, but I don't think any one person can. But yeah, of course it, we have to change society. But how do you change society? It can be in civil society, and then through NGOs. You can go into formal politics try to change the laws, or education. I mean, that's the whole reason I created the Women's Studies program. I'm not a Women's Studies person. I'm Soviet foreign policy was my field. But I created the Women's Studies program because I felt, ah, we can get the students. It was active, the pure activism of to get, to get them while they're students to know that there are these issues. So you don't know where to begin, but I certainly, I mean, no question in my mind that education is key, and the earlier you can get to people, the, the better off. But, but then you gotta change the teachers. <laughs> no, I mean, this is not an easy thing. <laughs> but uh, 
but you do what you can. Not everybody can do everything, and some people can't do anything, so they do it in their home and the way they bring up their children. I'm sorry, but thank we you. have to stop because we're out of time. But I wanted yeah, to yeah. thank you, Dr. Oh, I get a Bola, present. on behalf of the Baha'i <laughs> Chair for thank World you. Peace. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Why don't we just take about, and I mean literally three minutes, for a break and come back and we'll listen to the panel. Thank you. to present you can if you would prefer to sit you can it's entirely up to you. I'll go over there to that slide. Yeah. Yeah. About doing the slides. Do we have slides? Okay. I don't feel so I wasn't so, sure because you all didn't send out the announcement about technology. I was like I'm gonna spend all this time doing the slides and then I won't be able to show that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so Laura will go first then like then so I, I probably can do something just want everyone to know we are t turning down we're turning we're warming up the room. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a good program. That's why okay, it's been okay. good. Is it possible to turn down the one there? Whatever. Yes. Yeah, I can turn it. Because then I can just keep this one at that. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I can do that. 
pocket it or it has what? <laughs> Okay. So that's it on. Uh -huh. Oh. And until we consider race alongside gender and class and sexuality or asexual, we have to consider those things. Yep. I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna give two examples of that today. <laughs> There will be plenty of time to visit a little bit later. So if you could all please come back to your seats. And again, if you could move forward, you know, don't be afraid. No one's going to do anything to you if you sit closer to the front. We'd like to get started, so please come and take your seats. <clears throat> so we now have a panel on women and power in the global context. And I will introduce the moderator, and she will introduce the distinguished panelists. And you know already the moderator, Dr. Kate Seaman, Assistant Director at the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. Uh, she is, um, prior to joining the University of Maryland, Dr. Seaman spent a year as Senior Fellow at a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., with a focus on uh, genocide prevention. As Senior Fellow, Dr. Seaman was responsible for establishing field research projects in Nigeria and Myanmar. Uh, she has taught at the University of Baltimore and teaching fellow at the University of Bath and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of East, East Anglia. She is a specialist in peace studies and received her PhD in political science and peace studies from Lancaster University. And we are very delighted that she's going to moderate this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Hoda. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce all of the panelists, and then they will go in the order of the program. Uh, so first up, we have Laura Schoberg, who's professor of political science at the University of Florida. Uh, she has an affiliation with the Center for Gender, Sexualities, and Women's Studies. And her research foci include gender and security, feminist security theorizing, queer theorizing about global politics, women's involvement in political violence, the disciplinary sociology of international relations, and political methodologies. 
Her work has been published in more than four dozen journals in political science, international relations, gender studies, geography, and law. And she's author of over a dozen books, and you can find more details about these in the program. Um, her talk today is titled Interrogating the Image of the 21st Century Woman. Uh, next up, we have Margaret Satterthwaite. She's professor of clinical law, faculty director of the Robert L. Bernstein Institute for Human Rights, and faculty director for the Center of Human Rights and Global Justice, and the director of the Global Justice at NYU School of Law. Um, her research interests include legal empowerment, economic and social rights, human rights and counterterrorism, and vicarious trauma among human rights workers. She's authored or co-authored co more than a dozen human rights reports and dozens of scholarly articles and book chapters. And she's also worked as a consultant to numerous UN agencies and special rapporteurs, and has served on the boards of several human rights organizations. Again, there's much more details in the program. All of these women are so accomplished, it would take me the entire time to read you their entire bios. So we're very delighted they can all be here. Um, and then we also have Brandy Wells, Brandy Thomas Wells, the Assistant Professor of History from Oklahoma State University. Um, she is a scholar of African Americans in United States history with interest in women's social and political activism. Brandy's work has appeared in Origins and Women and Social Movements in Modern Empire. And she's currently preparing her first book, which uncovers mainstream African American women's internationalism through a focus on the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and the National Council of Negro Women and their affiliates. Um, her work illuminates how these organizations communicated, cooperated, and competed, and brings to bear how these entities and the members within quilted together various strategies, philosophies, and strands of activism in their quest for civil and human rights. Um, and this project has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the International Chapterhood of the PEO Sisterhood, and the Ohio State University, among others. And I realized I forgot to give you uh, <laughs> Professor Satterthwaite's talk title, which is Legal Empowerment for Gender Equality. Uh, and then Brandy, uh, Professor Wells' um, talk title is Live Peaceably with All Men, African, women, African American Women's Activism for Peace, Prosperity, and Parity. So please join me in welcoming these fantastic speakers. Okay, I'm a mover, so I'm going to come down here. Um, is this too loud or no? No, I think you're good. Okay, just a second. So the title of my talk is Interrogating the Image of the 21st Century Woman. And the reason that that's the title is because there has to be a pessimist in the room about gender equality, right? <laughs> so I think that's me. Um, not against gender equality, so don't have that sound bite on Twitter because that wouldn't be very much fun. Uh, but I do want to problematize some of the ways in which gender equality is being talked about in kind of progressivist 21st century politics. Particularly, I see three major problems that remain and are even being entrenched that I want to talk about kind of briefly in turn. Um, so I'm going to give you a roadmap, and then we're going to talk about them. So the first thing I want to talk about is the way in which this gender equality that's being distributed is being unevenly distributed. The second thing that I want to talk about is that the image of the woman who merits equality is a particularly narrow, narrow and sometimes violent image of a woman. And then the set third is that sometimes women are being expected to actually be more than rather than just equal. Uh, so those are kind of the three things that I want to talk about. So when I say that gender equality is being distributed unevenly, I mean that it's not possible to talk about gender equality without talking about a wide variety of the axes that overlap with gender equality. So gender equality is being distributed unevenly on the basis of race, on the basis of class, on the basis of nationality, on the basis of religion, on the basis of disability, um, and even in different sub-communities on a wide variety of different axes. So you can't say that we need both gender equality and race equality and equality for disabled people and religious equality because they don't exist in universes that are separable. Right, so you can't say, all right, but I'm just advocating for gender equality now, or all right, I'm just advocating for race equality now, or something like that. Because when you advocate for one of those things, uh, the 
title, the book title that I remember is like a rising tide lifts all whatever. That, that's not true. So that's not actually how it works, right? Um, so instead, often a number of these kind of like single issue advocacy things, especially around gender equality, not only kind of focus on a particular privileged notion of the woman, but they can have in and with them a number of subordinations on the basis of other axes of discrimination and power. Um, so for example, I study international conflict and often in post-conflict situations, there's a rise of the rights of women um, and that's something that's awesome except often that's actually the women on the side that won the war. Uh, and the women on the side that lost the war not so much having a good day. Um, so there's a lot of times that you think it should think about the ways in which gender equality movements leave out or often sometimes subordinate particular women um, on the basis of other axes of discrimination. So intersectionality analysis has done a good job of thinking about some of this, especially in the United States, but also decolonial analysis as a good job of talking about sometimes the ways in which liberal gender equality movements are used as a form of colonialism. So for example, there are states that are like, well, we treat our women better than you treat your women. Um, and this is the way that we can look down on you as a state, right? Um, which I'm sure does a lot of women a lot of good. Um, oh, that was sarcasm, wasn't it? Uh, all right, so, so that's, that's number one, is that often gender equality movements uh, don't lift all women equally, um, and there's axes of discrimination on which that's a problem. Okay, then the second thing, which is somewhat related, but not totally related, is that there's a particular image of a woman who is the poster child in a lot of these gender equality movements. Um, and that image of a woman, number one, is gender binary. Uh, so there are things called women and things called men, and this is a settled idea, and you fall in one or the other, and if you fall in one or the other, we're gonna promote your rights, and if you don't, well, then we're confused and not gonna promote your rights. So the very suggestion that gender equality is based on women and men leaves out a significant portion of the population. Uh, biologists advocate, suggest that it's about 1% of the population that is neither male nor female biologically. Uh, there's certainly a wide variety of people who are gender queer, intersex, trans, things like that, who are left out of the image of gender equality as it's traditionally defined. There aren't a lot of people advocating to include those people at peace tables or in politics or something like that. And that doesn't just matter for those people, it matters because when we keep an image of women and men as a dichotomy, huh, okay, there you go. <laughs> Maybe it went with the darkness of what I was saying. Um, <laughs> When you keep this image of women and men as a dichotomy, then you're also suggesting that those categories have a particular meaning in which people must belong. So queer theorists recently have been talking about the violences of inclusion. So when you say, all right, women are allowed to be a part of this particular part of politics that they weren't, say like the military or combat roles or something like that, um, then you're including people with a particular image of a woman, and if you don't meet that, then there's some expectation to meet that. So sometimes when you say women need this, or to include women we're going to do this, if you're a woman that doesn't fit within those needs or those axes of inclusion, sometimes the inclusion itself can be violent. Because it's not the norms that are changing to add you. It's you being added to already accepted norms that were previously negotiated without your input. And so a lot of critics of this liberal inclusion model, myself included, suggest that that means that sometimes being in the in-group is as painful as being in the out-group, if not more painful, because you are now a part of something to which you feel like you do not belong. And so there's a question of that the idealized woman in a lot of the presentations of gender equality is, for example, peaceful, um, feminine, uh, often white, often straight, often somebody who bears children or is interested in bearing children. 
Um, this isn't always and it isn't everything, but it happens a lot. And that actually saves, serves as an axis of inclusion and exclusion that's a little bit more difficult to see uh, than a lot of the, well, women can't do this or women can't do that. A lot of my research work has been on politically violent women. Um, and this kind of transitions a little bit into the third point about expectations of women. So I'll tell you that why I got interested in politically violent women is actually, uh, you remember back when there were newspapers, like hard copy newspapers? Okay, so in 2003, the Los Angeles Times shows up at my front door um, and it has a picture of a woman named Lindy England who was uh, the woman holding the leash in the prison abuse scandal in Iraq. Um, and it's a massive picture. Um, and I, I kind of joke with everybody that I'm enough of a leftist that I wasn't surprised that the US military was torturing people. I was actually surprised it was a girl doing it, which was funny because at the time, I had studied gender for almost a decade and still that surprised me. And I realized that to me, the spectrum of thing women, things women could do had widened so much that I didn't actually see that in my head there was still stuff outside of that. And now, like, I'm not saying sexually abusing prisoners is a good thing, definitely not. But I am saying that in my head, I imagined women incapable of doing that, though they were capable of doing everything else men can do. In other words, I imagined women as equal to men, but without their flaws, which is a really mean expectation when you think about it. So this is my third issue, is that often what we say is gender equality places an additional burden on women operating in political spheres, military spheres, and business spheres to actually be more than or better than uh, what we expect of men. So Annika Kronsal wrote a book about how there was an addition of women to peacekeeping forces in the European Union. Uh, and the idea was that if you have gender integrated combat units, men will behave better. Now, so that carries the assumption that women won't misbehave, and then that women will like somehow mother or fix men, and then they'll be better, right? The same way that the understanding that women should be at the peace table, and I'm not saying they shouldn't, suggests that we'll make more peace, right? So like often some of the women who are included in peace tables and things like that are pacifist feminist women, not the ones who are out there blowing things up, and there are a lot of them, I promise, right? Like, so my concern is that sometimes there's this expectation that women should be more than. So in Congresses all around the world, in parliaments all around the world, uh, female members of parliament are overrepresented on defense committees and budgeting committees, things traditionally associated with masculinity and they're underrepresented on education social service committees, um, which suggests that when you run for office as a woman, you have to prove that you're as much of a man as the men are, but then you also know you have to prove that you're feminine and can wear a skirt and good stuff like that, right? So in some sense, the word equality, which means sameness, doesn't work because what happens is that there's this double expectation of women in a lot of different places to be everything that men are, but still traditionally feminine. Or everything that men are, but come on, they screwed it up and we can figure out how not to. Or everything that men are, but nicer, sweeter. Um, and at the same time, when women screw up in positions of power, femininity is easy to get blamed, right? Like, well, she was just emotional. Um, I, I worked for the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, way back in the day in 2008, I guess the first time, right? Um, and somebody, a reporter, there was this day that uh, she had pretty much lost the primary, but not totally, and she shed a tear um, and so somebody asked me in my, in my capacity as working for the campaign, that they were like, well, what, what is it? Like, do you want somebody who's emotional with their finger on the button? Okay, so first thing, no button, doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> second thing, like, as somebody who gets involved in politics, your immediate answer to that question is something to the effect of, like, well, I'm not sure, uh, she's not really emotional, that's it, 
right? Uh, you know, and then one day, public life, a long time, not really emotional, that's the thing. Okay, you go home and you think about it. Okay, let's presume there is a button and somebody's finger is on it, right? Um, would you want them to feel something? I think yes, right? I mean, like, not saying that you wouldn't want them to do, I wouldn't want them to do it, but, but you might want them to do it. You'd still probably want them to feel something. It'd be kind of weird, like, oh, gonna kill 80 million people. Sweet, cool. <laughs> you know, like, you think, so gender stereotypes still, number one, weigh negatively on women, and then number two, when they weigh positively on women, weigh harder. Right, um, so the only woman majority parliament in the world until fairly recently was in Rwanda. Um, it was elected almost immediately post-genocide. The idea was what Rwanda needs now is peace. Women are more peaceful, no pressure. <laughs> so this is something that I think is really important to pay attention to, is the ways in which the movement for gender equality creates contradictory forces, that is for some women, who benefit and some women who benefit less or not at all, um, but also that the particular image of women may create both discrimination and unfair expectations. I think that's about it for me. Um, so hi, I'm Meg Satterthwaite. I want to start by thanking the organizers of the conference um, for inviting me and for making this possible. I'm incredibly grateful. Um, you'll also notice that I think you were maybe, you had a premonition about the title of my talk because I changed it. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> so I, I felt really important to talk about legal empowerment for, um, in the face of climate change. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm absent from New York during climate week, but um, as I'll tell you in a minute, was um, part of a bunch of really exciting discussion and organizing last week that I'll talk about. Um, but before I, want, before I start, what I'd like to do is something that I have learned from um, indigenous leaders in different parts of the world, which is to acknowledge and pay my deep respect to the original keepers of the land where we are now. Um, the Piscataway Conoy, the Piscataway Indian Nation. I would like to pay respect to Piscataway elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the stolen labor of those enslaved here. And we know that there um, is a strong connection between this space and our American history of slavery. I acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to this land and water that supports us as we're gathered here together. And I begin with this acknowledgement to ground my discussion in this place and also to connect with who I am. We've already talked a little bit about feminist epistemology. Um, and so for me, it's important to acknowledge my privilege as a white cisgendered lesbian professional in this space. So last week, the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, where I'm a faculty director, was privileged to host something called the People's Summit on Climate Rights and Human Survival. It was a gathering that brought together more than 200 representatives of indigenous peoples, workers, the academy, environmental and human rights groups. I was there to represent my clinic, the Global Justice Clinic, which partners with um, communities to advance human rights in the face of global inequality. And this is just a, 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 a couple of images from our work. Um, in the middle there um, is a demonstration by our partners in Haiti um, who are working to prevent industrial gold mining um, in Haiti. The summit ended with the adoption of a declaration calling on governments and corporations to take immediate and bold action to stop climate change and to ensure that humans and all non-human life can continue to survive on this earth. The mood at the summit was urgent, and the delegates were passionate. But the presentation of one speaker was especially impactful, that of Berta Zuniga Cáceres, coordinator of the Honduran indigenous rights organization, COPIN, and daughter of the slain environmental and indigenous women's rights defender, Berta Cáceres. Berta Cáceres was shot to death in her home in 2016 
after she, in the words of the Goldman Foundation, who bestowed her with the Goldman Prize, quote, rallied the indigenous Lenca people of Honduras and waged a grassroots campaign that successfully pressured the world's largest dam builder to pull our, out of the Aguazarca Dam. Her daughter and namesake called on those present at the summit last week to recognize the common roots to the climate and human rights crises, to join together and to move collectively toward a new world where the dignity and humanity of all is protected. She specifically asked us to turn away from profit and toward life. This embrace of life, this search for a new way forward, is the only path to peace today, since a world united in the quest to save our Earth will be able to achieve the transformation, sorry, only a world united in this quest will be able to achieve the transformation needed to get the job done. The failure to take on this challenge will inevitably need not only to climate to disaster, but new forms of war, conflict, and strife, as the haves and have-nots fight for control of the high land, the cool spaces, and the remaining places capable of sustaining life. I could not agree more with the urgency that Cáceres implored us to recognize. And I'm utterly convinced that we, every one of us, has a role to play, and an important one, in action to stop and reverse climate change. But I'm also concerned that there are perils in acting quick, quickly if we do not change the way solutions are identified, formulated, and put into action. Speed can be dangerous when those calling the shots are people who sit in positions of privilege. People like me, as I've already said, who are privileged, professional, and based in the global north. People like me leave behind us a long history of so-called solutions to things that we erroneously saw as problems in the world. Recall that slavery and colonialism were justified by the so-called civilizing mission, that the genocide of Native Americans was justified by discourses of progress, that climate change has come about because those in power insisted, despite knowing the opposite, that the industrial north had not in fact created an enormous worldwide problem, one that now desperately does need a solution. The imperative to act quickly must carry with it the equal imperative to shift perspective, to see, hear, and accept the experiences, ideas, and solutions of those already living the very real impacts of climate change. This time change must be led by communities on the front lines. People not used to listening urgently need to learn humility to make space and to support those leading from below. In this vein, I'd like to tell you about the work of two women I've had the privilege to meet who are teaching me to listen and from whom I, for whom I seek to follow. These are women working to advance their rights as women, to secure the rights of their peoples, and to protect their territories, lands that are vital to humanity's survival. Mm. They're doing this through legal empowerment, um, which can really be summed up by um, what my colleague Vivek Maru at NAMATI has called the ability to know, use, and shape the law. But first, I should tell you that although I'm a lawyer and a law professor, my story is not going to focus on students or lawyers. Instead, I'm going to tell you about two women whose stories are important because they involve women leading their own communities to advance the rights of their people, and how ensuring those communal rights just might save the earth. In my experience, too often, the heroic attorney story comes at the expense of the people who that lawyer is meant to serve. We're all very familiar with grandstanding lawyers speaking for those whose voices can instead be listened to. Today, I want to tell you about women who advance their own rights and the rights of their communities. And although both women gave me their permission to tell, share their stories, I acknowledge fully that there's some irony in me conveying those stories. The first story I'll tell you about takes place in Guyana, which is a small country at the northern tip of South America. And I want to tell you a bit about the work of a woman named Immaculata Casimero. I've been lucky enough to work with her a bit through my clinic's partnership with the South Rupununi District Council, which is a representative body that advances the rights of the Wapichan indigenous people in southern Guyana. And this is their website, so I encourage you to visit their website if you'd like to see more about what they're um, doing in advancing their rights. 
Like many indigenous women, Wapichan women face an enormous challenge, that of protecting their ancestral lands, even as they seek legal title for that land from the government. This need to both protect the land and seek legal title has motivated the South Rupununi District Council to organize a team of territorial monitors who are trained to monitor their land for illegal incursions and activities like unlaw unlawful gold mining and deforestation. And this is an, on the left, there's an image from the monitors they collected on their smartphones. And then on the right um, is a picture of Tushau Nicholas Fredericks, who's one of the leaders of the community, who is using the evidence collected by the monitors to advance, um, advance rights on the land. The job of monitoring is not easy. The land is expansive, wild, and includes portions of jungle and mountainous terrain. Because of these challenges, the SRDC has opted to use mobile phones and to capture data and use drones to assess land damage from afar. And here you can see an image of the drone. They actually built this drone um, in their territory and um, also sort of looking at surveying some of the drone images and on the bottom is a picture of deforestation um, as captured by the drone. So I thought about showing you a video, but I won't, but I'll, I'll put this up here so you can see the website if you'd like to watch it. It's a short video um, that explains the goal of this uh, monitoring work. And this is Tessa Felix, who, um, has, who for a long time was kind of the tech wizard um, of the monitoring program. And so she talks about how the main goal of the work of these monitors is for the people of the South Rupununi to win this land claim, to have title to their ancestral lands. Um, and to do so, they need to demonstrate continuous use and presence on this land. Um, and so they are collecting images and information that goes onto a map, and that they thus have their own version of the map of their area. Um, and, and so they also collect, um, as I said, evidence of illegal activities under both Wabichan customary law and the law of Guyana, and also, importantly, international law. And then they seek action by the government of Guyana to end those unlawful activities. Um, this is just a recent um, image of some illegal activity that they were able to capture, which is the creation of a water dredge for gold mining in the river there. At times, it's become necessary for the SRDC to seek solidarity and support from international partners, like my clinic, and also from the United Nations. This summer, um, Immaculata Casimero traveled to Geneva to appear before the Committee on All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And this is an image of Mackie, um, as she's known, presenting before the, the, the CEDAW Committee. There she explained the pressing concern she traveled to Geneva to convey. Here's a brief passage from the report she presented to the committee. Wapichan women play crucial roles in maintaining our culture, sustaining our people, and contributing to our community's development. Our women work hard to provide for our families and maintain our homes while also supporting our work to uphold indigenous rights and protect Wapi Chan Wish, our customary territory. The government of Guyana's failure to respect indigenous rights and in particular its failure to recognize and title our land causes our women ongoing hardship. They shoulder the double burden of preserving our culture in a changing climate and globalizing economy while fighting to secure our people's rights. This summary of the intersectional challenges that Wabichan women face was effective in moving the committee to make strong recommendations to the government of Guyana. When the committee issued its concluding observations in late July, the SRDC welcomed them with a strongly worded press release, which included the following passage. The CEDAW committee called on the government of Guyana to amend its laws to guarantee the rights of indigenous women and girls, including to guarantee our rights to our traditional lands and territories, to guarantee our rights as indigenous women to consultation and free prior and informed consent to policies and legislation affecting us. The press release ended with a call for the government to, quote, combat the negative impacts of mining, to implement programs in conjunction with indigenous communities and indigenous women, to assist with adapting to climate change and fighting the resulting food insecurity that communities are experiencing. Mackie Casimero's travels to Geneva to present her community's concerns and demands was a profound act of legal empowerment. 
By knowing the law, customary, national, and crucially here, human rights law, she was able to demand action to make those rights real. Now, using the committee's recommendations as an advocacy tool, Mackey is using the law to change, to press for actual change. This change has already started. Government officials have met with um, Maki Casimero and other Wapichan women to discuss how to implement those changes that the committee has recommended. Now I'd like to tell you briefly about the legal empowerment <coughs> work of another Earth Defender, a woman from the Warani Nation in, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Nimante Nimkimo is president of the Warani of Pastaza and a founding member of the uh, Alianza Sebo, an organization created to defend the rights of indigenous peoples in Ecuador. I've had the opportunity to meet her only two times. My clinic has worked closely with the SRDC in Guyana, but not um, with this organization in Ecuador. Instead, my relationship with Alianza Sebo or known as Amazon Frontlines on the internet, um, is not a direct partner, but is instead as a board member of an organization called Digital Democracy, which is dedicated to co-creating tech for marginalized communities, including um, Alianza Sebo and Frontlines. I do have permission from Namante Nimkimo to share this information today. She's been central to our people's fight to defend their land deep in the Amazon against oil exploration and exploitation. This work, like that of the SRDC, uses mapping and legal empowerment, and it has recently resulted in a groundbreaking victory in Ecuadorian court. And it's in part because of that that I want to tell you about it. I think it's important that we celebrate victories and know that there are, are positive stories. Um, first, knowing the law, the Warani were determined to fight against the government's plans to auction off millions of hectares of their rainforest for oil development. The government had concluded a flawed and rushed consultation process in 2012, determining afterwards that the communities had consented to the auction, despite not having adequate translation, not being informed of the negative impacts of oil drilling, or the drastic changes to the landscape that oil drilling would bring. In response, using smartphones, the Warani community recorded the wisdom of their grandmothers and elders, mapped the forests and sacred spaces, and identified the types of animals and plants they protect as custodians of their territory. This kind of mapping is important in many efforts by indigenous peoples to gain title. And this is because white European settlers conceived of indigenous inhabited lands as empty. In fact, there's an infamous, an infamous historical legal doctrine under which this land is considered what's called terra nullius, empty land or nobody's land, which really just meant no Europeans land, which could be acquired through brute force. These particular maps created by the Warani became crucial to their court case. Um, and they launched a court case against the Ecuadorian government seeking withdrawal of the planned oil auction. As Aaliyah Ryan of Digital Democracy explained, the maps played a critical role in the legal case. They were used to demonstrate context and situation, locating the communities within the vast Ecuadorian Amazon and showing the overlap with Block 22, which was how the Ecuadorian government was considering this land, a particular oil block whose sale the Warani are fighting. The maps were also used to demonstrate the profound environmental, social, cultural, and historical, and spiritual knowledges which are embedded in the Warani's relationship to territory. The sacred waterfalls and fishing spots whose water would be contaminated by oil and toxic runoffs, the burial sites and petroglyph covered caves at risk of being turned into drilling platforms, the ancient groves of peach palm their ancestors planted that could be felled to level ground for airstrips, and the mineral deposits where the jungle animals congregate, which would be abandoned. A crucial part of the Warani resistance to the Ecuadorian government's use of law against them came when Warani women filled the courtroom with song. And again, I was hoping to play the video, but it was too complicated because it's deeply embedded in a website. But you can find this, and it's really moving. Unrelenting and harmonious, the song insisted that the worldview of the Warani become cognizable in this legal space by simply stopping the courtroom until the judge attended to the singing. Not only would the case be about the law to protect the indigenous rights, it was also about shaping the law of free, prior, and informed consent to ensure that any recognized consent was truly that according to indigenous worldviews. In April of this year, the Ecuadorian court ruled in the Warani's favor. 
finding that the process used to secure consent for oil drilling had been improper. An appeal was rejected in July, and so the Warani land is now protected. This kind of legal empowerment, the ability of indigenous women to know, use, and shape the law to ensure the future of their peoples is essential in the fight against climate change. As Nimante Ninkimo explained to the press following this victory, this victory means that our Warani people and the future generations, the children, our children, will live healthy and without contamination. And that also means to the world that we contribute to the air you breathe, which is from the Amazon. The peaceful world we seek depends on all of us recognizing that yes, the breath we take here in Maryland or Washington or New York or Nairobi or Mumbai comes from the rainforest, from the Amazons of this world, and that only, the only durable proven way to safeguard the health of the lungs of the world while also upholding human rights is to ensure that indigenous custodians of that sacred space have legal title to their customary territories and the right to determine what happens within those lands. To do this, we must follow these women leaders within their communities. And more and more research is demonstrating the effectiveness of titling indigenous lands as a climate change mitigation strategy. A 2016 study conducted by the Rights and Resources Initiative, the Woods Hole Research Center, and the World Resources Institute estimated that 24% of the world's above ground carbon is sequestered in indigenous occupied tropical forests. Indigenous and local communities are estimated, however, to hold title to only 10% of their customarily claimed territories, leaving the vast majority of this carbon storing land vulnerable to development via mining, deforestation, and clear cutting for agro-industrial projects. When industrial development <coughs> beckons, deforestation ensues, releasing carbon into the atmosphere. This August, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recognized the important role indigenous and local communities play as custodians of carbon-rich forests. It's time we all embrace this connection and are, ensure our leaders do too. Legal empowerment, the ability of indigenous communities to know, use, and shape the law to claim title and management of their customary lands is a powerful tool in the hands of those fighting for their lives and ours in the forefront of climate change. It's also their human right. I have Professor Wells. Sorry, I'm not sure this is on. This year, 2019, marks 400 years of African American history. Although we know that the history of this population did not begin on these shores or in bondage, I think it is important to open this presentation with this historical mm -hmm. marker. For it allows us to truly contemplate just how long African Americans have agitated for equal rights, for peace, and just how long it has eluded them. In this struggle, African American women have made remarkable contributions while often receiving little credit and little due. And this reminds me of the title of one of my favorite books, uh, which is a 1982 co-edited collection entitled All the Women Are White, All the Men Are Black, But Some of Us Are Brave. Scholar activist Angela Davis put it this way, quote, black women have had to develop a larger vision of our society than perhaps any other group. They have had to understand white men, white women, and black men. And they have had to understand themselves. When black women win victories, it is a boost for virtually every segment of society, end quote. As a historian of the black woman's experience, I am elated to be here with you today to consider this population's plight and progress from a historical perspective. 
And so I hope you all will not go to sleep, sleep on me and you will be more attentive than the students in my class, classes when I start talking about history. So I'm gonna give you a few examples uh, today. And my presentation draws from my first book. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Seaman, for that introduction. But just as a reminder, it is a book on black women's internationalism. And it covers a long period of history from the 1890s through the 1960s. And I look at how this population, particularly mainstream women. And so what I mean by that is women who value the mainstream, who want to protect uh, American democracy and who really believe in American democracy and having it sort of live up to its ideals, right? So they see the sort of fallacies that existed. Um, and so I do this by looking at two organizations, the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896, and the National Council of Negro Women, which was founded in 1935. And these organizations are still alive and present today, and they are still the largest black women's umbrella organizations. And so really, even though this is about the past, it's also very much about the present. And as a roadmap, what I'll do is consider two examples of how women in those organizations participated in nation making and participated in global discussions. But then I'll end with Black Lives Matter and talk about how that movement connects to, but also is different. And then I'll pose a few questions uh, for us. Now I have titled this presentation, To Live Peaceably with All Men. And this comes from Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 18 of the Christian Bible. And I chose this particular scripture because the women that I study were Christian activists. And this is how they intended to live their lives and how they framed their activism. Now, prior to this particular passage, it says that believers were not to persecute uh, those who persecuted them, but instead they were to bless them, that they were to remain humble instead of repaying evil for evil, and they were supposed to be honorable to all. And so the few examples that I give today, but most especially my larger work, will show that the women that I study really tried hard to live up to uh, that call. Uh, before I go any further, I want to make a comment about language and the power of words. Uh, in a growing effort to internationalize U.S. history, we begin to use the terms transnationalism and internationalism. And I want you to understand that those are uh, unsettled terms. They're still highly uh, contested. And when we use those terms, we mean different things. Uh, particularly when we think about transnational or international, we're thinking about the relations of power, relationships between nation states, uh, the movement of people, ideas, and goods across geographical borders. And so in the historiography, uh, particularly on white women's activism, we use the word transnational. However, in the African American historiography, we use the word international. And I want to tell you why I describe these women's activism as international. The first is, um, International can be used to describe activists who were less powerful, who also work transnationally, and by that I mean across borders. But they are also international because they had international ideas about interconnectedness, international ideas about uh, peace, justice, and even international ideas about identity. Uh, in describing internationalism, scholars of yesteryear uh, narrowly conceptualized this term with the focus on definable outcomes. And that means when you look at African Americans at the global stage and you say, well, what are the outcomes of their participation? You can declare them as unimportant, right? And so that means they are not international. But it also means the same thing for women. It means the same thing for people of color when we focus narrowly on status, position, and power. And then finally, and I think this is the most important reason, I declare these women internationalists because that is the word that they use to define themselves. And so in all of the history that I see, that is the word. So my first example I will uh, use today actually pulls from peace conferences after the First World War. And as has already been mentioned, this is a particularly timely conference this year because we are at the centennial of those peace talks. And so I wanna think about Mary Church Terrell. And this is perhaps a name that many of you have uh, heard before. She participated in this conference 
the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, and she was the first black woman to do so. And so you may say, why? Well, this organization was new. It had only been founded in 1915 at The Hague, and the purpose of the organization is founded, it is very uh, clear in its title, International League of Peace and Freedom. Um, but only after its founding, the, the organizers begin to look for what they called, and I'm using uh, verbatim terms, uh, the ideal black woman. So they didn't want uh, black women um, from any sort of class background, but they wanted a particular type, a particular educated type. So they were very um, narrow in the women that they invited. And so Mary Church Terrell was invited. And she was eager to take up this invitation, but then the State Department, the US State Department, cut the list of delegates down from 30 to 15. And Mary Church Terrell was only able to remain on the list because the notable Jane Addams fought for her to remain, right? And so she joins this conference of uh, hundreds of women from around the world, and she is, as she declares it, the only woman there with African blood running in her veins. Now, I want to problematize that a little bit because while Terrell and others could be grateful to Jane Addams, Jane Addams, in inviting Terrell personally, sidestepped the black women's organization, the National Association of Colored Women. And so this is what this looked like then, and it's what it looked like throughout the entire 20th century. When black women were included at the table, it was a form of tokenism, right? It often did not consider the organizations that they founded. But Mary Church Terrell was excited to take up this opportunity and then to introduce some more complexity, though she, in her memoir and is often remembered as being the only black woman there, she was not. Mary uh, B. Talbert was there, and she was the sitting president of the National Association of Colored Women, and Addie B. Hunton was there, and she had actually served as a nurse in the First World War. Now, if you look at the records of those organizations, you don't see those women's names, right? And so what happens is when we have conversations about women in peace, we don't see that black women were there in the room. And so as a historian, what I do is I bring together all of these different resources to consider the participation of, of black women. And so when I think about Terrell, who is there in the program, I can think about two um, contributions that she made. The first is that she gave a public address that really uh, agitated for women's inclusion in the uh, League of uh, Peace and Freedom and the League of Nations. And so she said that racial equality needed to be a part of this. But then in-house, she actually got up and she gave an address and she talked about peace from the colored woman's perspective, and that's language of the day. And she ended her address this way, quote, white people could talk about peace until doomsday, but they could never have it until the dark races are treated fair and square. So I want you to put a pin in that because I'll circle back around in just a few moments. Now after her address, she submitted a resolution to the organization and she wanted the league to grant its full attention, its power, and its resources to ending discrimination based on race or color. Now, her fellow white American delegates had actually tried to weaken the resolution as they made their way over to the conference and at the conference. But the problem was that Terrell was fluent in German and they were not. So the translator actually failed to, con to uh, consider those translations, which meant that the original resolution was adopted by this league, and this became its sort of mantra on how it dealt with race. Now, to uh, be very clear, I want you to understand that African American women from 1915 to 1975, or better, from 1919 to 1975, made up only 1% of the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom. But this did not mean, if we look at numbers, sometimes numbers don't tell the whole story, and the truth is most times numbers don't tell the whole story. Uh, Terrell and her fellow black woman colleagues made a tremendous difference in the league. Um, they encouraged the league to investigate U.S. engagement in Haiti. 
They challenged the league on its false and dangerous assault, uh, accusations that black male troops sexually assaulted German women. And then they brought before the league the Scottsboro Nine, and they kept that on the actual agenda across years. And so what I want you to think about is just how difficult this task was. These women worked in their own organizations, but then they also decided to reach across the aisle and to work with white women, believing then that they would accomplish their goals. Now, even though the interwar period, and by that I mean the period between the First World War and the Second World War, even though it lacked major conflict, this did not mean that the plight of black women became easier. Um, in fact, they had to attend to uh, mass racial violence and discrimination within the US, and so they did so. It was in this time frame that the National Council of Negro Women was born. Now, the National Council of Negro Women, differently from the National Association of Colored Women, focused on a national platform. The National Association of Colored Women focused largely on localized uplift, and we really saw that they went more local during uh, the Great Depression. Now, different from the Women's League of Peace and Freedom, both the National Association of Colored Women and the National Council of Negro Women supported war when that war seemed to promise further equality. So they would participate in pacifist movements. They would participate in peace organizations, but they could also be found supporting war, particularly when they believed that it would bring equality. So thank you so much for bringing up the complexity of that in this morning's keynote. And so you may say, why? Why did they do that? Well, black women fought for black men's engagement in warfare because they believed that if black men could show themselves as brave, then you couldn't deny their human rights. They believed that if black men shed their blood, then finally, and perhaps even more immediately, the democratic ideals of the nation would come to bear. And so they supported uh, war. And so we can talk about that in the question and answer the sort of complexity of that. Now, outside of war, black women in the NACW and the NCNW uh, promoted nonviolent approaches to social issues. Most especially for the council, what they tried to do was to propel black women into national and international affairs. And they said that was the only way that you could affect systemic change. Now, while the National Council of Negro Women is something new at this time, I do want to situate it within the broader tradition of black women's organizing. It is not disconnected in that way. And most especially what it shows is that black women took every opportunity, tried every strategy that they could to better their condition. And so when we think about what they attempted to do, I want to bring uh, into the conversation Dorothy B. Fairby. And if you haven't heard her name, I'm not surprised by that. In fact, the first book was a biography of Dorothy B. Fairby was published just a couple of years ago um, by a scholar, I think her name is Jennifer Scallion. And uh, it really talks about how important this woman was. And she was actually a president of Alpha Kappa Alpha. And so she had a lot of different um, a lot of different training, a lot of different leadership experiences. And she was hand chosen by Mary McLeod Bethune to be her successor. And so she is now leading the National Council of Negro Women. And just as an aside, and I hope you all will ask me about this in the question and answer, Mary McLeod Bethune had to fight to participate in the United Nations because there were invitations extended to five white women's organizations and one black organization, just one. And the one black organization was the NAACP. And so what the State Department told Bethune was black women are represented. We have five white women's groups and we have a black group. Again, all the women are white and all the blacks are men. And so she fought to participate and Ralph Bunch and um, Du Bois and others, they actually did not want her there, right? But she fought to be there. And on the floor of the United Nations, she actually had Dorothy B. Fairby with her. Dorothy B. Fairby was a physician. And so what she claimed was she was severely ill and she needed a doctor to sit on the floor with her at the United Nations. 
And it is true that she had suffered from illness, but she was not ill at the United Nations. This was a tactic to increase the visibility of black women in this international event. So hopefully we can get to that in a question and answer. And so Dorothy B. Fairby, in many ways, is an internationalist. That's how she sees herself. And in 1951, she was invited to travel to Germany to take um, part in a six-week tour. And this was to uh, really talk with German women. And at this point, we're uh, post-World War II about how to rebuild their society, right? How to model this based on the United States, democracy, com community work. And the State Department was proud of the accomplishments of these women. And they really tied this initiative by women, quote, to the best kind of publicity of our objectives in Germany. So it can't be understated what it meant. And so Dorothy B. Farabee was the only black woman who was present. And she became the leader of the panel. Despite being black or perhaps because she was a woman of color, she rose to the top. And the State Department had to acknowledge that and her peers acknowledged that. Now when she came home, she gave many speeches throughout the United States about her work. She actually spoke before the State Department. That's not a small matter that a black woman addressed the State Department. She was televised on NBC. But what I want you to know is that privately, she wrote to the president and said, I did this for you. What are you going to do for me? And so she said, don't make a bitter mockery of my words. I went abroad and I talked about the US and how we're working on democracy and progress. What are you going to do for African Americans? And so this is this sort of sophisticated strategy that these women employ. Now, Truman didn't answer the letter. I have no record that he ever answered the letter. But what I want you to know is that Fairby decided to continue on. In 1952, she was the only woman invited back of that previous panel to go back to Germany by Germany. And so she did this. In 1964, she became the face of the State Department when the State Department asked her to take a one-year tour to visit 40 different countries to talk to uh, representatives who, of the State Department but also to talk to local populations. Well, she was a professor at Howard University, and Howard University said, we cannot afford to allow our professor to go for a full year. So if we want to think about power, the State Department could have moved to the next person, but they didn't. There was something about Dorothy Faraby, something about her black woman perspective, and perhaps even her black woman body that made her indispensable to foreign policy. So they cut it. It went from being one year in 40 countries to being six months in 14 countries. And so she had the power then to shift what the State Department wanted. And if we also think about power, when she went abroad on those State Department visits, in every single country she had off the record meetings with women's groups. And she talked about the civil rights movement. She talked about progress and other things. And so we can get into that uh, in the question and answer. What I want to do now is move to the final example. Because if you know history and you know about the modern civil rights movement, we know that there were many successes. And we can pinpoint the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But if you know US history, you know that white backlash came severely. And the 1970s showed that. And in the 1980s and 1990s, we saw a systematic dismantling of civil rights. Uh, but that same time period that we see this backlash, there is this ideology that exists that racial tension is no more. By the 1990s, most people believed that the United States was a post-racial society. They finally healed it. Uh, at the election of Barack Obama, we all know that the conversation was, is the United States beyond race? Is race still an issue? And so I want to think about the 2012 death of Trayvon Martin, which brought three black women, radical community organizers to the forefront, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi. And what they did was they reignited a global conversation around state violence and racism. And so this movement, I argue, is vital to considering 
what has happened and what needs to happen in the African-American struggle for peace and parity. And I argue that it illustrates that the movement is not complete. When we think about the words of these founders, we have Opal Tometi who stated in a Time Magazine uh, interview, quote, that this movement is about an international human rights movement. It is about the full recognition of blacks' rights as citizens, and it is a battle for full civil, social, political, legal, economic, and cultural rights as enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So she harkens all the way back to the United Nations. Now, the official objective of the Black Lives Matter movement is to campaign against violence and systematic racism towards black people. And so if we look at Tometi's words and we look at the official objective, I told you to put a pen in what Mary Church Terrell said in 1919, so allow me to repeat it here. White people could talk about peace until doomsday, but they could never have it until the dark races were treated fair and square. So as I conclude, and we're focusing on women and the world, I think it's important to think about the lessons that we can take from these examples that I have given. Black women, I showed you, attempted to engage in the state. They attempted to work within uh, organizations founded by white women, black men, um, and interracial organizations. And oftentimes, they were the recipients of token, tokenism. And oftentimes, they experienced marginal successes. And as I told you, these could be clawed back. And we, we see that now. So as I prepared today's remarks, I thought about what tactics should be utilized. And I hope that we'll, we'll think about that as we think about shifting the paradigm. And I really pose this question because when black women founded an organization that really celebrated the state and sought to participate in the state, they experienced a number of shortcomings. But when black women founded an organization that used confrontation to point out the failures of the state, they were delegitimized and declared to be terrorists. Uh, in fact, the State Department and the FBI said that they were proponents of black identity extremism, and that's a quote. So fortunately, the 2017 Sydney Peace Prize saw past this labeling and this false rhetoric. But it was only a few months ago that the FBI formally recognized that Black Lives Matter is not a terrorist organization. And so I want to think about their language. I want to think about different tactics, different strategies, and leave us with this. Until we have a conversation, a real conversation, about the different experiences of people of color, of black Americans, until we consider or reconsider what is thought to be appropriate, what is thought to be legitimate forms of activism, then how do we rewrite the paradigm on peace? Thank you. OK, uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so if you have questions, please come up to the microphones here. Um, and we will try and get as many as we can before lunch. <laughs> I appreciate your comments, Dr. Wells, and I appreciate your knowledge of history. I'm going to bring up something that may challenge you, okay. because it challenges me every single day. Okay, there's a certain element of the inner city black community that is violent, and the people that they're victimizing most is their own people, all right? So we have many of our young men being, being shot, our children being killed. But at the same time, we, we're trying to put forward the Black Lives Matter move, movement to protect uh, unarmed black people from being victimized by the police. I see a conflict there because, we got, because when you have your children being shot, men being shot by, by primarily African-American men, we're looking for the police to come help us. But the Black Lives Movement, in many ways, the, the, the police, I think, perceive as a threat to their, their authority. So how are we going to find a way to 
to move uh, to protect our people at the, at, and at the same time get cooperation from the police? It's a very complex question. Yeah, yeah it is a, uh, is this on? It's on. Yep. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for that question. It is incredibly complicated. Um, given the little time that we have, I'll just say very briefly what, what I see. The first is that it's not either or. And oftentimes we create this false binary that we have to either focus on police brutality or we have to either focus on um, inter- or intra-related issues. It's not either or, and I don't think that the Black Lives Matter movement would say that it's either or. In fact, I've seen many of the founders say that there needs to be an addressing of violence within the, organi uh, within the black community. But the other thing is, if we consider Black Lives Matter and what they're trying to do, um, many of these individuals in the black community, as you said, um, inner city black community are violent. We have to understand that many of these individuals are victims of their circumstances. So we have to change their circumstances, right? And so we can't just focus on you know, the inner issue of violence and not address the systemic racism that allows that, the absence of jobs, the over uh, policing of these communities, uh, drugs, and uh, the different way in which um, uh, black men are treated in the legal system, all of those things. And so it's, it's not either or for me, and I, I get what you're saying, and it's so easy to just sort of say, well, we can't focus on the larger issue unless we focus on the sort of minor issue. And I think what we will see is that black history, as an example, showed, and we can go across centuries across organizations, a focus on the black community and a focus on the state. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with continuing that dual focus. Hi. My comment is um, on presentation. Who is presenting who at the table? And in this case, I really do understand uh, one of the speakers speaking about using the indigenous leaders and empowering the women. Equality is not, uh, equally, uh, it's not equally distributed. And from my context where I come from, that is very key because when you come really to even try to educate the women or even trying to really empower them, it comes who is doing it. Mm -hmm. And for me as an African and having been exposed, I'm not even a representative of the women, because they, uh, their comment would be, you are exposed. You want to start fire and take off. We have nowhere to go. And this will be coming from the women, will be coming from the men. It's like, don't listen to these, to these women who are uh, trying to educate you, because they'll take off once uh, they start the fire. So really, what can, can be done for, for these indigenous women or the indigenous leaders are really empowered. Who is going to empower them? Because those who are empowered, they're not a part of them, yeah. right? So it's really uh, a catch-22. It's there, they know they need it, but they are bashed, and they, it's really a, a big problem. So I would want to see how, you, uh, how that issue can be addressed, and I think it, cross, uh, it goes across three of you yeah. from your talk. Thank you. Um, it does feel like this isn't it on, doesn't, doesn't it? Like it's on. Um, I think you've just, I mean, I think you've really given the answer, which is that there needs to be um, representation by groups of themselves, and that includes women within communities, right? And I think um, your presentation so strongly and so starkly explained why women need their own organiza organizing, their own leadership, as well as being part of their own community, right? Um, I don't obviously have the answer to this. I, I feel that you really answered it in your question. Um, and so thank you very much. And I would, again, call attention to that. I, I love how these conversations are all kind of relating to each other. But this idea that there's dissent within communities, there's difference within communities, women are, we shouldn't be looking for one particular kind of woman who gets equal rights, right? Um, so, yeah. Okay, I used the on button, I think I'm okay, right? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I actually think that it's interesting to me to think about those two questions together. 
Uh, because I, I lived in a community that I think would be characterized as a violent African-American community in the south side of Chicago uh, around Robert Taylor. Um, and one of the things I noticed was that there aren't police there. There's a police station and the police drive to it in the morning and then they stay in there and they never come out. And the only time I ever saw them come out was when they saw white people around and they were just trying to scare them away so they didn't get hurt and be in the newspaper. Right, like I never saw them come out when there was like noise or violence or anything like that. And so to me, the phenomena that causes police to be violent towards unarmed black people also has a very serious role in these communities of violence, which is that the, the black body as a human isn't being taken seriously in policing. Right, so to me, like I wanna walk this line where I don't engage in representation, but I also am not blind to the things I see around me, right? It actually matters that I was the white kid they tried to scare away instead of the black kid they stopped from being policed for or of. But at the same time, it's something I witnessed and experienced and can communicate, right? So to me, I don't want to say I speak for everyone who's left out of this rising tide of gender equality. But I can say I speak as someone who has some issues fitting in with the idealized notion of women, right? Like, which I think is a little different than representation. Thank you for that great question. Um, you really get to the heart of one of the sort of interesting conversations that I have to have about black women and international engagement, particularly as it relates to Africa and the African diaspora. Like I said, when Mary Church Terrell stood up and said that she was representing all black people everywhere, right? And so the only person with African blood in her veins. And so she took liberty to say that she represented African women. And that's what a lot of um, white women organizations expected throughout the 20th century is that they would pick a black American woman and she would represent all black women everywhere, right? And so that's the complexity. But you got to the heart of something that, again, I think all of us talked about, uh, that this morning's keynote talked about, which is about uh, essentialism and the problematic and false notion of sisterhood, right? Which really gets rid of or fails to see uh, identity. And so if I'm being um, completely uh, sort of transparent and hopefully telling you all to read the book when it comes out, one of the things that I have to complicate is that as black women got a seat at the table and they said to the United Nations, allow us because we are related to African women, and they use this notion of sisterhood, allow us to be the representatives of the United Nations, what we see again is a false notion of sisterhood, and activism becomes philanthropy. And we have to really break that down, what happens when you know, women, people of color go into other spaces and they see themselves as working on populations rather than working with populations. And so I think that's a part of the conversation. Okay, yeah, we can take one more question or two more if there's anybody with the, okay, two more questions and then we'll stop for lunch. Uh, hello, uh, I am Madhu, I'm a Fulbright Scholar from India and my question, it's a, I'm very thankful to be here and it's an interesting panel discussion. My question is to Laura and uh, specifically, uh, uh, she, you say that uh, there's uh, expectations uh, from this, like women can do anything which uh, like men are supposed to do or men, they are capable to, and without the flaws of men. And when we see that kind of incident or pictures or any, any happening, it is being used in my country specifically I'm talking about or elsewhere it may be true. That incident, like something negative done by women, that incident is basically used as a, to write off this whole debate of gender equality. And there's a backlash, see, see, the, see the women, that's kind of, so how to address those things? How to, how to talk people, how to convince them that, so the, how to reverse this whole thing of this, this notion of gender equality, which is true, but which is being used against them. Thank you, I think, I hope I'm clear. 
Yeah, you know, I think that that's one of the big problems with instrumentalization being the basis for gender equality, right? So when you say there should be more women in politics because they make more peace, there should be more women in militaries because they'll be better behaved, countries that treat their women better are better at peace, right? Like all of these things then add the burden of to merit equality, you must be better than, right? And so to me, like, I'm all for these feminine, these values associated with femininity, right? Like, I love the idea of negotiation, of talking, of peace, like all of these things. But I want to separate the justification for including values associated with femininity in politics and the justification for including women in politics. Women in politics should be half of the people in politics, even if they all suck, right? Like, even if they're terrible. And I think the more you kind of say that, although that doesn't sell that well in a soundbite, like the less you end up with the being blamed for women's outlying behavior, right? Because every time a woman screws up, it's like a much bigger deal. So like there's this interesting thing. One of the places I study is uh, gender integration in militaries and combat roles. And so people sell this saying militaries will be more effective. And there'll be more unit cohesion if you have women in it. Not true. Like empirically, it seems to be the case that militaries are not more effective. Sometimes they're less effective. And there's not more unit cohesion. There's sometimes less unit cohesion. So then people turn around and say, well, then we shouldn't include women in combat. And to me, I'm like, no, you should just like, well, stop combat or get better at it, one of the two, right? Like, but it's if the justification of including women is that things will be better, then that means that every time a woman isn't better, it gets turned on women. And so to me, you have to break it up at the promoting level because you can't really do anything afterwards when they say, look, this woman isn't better, right? One more question, I think. Sure. And it's a very broad question, so do with it as you will. I'll direct it to Dr. Schoberg, but I think um, it has salience for all of you. Um, so in international relations, um, and more generally, I think um, in feminist contributions, part of what's been posited as an important thing, perhaps one of the greatest obstacles to advancing justice and equity for women and for all people is a reconceptualization of power. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering um, if you could share some of your thoughts on that. Just I mean, it's a huge question. But then also for the other panelists, if there's time, kind of the salience of that for the particular concrete um, examples and cases that you're, you're dealing with, it would be illuminating. Okay, do you want to start? We'll go down the table and then just quick responses. Or they can start. Or they can <laughs> one, two. Okay. All right, I guess I, guess I will, yeah. Um, you know, I go back and forth on this, right? Because like, I want to take uh, the ways that power is interpreted by policymakers in the international arena seriously. Uh, because like, if I sit here and reinterpret power, uh, well, then I might just be talking to myself and a bunch of cool women, which is awesome. Um, but so partly I want to take seriously the way people think about power in the mainstream. But then I also want to say that you know, power to, that is the power to fight against what's going on in the world, and power with, that is the power to get together to affect change, also really matter. And I think that you can add to that the power of discourse, right? Like, I'm not that good at saying things well. I don't know if you've noticed. Um, but there are lots of people who are actually really good at figuring out how to frame things such that these discourses then intervene in media and political discussions. And I think that that's also kind of a really important understanding of power. And I think for gender equality, it's really important to me to understand that power and violence go hand in hand, right? Like, and that even a lot of the positive things we do have violent content. So like, to me, I keep reminding myself there's no such thing as anything I can do that's nonviolent, right? There's just a question of less violence and directing the violence where it should go instead of that there's no power and no violence in what I do. So that's kind of important to me to contextualize. And that's not a complete answer, but we're a little out of time, so I'll shut up for now. Um, 
I guess I'll just I'll just say in terms of legal empowerment as a lawyer that's the way I, th I think about um, your question because I think in the US and in many places the law has been monopolized by lawyers and I think that the question of what the power of law is is a question about when does the state have the power to act what does the state owe people you know and that should be determined by people not by lawyers in my opinion um, so the, the purpose of legal empowerment really is to put law in the hands of people so that they can make it do what they want it to do for their rights. And so right now that's what I'm really focused on. Um, and certainly for women, that does mean rearticulating the power of the state um, across all of these axes of difference and, 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 and making those claims in a very um, nuanced way. So for the sake of time, I'll keep my remarks uh, brief, but hopefully we can talk afterwards because you're absolutely right. This is a huge question and it's very complicated. And it's something that I wrestle with, especially I wrestle with and against because in writing about black women in the international arena, what power did they exercise? That's usually the question that I get, um, especially because I present at foreign policy conferences and different things like that. And so I have, um, and I continue to go back and forth, as Laura has mentioned, with uh, how to define power and what power looks like. Uh, and one, I guess, small example that I would offer, um, and I'm calling on the work of Penny Von Eschen here when she talks about ambassadors, cultural ambassadors, rather than just ambassadors that we think about at the State Department and we think about uh, people, people like Louis Armstrong and other um, well-known celebrities and artists who engaged in foreign policy, right? And so they practice power, even when we don't think about it traditionally, in the sort of things that they said and the concessions that they could receive. So you're absolutely right that we have to think about what we mean when we say power, but to Laura's point, you know, I can't just redefine power in a way that removes the nation state because then I think I don't do justice to really describing the population that I'm talking about. So I'll just say that and then hopefully we can talk a bit afterwards. Okay, uh, if you can join me in thanking the panelists again for a fantastic presentation and discussion. Uh, we are running slightly behind, so I think if we shorten lunch a little bit and if you come back for one one forty, we'll just do 45 minutes for lunch. I think that's roughly correct. Um, and so instead of one we we'll reconvene at one forty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. I have gifts for you, Jolie. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I enjoy your presentations. One, I wish that I could be so extemporaneous.
excuse me. I just, I, I wanted to let you know that if you, can I have your attention, please? Thank you. Um, in this room over here, we have a very light lunch, and if we'd like to ask you to please go ahead and direct your energies in that direction, and let's talk out here. Thank you so much.
It like shows up like <laughs> and kind of like terrible. Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what? I I I was like every time I ever wear a dress or anything short, I bring a sweater just because it seems like half the time you're too cold and then half the time you're too hot. <laughs> so it's just a you know.
Everybody, please take your seats. We want to get started. Please take your seats. Okay, I'm about to start, please, um, out of courtesy for the speakers, somebody please tell the folks in the back to come and sit. Okay, so if everyone could take their seats, please. <clears throat> All right, so this afternoon we have another keynote speaker. <clears throat> and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce her to her, Dr. Marie Berry, Assistant Professor of International Studies at the University of Denver. Um, Dr. Berry, <clears throat> is at the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies, where she is affiliated with the C Center for International Security and Diplomacy. She's also director of the Inclusive Global Leadership Initiative, an effort to catalyze research, <clears throat> education, and programming aimed at elevating and amplifying the work that women activists are doing at the grassroots to advance peace, justice, and human rights across the world. As a sociologist, great discipline. That was my, <laughs> sorry. As a sociologist, her research focuses on violence, gender, and politics. Her first book, War, Women, and Power, there are uh, flyers in the back about it, and the book is also featured there. Uh, war, war, Women, and Power, From Violence to Mobilization in Rwanda and Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2018. It examines the impact of ma mass violence on women's political mobilization in Rwanda and Bosnia. Her second book project explores women's participation in movements of social change across the world. Together with Dr. Millie Lake, she runs the Women's Rights After War Project. And Dr. Berry's award-winning work has been published in places like Gender and Society, Democratization, Science, New Political Economy, Mobilization, Political Politics and Gender, Foreign Policy, The Society Pages, and so on. 
Please welcome to the podium Dr. Marie Berry, who will speak on fighting for rights, stories from women activists mobilizing for change. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, to have such a generous introduction. Um, Kate, uh, wherever you are, I think she's trying to turn on my PowerPoint. Um, thank you so much, um, and Hoda, for the invitation. And thank you to the, some of the women in the room whose, whose footsteps I feel very appreciative to be able to walk in, in this world as a feminist sociologist. I, am constantly humbled when I um, get to meet some people who, whose work has shaped my own. And so um, thank you for, for all that you've done to create openings and opportunities, I think, for, for younger scholars and, and those of us that are starting our careers to, to be able to mainstream some of these conversations in, as you just heard, a, a security department where I, where I work or a security center where I work. I was in Sarajevo in 2013 as I was wrapping up a lot of the uh, interviews and field work for my first book project. Um, and I remember walking into a museum that was right in the heart of Sarajevo. It had just opened and I walked into the dimly lit exhibit hall and I was confronted by large photographs of the lives lost at Srebrenica in 1995 the 8,000 boys and men who were murdered over three days. And the images in this exhibit hall were of the lives left behind. Images of discarded clothing, a stuffed animal lying on dirt, a woman's hands ringing. And I remember on the far end of the exhibit hall a rotating slideshow of black and white images that were flickering while I was walking around the exhibit. They appeared to be from the siege of Sarajevo, images of children running for cover, well-dressed men and women seemingly walking for work and then taking shelter behind a, 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 a car or a structure of some sort. Modern sidewalks being hit with mortar shells and explosions. Tanks outside of residential buildings, the ubiquitous images of humanitarian aid distribution centers. Other images reflecting urban war. And I, they barely registered with me until I began to walk out of this gallery. When I started watching the images with a bit more attention, I realized that they were not from Sarajevo but they were rather images from Syria, and every single one of the images had been taken in the past 12 months. It was something about that moment that horrified me as it brought history to the immediate present. Nearly 20 years after the end of the wars in Bosnia and in Rwanda, it was dawning on me how little had fundamentally changed. And it was since that moment that I have been focused less on championing gender equality or women's rights and more, often for the reasons that Laura Joburg mentioned earlier, focused on eradicating violence in its myriad forms. The violence in our world today can look as it did in that museum, weapons, armed combatants, civilians fleeing. It can also look like the ongoing armed conflict today that unfolds in Yemen, where a child dies every 12 minutes from the effects of the war. It can look like what continues to unfold in Afghanistan, where this past weekend, 40 civilians were killed in an anti-Taliban raid backed by US airstrikes. We see it over and over again on our news feeds, instability in Libya, conflict in northern Mali, and in Somalia and elsewhere. We also see this violence in the undeclared wars, not between states and rebel groups or po proxy powers, but between narco-criminal organizations, such as in Mexico, where 17,000 people lost their lives last year. Or perhaps in the 11,000 odd people that are killed by firearms in the United States, many in the 289 mass shootings that have already occurred in 2019. 
So often the violence in our world does not look only like guns and bullets, but rather like the generations of Palestinians who are growing up displaced from their homelands, the population of Rohingya who have been driven out of Myanmar, the deafening silence of the lockdown in Kashmir, the imperialism of borders that determine movement on the basis of citizenship privileges, the unbridled capitalism that is melting ice caps and wreaking havoc on our climate. We also see it in how violence morphs and twists to embed itself in our institutions, our homes, and our bodies for generations. It is present in the carceral system in the US with roots in our country's founding and a system of enslaved labor. And the fact that we stand here today, as Meg mentioned, on indigenous land in a room dubbed the Colony Ballroom. <laughs> the trauma of these legacies of violence that are not transformed are transferred. And this reflects what our late, our recently late great friend, Cynthia Coburn, called continuums of violence. Her work shapes mine so profoundly, and it's, um, for me, meaningful to be able to speak about these continuums with her memory um, on my own mind. Can we even imagine a world free from these myriad manifestations of violence? I challenge you. And is equality possible? Gender equality, racial equality, class equality, is it even possible and should it even be our focus when such profound structural, physical, and symbolic violence exists? If you're anything like me, your imagination of that world that is free from violence has been dulled, has been limited by our constant exhaustion and, and feelings, kind of the lack of urgency around these crises. It feels overwhelming. I think our imaginations have also been limited by our exposures to violence and to colonial legacies of epistemic violence that have structured our very learning to think about what is possible, what we know is possible. And what I've needed, and what I suspect many of us may need, is a chance to reimagine and re-envision what a world would look like that prioritized the full and complete emancipation of all human beings from any form of harm. I put forth to you today that it is incumbent on us to develop our feminist imaginations in order to envision this new paradigm. My goal with my talk today is to provide some food for that revisioning process, some food in the, storm of, in the form of stories. I have been remarkably fortunate over the past four years um, since I arrived at the University of Denver to be amongst colleagues and a community that has tried to reimagine what a university of higher education looks like. Scholars and colleagues that are interested in bridging the gap between the research we produce within the university and the world at large. I think too often we spend thousands and thousands of dollars and endless, countless hours conducting research that rarely impacts, that rarely, rarely lands in communities and in the world at large because of paywalls, because of the cost of academic books, because of the astronomical cost of higher education that has left so many of us in crushing debt. My colleague Erica Chenoweth and I decided to imagine what it would look like if our university was focused not only on educating the students fortunate enough to walk through its doors and pay its hefty tuition fees, but instead finding ways of flipping what is conventionally considered expertise within the academy to recenter these experts in our classrooms and at the center of our rooms. We wanted to find a way to take our department which has this strong tradition in security and reimagine more holistically what security means. And we recognize that we are in a very, very difficult global political moment, that we see the rise of right-wing populists across the globe, the erosion of human rights, the backsliding of women's rights, LGBTQI rights, minority rights, the decline of democracy, the shrinking of civic space, the erosion of freedoms of the press, and the program which we designed is, at its core, 
an effort to elevate and amplify the work that women identified activists are doing to counter these worrying trends, to push back against oppression, and to challenge violence in all of its forms. Through this project, I've met so many remarkable, groundbreaking women, um, the less known Greta Thunbergs of the world, that are fighting every day in, in their communities against these forms of violence, and have been very fortunate recently to, to launch, to begin a book project uh, with my colleague, Jill Hero that captures some of these stories. And so this is the first time I'm talking about this, this book project, and I'm really excited to share some of this with you today. I want to introduce these stories, but I also want to acknowledge the remarkable privilege I have to be standing here telling, being the one to tell you these stories. And it's quite an unjust irony, I think, in some ways, that it's me. This is a picture of the program that we run at DU. I'll talk about it more a little later. I want to start by telling you Claire's story. Claire grew up in a middle-class family near, Water, near Waterford in the south of Ireland as a, as she described it, white, middle-class, English-speaking woman in a country where that is just the norm. She had her first child early, at 22. At the time, she considered having an abortion. She hadn't imagined getting pregnant so young, but it was expensive, it was inconvenient. She would have had to travel more than, uh, more to England and spend more than $2,000 on that whole process because abortion remained illegal in Ireland. She had a partner, she had a supportive family, so she ended up having her daughter, Carla. She got married, she became a stay-at-home mom, which she loved, and several years later, she had a son. In Claire's words, all of it was going well, and then I was pregnant with my third child. Complete accident, completely. I was not expecting that at all. Nathan, her son, was only a year old, and he was just, um, just starting to walk, and she's thinking, I can't be pregnant again. How did this happen? Oh my God, it's terrible. But finally, we got our heads around the fact that we were gonna have another baby. We came to terms with it. This was in 2015. At Claire's 22-week scan, she was told their baby was going to die. Her baby's symptoms were so severe, it had a, a trisomy protein, and the way that it had manifested left the baby with a deformed face. Her placenta was covered in cysts. It was extremely distressing. And as Claire put it, really, how does this happen to a baby? It seemed so unfair. Claire's overwhelming emotion at this point wasn't grief yet. It was terror, terror of what it would feel like to have to have a child within you that you knew would not bring, be alive when it came into the world. Claire asked for an abortion. No, the doctor said, doesn't happen in Ireland. Claire described to me how she figured there was a Irish way of doing things, you know? some way of getting it done just in the back of the hospital, not in the front, but some way of getting it done. This couldn't be something that in Ireland in 2015 we actually didn't offer. The doctor repeated, no. Going to England was no longer a possibility. She was past that point in her pregnancy and it was gonna cost 2,000 euros. Claire didn't have it. She also had two older children and didn't have childcare. Instead, Claire's doctor told her that she just needed to go home and wait for her baby to die. This was likely going to happen before birth. A, mid a midwife explained to her very clinically, what's gonna happen is one day, you'll go a full 24 hours without movement, and that's the day you'll know. Then you can come in here, we'll do a scan to confirm, and then we can talk about induction. In Claire's words, the surreal kind of conversation where the midwife is sitting there and telling you how you're going to be able to tell when your baby has died inside of you. I just couldn't get over the cruelty of it. They even started telling me about how to start taking pills to stop the breast milk from coming in because I'd breastfed before. That killed me. It absolutely killed me. Claire went home and all of a sudden it was like, she said, I didn't count. I was literally a vessel, a pregnancy. I did everything I could. I started writing to politicians, I wrote to radio stations, television, I literally spent a full day emailing. 
at one point just begging for help. Nobody did anything. And that's when I knew, I knew from that moment, that I was always going to fight with my everything, no matter what happened, no matter what happened with me, I was going to be damn sure that it was never going to be, happen to my daughter. After five weeks, Claire's daughter passed away. She said, knowing that the baby was dying, it was like I wanted to crawl out of my skin. I was being smothered. I wanted to unzip myself and walk away. A week after she buried her baby, which she named Alex, they planted her in the, gar in the yard and, and actually planted a tree for her. She sat down in her parents' living room. She was still a mess, she said, but way more functional than she had been before. And she said, I'm going to campaign. I'm going to join a campaign, and I'm going to fight this. I don't know how or what I'm going to do yet, but I am not going to let this go until it's over. Initially, Claire was too traumatized to go out of the house. She began her act activism on social media, tweeting at politicians with fierceness and, 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 a, and a power. I've seen some of her tweets that are, that are totally un unimaginable, an anger that poured out of her from the protection of her home, but in this public sphere. Eventually, a journalist called her, and the journalist wanted to talk to her about her story. And Claire said, I wouldn't let her off the phone until I had told her the story. I needed to talk. Now, Claire's experience followed right around, right after the death of Savita Halapanavra, who was an Indian immigrant to Ireland who had died following the complications from, um, from, a, from birth um, after being re refused an abortion. And Savita's death galvanized a movement in Ireland to ban the Eighth Amendment, which in Ireland has, had prohibited um, abortion in almost all cases. As Claire's story became more public, um, other groups began to reach out to her and ask if she would be willing to join them, and she decided, I'm going to go for this. She joined the group in December, two months after the death of Alex, and then spent the next several years fighting tirelessly to get a referendum on the agenda. They eventually got it. They had 100 days once the referendum was announced to pull together a nationwide campaign to ban the eighth. A growing movement coalesced with women's groups um, focused on fatal fetal abnormalities, with women's groups focused on kind of um, healthcare arguments, uh, with feminist and anarcho-feminist groups that were also organizing on a range of different issues, and they created a coalition called Together for Yes. It was a mixture of all of these different groups. And Claire told her story. She told her story again and again and again in groups and people's homes and meetings in Waterford and in Dublin and all elsewhere across Ireland. She met so many other members of the community who had had similar stories. And she said, the anger is what sustained me. And grief eventually entered into the picture. If I hadn't had that coursing through me, the anger and the grief, I would have just been a mess. I would have literally been back in bed. Eventually, on the day of the referendum, as part of this project, I interviewed abortion activists from all across Ireland. And what was so interesting was that so many of them were optimistic about the vote, but they were, they were very, 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 very nervous. Most of them anticipated maybe 51% of the population will, will turn out and vote to ban the eighth. But certainly, um, they, they, nobody felt secure or safe going into this election. What surprised so many of them was how the Irish diaspora responded. Within the days of the referendum, immediately before, Irish citizens by the thousands began to return to Ireland quote unquote, to come home to vote. As Claire put it, these people got off the plane, into the polling station, into the airport. One woman was in Ireland just for four hours and spent 28 hours traveling there and back, I think from Australia. It was incredible. Irish citizens from all over the globe came back to repeal the eighth. She, Claire continued, there were people, there was, just this, there was just this thing on this day, and she started to cry. People were getting into their car to drive to the airport to pick somebody up to take them to a polling station that they didn't even know, that they'd never meet again, just to make sure they got home for this. And that is the day, and that was the moment that I thought, whether we win or lose, we just created something here that is absolutely amazing. 
We have a culture here in Ireland that is all about humanity, compassion, and care. The referendum, as you may know, passed in a landslide with 68% of the population turning out to vote. Many saw the ban on abortion as linked to the legacies of Catholic domination and British imperialism that had carried on the violence of colonialism through women's bodies. And today, many of these activists are now fighting for a full island campaign as abortion still is severely restricted in Northern Ireland. I'm gonna tell you Anat's story next. Anat grew up in a single parent home in a neighborhood of Tel Aviv. Her father was extremely violent, both physically but also financially. After her parents separated, it took 11 years for her mother to divorce, formally divorce her father because of the rabbinical council in Israel. And Anat described how the first crisis of her life was when her father left and he refused to pay child support. And after this protracted court battle between her mom and her dad, her mother ended up losing the house that Anat and her siblings were living in. And shortly thereafter, her mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Her treatment forced her business to fail, and her cancer treatment made the family financially insecure. Anat mentioned this and then described how as a child, she would just climb trees and talk to herself. She was kind of a self-described self weirdo, as she put it to me. She said, as a first grader, her teachers wrote a song in a rhyme for everybody, every child in her class. And Anat recalled that for her, the teachers had created a rhyme that more or less joked, is Anat a boy or is Anat a girl? Anat said, I carried this question with me, am I a boy, am I a girl, with me as a first grader. And I was like, wow, now reflecting back, what an incredible question. They made it this cute thing. Everybody had a rhyme. That was my rhyme. Everyone called me a boy. I was very, very small. I looked like a boy, and I didn't go with a bra. Eventually, Anat came out to her family and friends, which she described as the defining moment in her life. And as she put it, her queerness is what motivated her activism. Anat got involved in LGBT advocacy, organizing film festivals and large events related to LGBT equality. She became adept at producing campaigns and cultural events aimed at challenging the narrative and changing the narrative around LGBTQ issues. And one day she was in a training for a group of diverse Israelis and Palestinians who were interested in entering politics. They were on a lunch break and as she put it, she was just kind of bored scrolling on her phone. A headline that caught her attention was of the murder of a young woman in Yaffa, um, basically next to Tel Aviv. She went back to the room and she saw that her working group in this training, they were, they were all women at that, at that moment. And she started talking with women in this group and talking about, you know, what are we gonna do about this? We keep hearing these headlines of women being murdered by their husbands, by their boyfriends, by their fathers, by their mother's boyfriends. What are we gonna do about it? And as they kind of talked and they recognized the scale of the problem and they recognized the need to do something, as I not put it, they couldn't decide on any course of action. They couldn't figure out what to do. For the next few weeks, every time a, a, a story about the murder or, or the brutal, brutal kind of abuse of a woman entered into the newspaper, she would take to WhatsApp and message her friends and basically say, let's do something. And people would say, no, you know, it's Ramadan right now, so let's not. Or let's do this, no, you know, somebody already did that, let's, this, it's not time, it's not time. And she said, how, oh my God, I just started realizing, wow, I cannot galvanize the type of response that this egregious form of violence deserves. But then, there was a week in November of last year when uh, the United Nations dubs it uh, International Day Against Violence Against Women. And Bibi Netanyahu, or really Sarah Netanyahu, Bibi's wife, gave Anat and a lot of other feminist activists what she called a, a gift. On this day, Netanyahu and his wife had visited a shelter for battered women, and they were, giving, they were, they were being given a tour on live TV, 
And BB remarked to the manager of the shelter, wow, I didn't know the scale of the problem. And the manager of the shelter says, what? You know, totally shocked. She's like, you should know this is a huge thing. You should know also that your coalition voted against a program that would provide 250 million shekels, this emergency program um, that would have provided services for these women. You voted against it. And he said something along, this is Anat's words, he said something along the lines of, oh, coalition, opposition, opposition brings something, coalition says no, and his wife says, it's not a matter of opposition and coalition. And this was the fire that the movement needed to put violence against women on center stage. Anat returned to organizing this coalition and trying to get her friends to commit to the work of rallying against gender-based violence. And at that moment, two girls were killed in two different parts of Israel. One, Silvana, by her mother's ex, who beat her to death at home. Another, Yara, went to buy bread and was horrifically attacked, assaulted, and ultimately dismembered. That night, in rage, Anat and her friends designed a logo and a campaign. This is a state of emergency. And when she was riding the train home that night, she described how she saw a similar looking event on Facebook that said, I am a woman, I strike. And it had a date associated with this Facebook event, December 4th, which was about eight or nine days from then. And Anat's words, she said, whoa, <laughs> whoa. And actually, then she continued, she says, they're really fucking up my business. I was the one trying to organize this, this site, or this, this, this march. She was, so she was so immediately feeling sort of threatened by the competition, and, um, but then immediately reached out to this group, and they started to organize. They organized a strategy room, they created a first floor kind of uh, layout in one of their houses where they were all pouring in 24 hours a day to begin to make branding for the campaign, to reach out to connect feminist organizations across Israel to join the planning. Um, to begin actually thinking strategically about how we could market this in a way that would actually make national news and disrupt conversations and drive attention to this, this issue. One day, they, they began to, they began to um, call for a strike every day at 10 a.m. in the morning. Every day, women, men, and everybody, leave your homes, leave your jobs, and go stand on the streets for the same number of minutes that captures the number of people, a number of women that have been murdered by men in Israel thus far this year. So at that point, it was 24 minutes for the 24 people that have been murdered. And one day, artists placed an exhibition of red shoes you see here in a square at the center of Tel Aviv. You also see the creation of new die-ins, this idea that performance artists were spilling red paint and actually staging these protests every morning. And then on the actual day of the strike, December 4th, people of all political and religious bent stayed home from work. This was an attempt, as a strike does, to make your presence felt in the economy and, and in your home and so forth. And at the main event stage in Tel Aviv, a coalition that took to the stage was extremely diverse. In Anat's words, they were ultra-religious from all sides of the spectrum, Muslim, Jews, secular, religious, Etc. settlers, a lot of settlers, and progressives, Arab Israelis, Sephardic Jews, Ashkenazi Jews. At least 30,000 people were in the streets and others didn't show up for work that day. And the strike did eventually make national news. When Anat was describing what she thought the strike meant, certainly this wasn't the end all goal, but it was a step. She said, the diversity of people on the stage and the diversity of people involved in planning that strike suggests something even more powerful, a turning point perhaps, and linking together the shared experiences of violence between people who have had very different experiences of violence from the state. It was an effort in building relationships that allowed different groups to end up on the stage that day. As Anat put it, Arabs know they don't want a settler on the stage, but in the planning process we said, listen, what would an eight-year-old settler whose father is beating her at home do? Is it not her protest? It is her protest. Building relationships is what Anat is offering as an activist to resist violence in any form by coalition building. 
that difficult, often exhausting, challenging work of bringing people with different priorities and different agendas together to see their shared suffering as a shared struggle. Doing so powerfully allows us to see the connectedness of these systems of violence, of occupation and patriarchy, of militarism and racism, to think about how these, these systems don't only mutually reinforce each other, but they are constitutive of each other. My final story is Kati. Kati is from Petare, Venezuela. As she puts it, I was born in extreme poverty. My family was very, very poor, and I always believed in I have a dream. To see everything differently, my mother had four sons, one had special needs. And in seeing so much need, it made me continue going forward. Kati became a baker, a very skilled baker that was sought after to produce birthday cakes, wedding cakes, and so forth. And for more than a decade, she had a very successful cake kind of store um, in her neighborhood. But the neighborhood she lived in remained impoverished and often subjected to violence. She described how ever since she was young, every day on the way to make beautiful cakes, she would walk through trash, lots and lots of trash. One day, about 10 years ago, her uncle, who was like her dad, who had raised her, was killed. No idea why. Shortly thereafter, her brother-in-law had been killed while att attending a, car a carnival. The violence of the surrounding neighborhoods began to touch her family very, very urgently and very immediately. Not knowing what to do, Kati came up with a plan to start where she could control it, by eliminating the trash. Everyone told her that cleaning up the neighborhood, challenging, challenging the local government, and so forth would be impossible. But she just started digging in a way that she called apolitical just to recover the public space. She said she began to receive threats, aggressions, everything, but she continued. She became more active in her cleanup. She organized the youth from the neighborhood. She began to bring other people out. And this kind of collective organization in public spaces got her thrown in prison, got her robbed, got her beaten up by the police, and it got her frequently and pervasively harassed by other members of her community for just trying to improve her neighborhood. She kept going. One day, there was a pacifist demonstration, and Kati decided that she could not stay quiet, that she needed to do something more, to go to a protest, to bring a banner, she said, to lift a flag, and she decided to take a more participatory role. This coincided with the rise of movements to resist the increasingly authoritarian government in Venezuela. And Kati became organized with the opposition, attending protests and organizing peaceful resistance, sometimes even through song. She also began to make the connections in her own life between the government oppression, the violence against her family that was seen as apolitical criminal violence, and the trash that she was constantly cleaning up. In 2017, she mobilized a group of artists and activists to start painting murals, like this one, behind the trash piles this, this taken in her neighborhood that she was constantly cleaning up. She kept going, and soon they're organized into an organization called Haciendo Ciudad, that basically began to do major community cleanups and then art installations and community garden planting. They expanded this work. She said, today I can say with pride that these spaces that were once covered in trash are now art. It is on, she said, on one side, on the community level, the goal is to unite people. Every person has a way of thinking. And these, these ways of thinking differ profoundly in Venezuela right now. You have pro-government supporters, Chavez, Chavistas, Maduro supporters of cultures, ideologies, and religion. It's difficult to bring everybody together to speak one language. She said, I talk to the evangelicals, you know? They speak about God. I talk to the delinquents. I talk to the gang. I speak all of these languages. And the language is art. 
We are Venezuelans, and that is something amazing, she said. We need to unite. So then I felt through, these, through the reclaiming of space, through the, through the, the, the re-territorialization of communities and of blocks that are associated with violence and with poverty and with oppression, that re-territorialization through this aesthetics of beauty and through art has created a powerful political statement that this is not okay. And she continues to be actively involved with the, with the opposition in Venezuela. I want to end by telling you that these are just a few, few stories from the many that I've heard over the past few years through this work. I was, um, about three weeks ago, the, the first of September, I was just a few miles from here at the um, closing ceremony of the 2019 Igley Summer Institute, which we held at the, um, uh, the National African American History of Museum and Culture. And um, we partnered this year with the U.S. Institute of Peace, and that's why we were in D.C. for a portion of it. We had women from South Sudan, from South Africa, from the Philippines, from Azerbaijan, women like Christine Ahn, who led a march of 10,000 women across the demilitarized zone in the Koreas, women like Koketsu Moti, who have founded a powerful ch a platform for women and for black women in particular in South Africa to advance their rights and foster democracy, women like Kuzi Miranda from the Philippines, who works constantly to actually find better lives for internally displaced people while challenging the violent extremism that exists in the Philippines in so many forms. And one thing that I think lands every single time we've had these gatherings is the importance of cultivating resilience and of having conversations about the myriad forms of violence that people are subjected to in their lives because fundamentally trauma from violence that is transformed becomes transferred. These stories also remind me again and again that we should never accept the lazy idea that there are not enough capable, courageous women to take on leadership roles in resolving conflicts and strengthening civil societies and in building peace. And I fundamentally believe that building our vision of an inclusive and more just world that sees all violence as interconnected will require the mobilization of women who see their struggles as interconnected. And peace and equality is not possible unless we are liberated from violence in all of its forms. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Berry, for that very interesting and beautiful talk. And I think you've given us some ideas of how to mobilize. Um, let's open it up to questions. Please, and we're, you know, it would be nice if we could get to the microphones so we can ask the questions because we're running a little behind schedule. Did you say that there's a movement in Northern Ireland now? There is. It's, it's, could you repeat the yes, question? Yes. Um, come up here, please. I'm oh, just sure. going to moderate. <laughs> the question was um, whether there's a movement in Northern Ireland, and absolutely. And actually, um, I did a lot of interviews up in Belfast, and one of the things that, that struck me is that the movement in Northern Ireland um, for abortion rights is very tied to the same kind of nodes of organizing that mobilized for peace uh, in the peace process. And so you see some of the same individuals who are involved in pushing for an end to the troubles, um, actually very much in seeing the troubles as linked to the forms of, of kind of um, embodied uh, uh, harm that comes from the state restrictions of abortion rights. And, um, and there's a, the, the, the abortion rights campaign ARC um, is, a, is a full island campaign. And that was one of the three major entities that drove the Together for Yes Coalition forward, which is the big umbrella organization that helped with um, repealing the eighth. Thanks. Thanks very much. I thought that was really moving and, and profound. Can you talk a little bit about the conditions of possibility for this kind of movement? Like what do you, across the different spaces and stories, what makes this kind of mobilization possible? Right. That's such a great question and one that I think um, social movement scholars have uh, failed to, um, to, to fully address 
what the, what, what the conditions are that allow for movements to look like the movements we recognize as movements. Right? We think of movements in the West oftentimes as people in the streets. In so many parts of the world, this is fundamentally impossible without severe risks to one's safety and security. Right? The, the feminist approach to thinking about movements and, and drawing, drawing on kind of a, a vast literature on the micropolitics of resistance, thinking about how ordinary activities of a subaltern can actually be political and can manifest in political change even if they don't look like the kind of mobilization, the protests, the banners, and so forth, is it, I think is essential for us to consider. When I convene the, the group every year of activists, their activism looks radically different. It can look like um, Farida Naburema coming from Togo, who has been sort of the face of democracy movements in West Africa, challenging her dictator oftentimes very, very publicly. But it can also look like the way in which a, a, a woman from Colombia named Vero, Veronique, she is um, a, a, an Afro-Colombian woman who is queer and, and feminist and is mobilizing very subversively, not in the streets, but oftentimes in, 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 um, in, by creating spaces of healing for people that are burning out, for people whose experience and exposure to violence is so pervasive and so ever-present in their lives that they stop the work eventually. And so her politics and her mobilization is in that convening. And I think that that's important for us to also see as political, right? I think there are, I think there are, um, uh, the question then becomes what is, what is a movement and how is, how is, how is, um, how are movements um, uh, grown, developed, and advanced? And how can we kind of actually think about transformation and transformative movements more broadly? Because I think they're possible just about everywhere. Thank you so much. Um, I see some great people I know up there too. Yay. The piece is loud and catching. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> got Jamie. And <laughs> great work. Yeah. Um, actually, building a little bit on this question of the conditions of possibility, I think I've had some formal conversations with folks about um, sort of thinking of constructive agency and constructive resilience in the face of oppression, sort of some of the characteristics of an approach um, that one sees in some of this activism, and as you say, movements that aren't always recognized as movements, and I'm wondering whether, I haven't yet found it, but if there could be like a clear articulation of some of its elements, and one that strikes me as very strong is coherence between means and ends, and almost a politics of, of means, um, yeah. where people are thinking about the building of what they want to see in the process of trying to deal with whatever they totally. need to in the way. And it would just be extraordinary, I think, if there was clear articulation of that and even in the sharing of all these experiences, something that could be offered that one can see across all of these. I'm sure there is work out there. I, it's not something I know that well, but just in the course of your work, I was wondering. I mean, it's a great question. And I think the way that I, the way that I, this has come up repeatedly in my conversations with so many of these activists comes back to that question of the feminist imagination. Movement activists that I've met oftentimes have a set of tactical strategic goals at the forefront of their campaigns. It is about repealing the eighth, right? It is about getting the dictator out of power. It is about passing a piece of legislation. Is it, it is about toppling, you know, toppling a, a, an administration. And those are important goals, right? But they are also extremely limited. And they don't necessarily take into account what comes next. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but there's a quote by Franz Fanon who basically says, we're not imagining um, what are we going to imagine after the last white policeman leaves? And it's it, it's this idea that we actually in our in our in our in our in our planning and our thinking about how to kind of catalyze change have to think not reform not in a reformist manner but in a transformative manner. How are we actually seeking to build movements that change systems and then 
don't replicate the violence of those systems? How do we build movements that challenge and dismantle those systems, rebuilding more justice, more, more, more just, more inclusive, more democratic, more, more peaceful societies in the aftermath? And I think that that is something that's come up when we add a feminist lens to the kind of training toolkit that is oftentimes centered in social movement conversations, which focuses on civil resistance and direct action, which focuses on community organizing, which focuses on peace building. And I think that those, those modalities, those, those approaches are powerful, important, and necessary. And then a feminist vision, a feminist umbrella over them allows us to say, OK, and then where is the future we want to build? Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful question and, and lots, of, lots of other thinking, I think, to, to do on that. But I, I appreciate it very much. I'm just interested in the question of how organizing, how um, internet access and communication access and being so varied around all around the world, how is that playing a role in the kind of movements that you're <coughs> talking about? That's a great question. And it's, and it's, so there's this digital, there's this, this digital age, and I think we, yeah. we, we oftentimes credit Twitter and Facebook as platforms that can help mobilize you know, people quickly into the streets. And certainly, they've been remarkably important for those things. But I think that it's more complicated than that. Um, we, we see oftentimes a movement, for instance, um, Ni Uno Menos, a movement in Argentina um, that brought at one point two million people to the streets was largely a movement that happened around the, uh, the hashtag, ni uno menos, mm -hmm. not one less, not one less woman um, in the world that will be taken out of the world because of gender-based violence and, and, and femicide. Mm -hmm. This massive movement, a massive kind of uh, a, a number of people, about two million people that came to the streets in 2015 in Argentina, was catalyzed by Twitter and by a group of about 16 um, uh, journalists who, who you know, decided to make this a, a really, really, really prominent a, you know, campaign and focused it right after the kind of very visible and very high profile murder of, and, and of, a, of a young woman. But what this research for me has been really interesting to reveal is that the hashtag itself and the kind of massive mobilization of people would not have been possible without the much more deeply rooted community organizations, feminist organizers that had been doing work related to gender justice, racial justice, queer justice since the 1980s, if not before. But you know, really before, coming out of the peace movement, countering the dirty war. And the Las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, kind of, and, and, and as some of the most iconic women leaders in movements that have been protesting in, in a square in Buenos Aires every single Thursday since the 70s, these, these women set a, set a, um, a model yeah. and a system in place, you know, a, a, almost scaffolding kind of for the Ni Una Menos movement to really build on. And I think that that is what we're seeing is that social movement, social movement or social media is a powerful tool, but it's not an organizing apparatus in itself. It's actually not a structure. It's not, it's not very, it's not horizontally organized. We see limitations and movements that are sort of, that rely heavily on hashtag activism. You know, bring back our girls as, as kind of an example of this, that spreads like wildfire, that becomes, that goes viral, but doesn't necessarily fundamentally actually lead to social change. And when we do see social media seeing, use, you know, basically serving as a powerful tool for organizing and galvanizing people, it's because it sits on top of these really, really profoundly community-rooted organizations and, and legacies of, of, um, of, I think, building for progressive change. So I think, it's, I think it's a complicated answer. I'll just add one little other detail, which is that social media is also Ex uh, um, uh, has also created tremendous vulnerability for activists. We have a, uh, many countries around the globe have such sophisticated surveillance ca capacity that phones become portal into our very movements. Mm -hmm. And so I, 
work with a large number of activists now that don't even go on WhatsApp because mm -hmm. it's not secure enough, right? Mm -hmm. And it requires, we do in our training, every six months a security basically protocol on your social media, on your phone, on your technologies, because governments are oftentimes using your digital devices to create new forms of vulnerability, and these vulnerabilities are gendered. We see women in the home or in the, you know, in the store or wherever they are, oftentimes the, 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 the routines that women have sometimes become a source of vulnerability and phones can give some more access into what those routines are. Um, and so I think that they, they, they become, it becomes an important conversation to have about how they're advancing um, struggle or potentially weakening it in some ways. Yeah, thanks, Jane. From your research, can I ask uh, what was the main contribution in these movements, if they were involved and if they were not? If they were involved, how could have that made a difference? In each of these movements? Yeah. How, the, how, it, how it made a difference in individual women's lives or made a difference, like the movements made a difference? As a movement, if, were the men involved? And if oh, they were, men. Yeah, if they were not involved, were they involved? Would it have made a, uh, a difference? Oh, such a good question. Um, I think it goes back to our first keynote, and the actually uh, one of my one of my a legendary feminists from India, Ababaya, who was a participant in the first institute. She she said over and over again during our our week together, it's not about the sexual body, right? It's about whether they're feminists. <laughs> And I think that this, this, this is a reminder that, that it's not just about adding women in, it's not just about the kind of, again, the biological, it's about thinking through a feminist vision, a feminist lens that takes power seriously. And so men in all of these movements that I mentioned have played different roles, I mean, very different roles. In the Ni Una Menos movement in, in Argentina, for instance, much of, the, much of the organizing that came out for abortion rights was rooted in queer activism. Queer activism had an extremely strong kind of um, community of gay men that had been organizing for, for decades. And so the abortion movement in some ways built on some of that, that organizing in the LGBT community. Um, men were also in the streets. Men in, in Argentina, many young men, you'll see them wearing uh, a green bandana, Ola Verde, this sign of, of, repro the, of that they support reproductive choice, reproductive justice. And um, it's become, it's very much become a, a collaborative, I think, um, movement because in part the violence is seen as linked, right? Violence is seen as linked to the authoritarian regime that murdered tens of thousands of people during the dirty war that left a, a, a very, very difficult series of governments in place that has created a massive financial crisis, that has created a debt crisis. Debt crisis leads women to stay in abusive relationships. Abusive relationships lead to femicide, right? These are, these are the kind of connections between these legacies of violence that I think men and women in Argentina are certainly seeing. In the abortion rights campaign in, in Ireland, and, and um, certainly we, I could talk about all these different movements, they're all very, very different, and they're also not homogenous. These movements are very heterogeneous. They have different facets, different factions. They have anarcho-feminists right, right by liberal feminists kind of fighting for similar agendas. And, um, and I think it's important for the abortion rights campaign to say that certainly there, there have been many men kind of supporting these conversations, but also saying this is, you know, um, this is also a space where um, women and other, other, other gendered bodies that can bear children um, are, are needing to take center stage and be centered in the conversations because men are not bearing children. Um, so, great question, and I feel like I could just talk, I feel like there's, there's so, I'm, I, you know, I used to be, a, I used to be a Rwanda expert, that's what I thought I started my career doing, and, and then I stopped being able to do research in Rwanda, and ever since I've, I've started doing research in so many different places, I feel like I'm sort of all over the place now, and it's a, it's a gift, and it also means that I could answer this question for the next hour, <laughs> so I should probably stop, <laughs> in the interest of time. <laughs> One more 
What really Im impressed me is the, in these cases, is bringing together uh, people from across battle lines. You have the example, this, uh, I also refuse to demonstrate with the settler. Yeah. But, um, but th that's, that's key yeah. in all of them. My question is, how much of that lasts? For example, in, in, in uh, I know Northern Ireland better than I know the abortion campaign in Ireland, and they worked, the women certainly worked across lines. Um, so with the abortion, anti-abortion movement, how much of that remained after they won? Or any of the other examples, the taking the trash away, putting paintings up and so on, how much was created that made, managed to overcome the issues between many of these communities and they kept them working together afterwards. Oh, that's, yes. That, I, and Anat would say, the, the day after the strike, the solidarity disappeared, yeah. right? Um, she did say that. Yes. But she said it was a, but she said it was, the, it created a blueprint. And I think the creation of blueprints for how these types of, of, of communities might be built might be imagined, how collaboration might happen, how leadership that is less hierarchical and less um, replicative of forms of violence might actually work for a small goal, a single day, a single strike. If we have a blueprint, is it possible to grow that, to nourish that, to build that? And in all of these cases, I think that most, most of the case, I wouldn't speak for all of the activists by any means, but, but to my knowledge, I think most of them would say that um, once you've created personal connections and there's been a kindness at a human level across different divides and, across, and in recognition of the way in which all of us are oftentimes affected by the big systems of violence, patriarchy, militarism, capitalism, if you will, the way in which these big systems of violence disadvantage so many people, that there's kind of kernels to build on, to build from the future. And um, that's the optimistic read, which is my talk today. My talk tomorrow is the pessimistic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> thank you. Stay with me. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Berry. Please thank her for this beautiful presentation, and we would like to appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you would please uh, take a 10 minute, 10 minute break only, and we're gonna start on time and keep this thing on time, all right? And I think co tea and coffee are in the back. Okay. Okay. This is a great day for me. It's like getting outside of my room. 
I can't okay. do anything with that. <laughs> Perfect. So it's okay. uh, med professionals PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, uh, that, yep. There we go. It's gonna drag and drop the okay. right here. And then let me get your USB stick back because. I don't need to add to my collection. <laughs> <laughs> Which is growing. There we go. Perfect. So that's Thank that. you. Quick and easy. Uh, so Denise has slides, but she's going to switch her laptop because she has the right connection. Right. So, but I can pop up and do that in between, so you don't okay. have to worry about that. I'm nervous about the tech aspect. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Like, I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to see person. Yeah, this one is also a bit temperamental, but it's working now, so that's fine. So should I just, since she's first, I think, yeah, should I just go ahead and click it? Yeah. I can just this up now. No, that's, yeah. Yeah, perfect. And then I think I stole somebody's pen. How do you have a pen? Um, no, it's not mine. I have a habit of stealing pins, so I don't want to So do I, apparently. Hi. I'm Perla Guerrero. Perla, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Christine Risco. Hi. I'm not here. Just moderating. Yes. Mm -hmm. You're on campus, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm on campus, too. So I'm in American Studies. Oh, that's right. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Latina and Latino Studies. Mm -hmm. How long have you been on campus? Long time, <laughs> um, but like just tucked away in the psych department. I don't I really know anybody. Say, yeah, <laughs> this is really exciting. Like, oh my gosh, all these cool other men here. Like, yeah, I think that's the curse of being yeah. at a big campus. Yeah, it's like yeah, there's so many yeah people to meet and connections to make, but you kind of like it's almost like you know, right. You probably have yeah. to right just to manage your own. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I just have a question. Oh, hi. Sorry. Yes. yes, nice to meet you. I'm all set. Yeah. I already have <laughs> plenty of coffee. <laughs> so you, you go by Perla? Yes. Or? If you can roll your R and U all together, then absolutely. <laughs> Otherwise, it becomes a little, a little tragic. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, but campus is. I mean, I we're in Taos, so we share the building with English, mm -hmm. and there are still people there that. Like I just met somebody last year, and I was like, "Oh, are you new?" They're like, "I've been here 12 years." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, we just never met." Because I've been here like eight years now. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, I don't even know everybody in the psych department. It's huge. Oh, really? How many yeah. faculty? Oh, it's like 40 plus. Oh wow. So, wow. Yeah. And so, like this spring, I was on a committee. And I met. I was like, "Oh, hi." <laughs> the person who I knew I was. And I was like, "This is bizarre." So, yeah. Same discipline. And I was like, And then you traveled from St. Louis. Okay, how was that? I was fine. I came in yesterday. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing too terrible. No, I don't like to travel the same day that I have a presentation. It just makes me very anxious yes. that a delay will happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it's fine to leave on the day that I have a presentation, but right. I never come in. The day, the day of. Yeah. yeah. 
I learned my lesson, not for a presentation, but I think maybe for a conference. I flew in on the day the conference was supposed to start, and then there was a delay. And then I thought, you know, this conference is only like three days long, so I've missed now essentially a whole day. Right. I need to just yeah. yeah get there the night before. Yeah. And then I will often leave right after my panel. Yeah. Because, like, I just want to get home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go? Are we going to present in the order listed? Uh, yes. Okay. So, Adia yes. first, and then, uh, then Denise, and then. Okay. So, uh, Denise is here, or I have Yeah, I uh, met her during lunch. Oh, okay. So, she's here. Great. She's going to sit over there. Yeah, this should be us. Okay. But that is, yeah, you're kind of being presented after. Cool. I don't remember you. <laughs> I guess that's my one my one job. <laughs> well, I have to tell John that Ari is still here. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, he's still there. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't. Um, he's like not around as often. Uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah, he's definitely yeah. still a presence. Yeah, that's really great. I was telling her that um, my husband went to graduate school here, mm -hmm. and a yes. colleague in her department was his advisor. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, he's yeah. Still around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's he's been there a long time. Yeah, long. yeah. I think when so when John finished, it would have been 2005, and I think Ari already at that point had been here for <laughs> yeah, you know, a pretty. Wait, awesome. I might he he graduated with, uh, from from the psych department 2005. Yeah. So I started grad school uh -huh. in 2005. Oh okay. Psych. Oh, okay. Psych. Okay. Okay. I went to the program. Yeah, so he was coming out when you were. So I, yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. Oh, he, yeah. I guess it depends on when he might have. He graduated like in the summer. He might have not overlapped. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, or, yes. I think May would have been. May or May. Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah. 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 Almost. Yeah. I feel like I know the name though. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. In what context, but maybe it's just hearing of alumni. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know if they're supposed to have dinner here? Um, that is what we were told. Okay. <laughs> but it's not on the program, which I yeah. already noticed. So. And also because it says keynote, but then there's an hour break and then closing remarks. So I was like... What's happening? Yeah, oh, there's a break. We, we, were, the we were, yeah, we were given, yeah, okay. we, were, we were told that. Though. Okay. <laughs> we were told the dinner would be provided. Okay, good. Hi, good to see. Good, good to see you again. It's been so long. I know it's been forever. I don't care, whatever, whatever it's fine. I mean, it, yeah. you're already set up, right? Well, yeah, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll have them switch them. Yeah. yeah, we can yeah. switch them. It's not a problem. All right, anything else? Nope, that's it. Thank you. If I could just have some water. Oops, I forgot I about the water. water. Thank you so much. Do you have slides? Oh, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And I'll see yeah. you in, if you're around, I'll see you in I'm November gonna, also. When I'm I come not going to be entertaining. Santa Barbara. Oh. Yeah. Are you coming to Santa Barbara? Why are you coming to Santa Barbara? Oh, Kristen invited me to come oh, for the Mendoza. Oh, oh I've opened it just now. now. Thank you. Okay. I haven't. Okay. Hopefully, we'll see. Yeah, I haven't actually read his email. Oh, I'm saying hopefully. I'm not in the. What's the format in your. I just like in your. Just like in your presentation. So. I was supposed so to be into that, so I should have oh. abstained myself. Uh -huh. But now, I think okay. they're revoking the system. It's not like they're revoking it. It's just they want me to check my co-chair search committee. Oh. Yeah. Oh, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. Yeah. So we're in the middle of renegotiating. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Y
I'm surprised they even asked you. Okay, we are about to start. Please come back to your seats. We're about to begin our second panel on gender, race, and economics. And um, we have, as usual, uh, three panelist and a moderator, and I will introduce the moderator and have her introduce the rest of the panel. Our moderator is Christina Risco, Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychology at the University of Maryland. So she's one of what we call a TERP. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, University of Maryland mascot is a terrapin turtle, and so uh, we all call each other TERPs. Okay. Dr. Risco is currently, as I said, an assistant clinical professor of psychology. Uh, she jointly has an appointment with the first year innovation research experience program in the office of uh, the senior vice president and provost um, and the center for addictions, personality, and emotion research. And that's in the Department of Psychology. The program provides a multi-semester research and mentorship experience to first-year students through faculty-led research projects. Dr. Risco operates the Fire Stream in Addiction Science, which immerses students in a hands-on learning experience driven by the research agendas and grant commitments of uh, that organization's um, faculty. She received her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Maryland College Park, and she completed her undergraduate studies at the University of Florida, where she received a BS in psychology and a BA in sociology. So please welcome Dr. Risco. <laughs> Um, good afternoon. So I'm going to um, introduce the panelists. I'm going to do so briefly as the details of all their accomplishments uh, appear in the program. Um, and then after that, we'll have uh, some time for questions. So first is um, Dr. Adia Harvey Wingfield. Uh, she's a professor of sociology at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research examines how and why racial and gender inequality persist in professional occupations. She recently completed a term as president of Sociologists for Women in Society, a national organization that encourages feminist research and social change. Professor Wingfield is the author of several books, most recently, Flatlining, Race, Work, and Healthcare in the New Economy, and is the recipient of the 2018 Public Understanding of Sociology Award from the American Sociological Association. Her talk today is entitled, Professional Work in a Post-Racial Era, Black Women, Healthcare Workers in the New Economy. Um, next, we have Dr. Denise A. Segura, who's a professor of sociology and affiliated professor in the respective departments of Chicana O Studies and Feminist Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Her research and teaching center on Ch uh, Chicana, Chicana X feminisms, Chicana Mexicana employment, and Latina Latino education. Her most recent book, The Handbook of Chicana Chicano Studies, is an international collection of historical and emerging critical scholarship in this area. Uh, Professor Segura has received a number of awards for her research, teaching, and mentorship, including the 2019 Founders Award from the Section on Latina OX Sociology from the American Sociologi Sociological Association. And her talk today is entitled, Chicanas and Latinas in the Academic Borderlands, Resistance, Empowerment, and Agency. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Perla M. Guerrero, who's an associate professor of American Studies and U.S. Latina Latino Studies at the University of Maryland. Her research and teaching interests include relational comparative race and ethnicity, with a focus on Latinxes and Asian Americans, space and place, immigration, labor, U.S. history, and the U.S. South. 
She has received multiple awards, including a Ford Postdoctoral Fellowship and two from the Smithsonian Institution to be a postdoctoral fellow at the National Museum of American History. Her first book, Nuevo South, Latinas, Latinos, Asians, and Remaking of Place, examines how racial cleansing and sundown towns made Northwest Arkansas into a particular kind of place and analyzes the political and economic factors that are shifting social conditions and racial mores in the U.S. South. And her talk today is entitled Deportation and Gender, How U.S. Laws Shape Deportation Experiences in Mexico. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, the title of my presentation today, Black Prof excuse me, Professional Work in a Post-Racial Era, Black Healthcare Workers in the New Economy, is segmented from a longer talk that I'm going to try to pack into a very uh, short amount of time. And my editor would also kill me if I did not mention that it is abstracted from my book, Flatlining, Race, Work, and Healthcare in the New Economy, which actually is available uh, in the bookstore here, as far as I know. So in order to give a little context for this talk uh, and thinking about how work has changed, it's important to distinguish between what work used to be and what work looks like now in order to get an understanding of what black professional work in the healthcare industry looks like and why that's important. So when we think about what work used to be, uh, I think that often we romanticize and have this idealized vision of work in this post-war work, excuse me, this post-war era where work was uh, construed as something that was available pretty widely and something that was pretty generally a path to economic security. And in this era, most workers uh, who were able to work uh, comfortably had a lot of access to job security. Workers experienced very little turnover or transition and managed to stay with one company for the duration of their careers. Workers enjoyed competitive benefits, including very stable health care and retirement benefits. And they also worked in organizations with a robust middle management sector with a lot of uh, super supervisory layers between workers and management. Of course, it's important to point out that workers at this time also experienced a great deal of occupational segregation and the workers who had access to these, quote, good jobs were largely white, able-bodied men. And it's also important to point out that in this era of work, the public sector underlied and um, buttressed a lot of the avenues and access towards work that people had in terms of providing public support and public resources in the form of the GI Bill and other uh, avenues that offered stability, the training and uh, um, avenues to education that people needed in order to access jobs in this realm. So we have this picture of what work used to be that paints this picture of work being available of being stable, of being something that people could devote their careers to and work for one company for the duration of that career and feel pretty confident and stable in their economic security. This is a big difference from what work looks like today. When we think about what work looks like today, a lot of those uh, social and structural factors that used to underlie it and maintain its support and stability are largely eroded or shaken. We know, for example, that there is declining unionization and that far fewer workers belong to unions today than they did in the past. Workers experience much less job security uh, and are more likely to change jobs more frequently than they have been in previous eras. Uh, people who are in favor of these dynamics argue that this provides workers with more autonomy and more self-direction and the ability to move into and out of the workforce and into jobs that are supposed to be more available to them. Uh, organizations are also much flatter. That la layer of middle management has largely disappeared in many cases. Workers are a lot more responsible for their own benefits. Uh, as people in academia, I'm sure we all are familiar with the increasing expectations of contributions to IRAs and uh, healthcare, and that's from people who are often lucky enough to be able to have access to those benefits in the first place, which most workers don't. Uh, there's also more stated support for diversity. Organizations now will, in the co as, as a contrast to previous eras, talk more about the importance of wanting to have a more racially diverse workforce and saying that this is something that they support. But ultimately, the research shows that there's a frayed contract between organizations and employees. And the level of mutual respect and regard that many organizations and workers had for each other in the past has largely frayed, leading workers to experience much more economic and emotional uncertainty and insecurity, and putting workers in a place where they're often very um, uh, bereft or unsure about their work and the opportunities that it offers to provide economic stability. So in sociological and economic language, we think about this as being the new economy. And in this new economy, professional work is one of few routes to economic security. It benefits from technological advances and growth of the knowledge economy. And it's also the focus of diversity dialogue, although many sociologists and economists would argue that this is having minimal results in actually changing the numbers of underrepresented workers at the top levels of organization. So the central question that frames my book is wanting to understand what this new economy means for black professionals. If we know that economically speaking, we've shifted into 
into this new era where work is a lot more insecure and uncertain. Organizational supports have become a lot more frayed and a lot more restrained. But at the same time, many organizations and industries talk about the importance of wanting to have more racial diversity. Where might that leave black professional workers who are in these jobs where organizations are in this sort of um, contradictory space? There are a few existing theories that give rise to what we might expect to find from this work. Uh, my colleagues have shown that, uh, for example, in the public sector, as we see increasing privatization, black workers, black men in particular, are likely to experience a significant amount of downward mobility as private sector companies and organizations uh, either downsize or privatize by selling their uh, purposes to other private organizations. Uh, other colleagues have shown that organizations largely have failed at their attempts at increased diversity. And uh, Rosenfeld's work has shown that declining, uni declining unionization actually exacerbates racial wage inequality and makes these wage inequalities worse than they would be otherwise. But these questions, these studies still leave unanswered questions about how black professionals deal with work transformation itself. This research shows us that these structural issues are happening in a way that can leave black workers more uncertain, less likely to be members of unions that previously perhaps could have fought for more economic inequality, more economic equality, uh, and that these workers are in environments where diversity hasn't necessarily manifested in the way that would benefit uh, workers of color. But we don't know necessarily how workers on the ground who are in these environments are dealing with these sorts of changes, whether they perceive more unionization as the answer, whether they see that or whether they believe that uh, public sector work is no longer a viable route to economic security. And so these were questions that motivated uh, my work in the study. So the core questions of the book overall focus on what the new economy means for blacks doing professional work. As many sectors in the new economy become more privatized, stratified, and unequal, where and how do black professionals fall? What are their challenges? What are their opportunities? And who are the winners and losers? And I focus on healthcare because it represents a site where all of these structural and cultural changes writ large are really happening on a, an identifiable scale. The healthcare industry, as a consequence of the increasing privatization of the public sector, has turned into, I argue, a two tiered system where there is the private system of healthcare for well off, healthy, quote, responsible patients who can access private facilities, private insurance, and get the best care, versus a public system that involves minimally funded public sector care that's available to everyone else. The healthcare industry industry also has been changing at the same time that uh, U.S. racial demographics are shifting rapidly, leading us towards a country where there are increasing numbers of minority groups uh, and that the white majority is becoming smaller. And this change occurs also as routes to professional work has become less stable. So healthcare, again, exists as an industry where good jobs are represented in this industry, but the access to good jobs have become more and more tenuous and uncertain as economic and social shifts have, professed, have, have progressed. Excuse me. Uh, just quickly, I won't go through all these statistics um, independently, but these are just some data on black professionals in healthcare. You'll see that they are most underrepresented in doctors at 4% and are somewhat overrepresented when we move down to other sectors in the healthcare industry, particularly among workers who do technical work, although that work offers less stability, security, and prestige than workers at the top of the industry. So the questions that I want to focus on with my remaining time are, for this presentation, trying to think about how work transformation in the new economy affects black professionals. Again, if we know that the economic and social structures that we're experiencing as we move to this new economy are shifting dramatically in ways that are leaving workers more insecure, what does that mean for black professional workers who might have access to these good jobs at a time that they are changing? And I focus here on diversity ideology, which I argue is mainstream in medicine and nursing, to try to assess what impact this has on black professionals. Uh, in order to conduct this research, uh, the basis for this comes from intensive semi-structured interviews with 75 healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, physician assistants, and technicians, some survey data, and some field observations. And I found just briefly that diversity initiatives leave black professionals largely feeling apathetic, indifferent, or even annoyed. My respondents generally did not support these initiatives, not because they don't believe in diversity, but rather because diversity efforts don't reflect their racial work experiences. This varies significantly by occupational status, but it also varies in important ways by gender. So to briefly talk about uh, each of the occupational categories here, I found that in my study, black doctors talked about diversity work uh, largely taking the form of cultural competence trainings. And they viewed cultural competence trainings as unnecessary bureaucratic hurdles. They saw these as largely disconnected from the ways that they saw race affecting their work. So they didn't really evince a lot of support for diversity initiatives as they were put forth. Not because, again, these seemed to be things that weren't important or didn't matter, but largely because the diversity initiatives in the form of cultural competence 
didn't address the types of racial issues that black doctors experienced. And when I asked them what types of racial experiences they didn't experience that were left unacknowledged by cultural competence training, what they told me was that, generally speaking, they did not encounter overt everyday racial aggressions. Instead, they argued that race affected them through structural and cultural processes, and with race embedded in structural avenues, gender actually became a more overt form of racial bias that responded, excuse me, a more overt form of bias that, re, that women respondents felt that they had to deal with. So I'm gonna, again, speed through a couple of quick quotes uh, to talk a little bit about what this means in practice. Uh, here's a quote from Randy, an emergency medicine doctor, who, when I asked him what he thought about uh, diversity initiatives in his workplace, actually rolled his eyes at me and said, it's the right idea, but that stuff doesn't mean anything. Nobody takes it seriously. Obviously, I think more diversity is important. It's necessary. But the way they do it, the trainings and modules, it's just one more box to check. They just want quick fixes. Doing the hard work, really changing the profession to get more black and brown people in here, that's not sexy. So we can see from this example that doctors like Randy are pretty dismissive of the ways in which diversity initiatives seem to offer a rather superficial fix on the types of issues that are seen to be more structural. And when we think about what these structural issues look like, here's a quote from Allison and Geneticist who gave some examples, or gave one key example, of the ways in which she felt that racial issues for her were much more embedded in structural processes rather than overt interpersonal ones. When I asked Allison how she felt that race was having an impact on her work, she told me, it's impacted my work just because my interests are focused more so on health disparities, medically underserved populations, minorities, those who often do not know about genetic resources or genetic services that are available. And I find it difficult to identify mentors or people who are familiar with those populations populations, people who are passionate about educating those populations about genetic services or resources. So I've not really had much luck identifying people who are working with those populations who can help me better address some of the needs or some of the disparities that I see. And this is important in the context of this move to a new economy, where work is much more likely to center on relationships, connections, mentoring, sponsorship. If black doctors like Allison are in positions where they don't have access to the networks and the resources that those networks can provide, they are much less likely to see occupational mobility in the types of work that they're doing. Importantly, I argue that this has a gender dimension as well. For black doctors who are identifying these sorts of structural issues and ways that race has an impact on their work, the gendered ways that uh, medicine, or that uh, working as a physician is present, seem to become especially pronounced for black women doctors in particular. Here's a quote from Aisha, a neonatologist, and she talked to me a lot about how she felt that gender was a much more significant daily factor that she had to deal with in work than race was. And when I asked her why, she said, because I see my coworkers that are males and the race doesn't matter. If you're male, they will call you a doctor. If you're female, they will call you a nurse but it's regardless of your race. I see my white coworkers, even just because they're female, they still call them nurse. If they're male, they're a doctor. If they're female, they're a nurse. But the race doesn't really matter. It's the male versus female. That's more important than the race. So I think this is an interesting finding that underscores that for black women who are in these high status professions, we have to take into consideration how race and gender have interesting and important insights into the experiences that they have in these types of jobs. And this is not to suggest that race and gender are not operating in conjunction. I think that they are, but I think that they're operating at different levels. And that with race being much more structural, the gender dynamics that many black women encounter seem that much more visible and visceral and overt. And just quickly, it's not an overstatement to state that uh, of the black women doctors that I interviewed for this study, every single one had a story like this, of being assumed to be the nurse, even after, in some cases, preemptively identifying themselves as the doctor and trying to use the tools to identify that they were there in that capacity. So I think I'm close to running out of, out of time. Is that, am I wrong? Okay, excellent. So, I want to share a few of my findings from nurses to illustrate how they offer a really stark contrast and to think a little bit more about how the difference in uh, culturally masculinized and feminized occupations matters for uh, black doctors and nurses. So whereas doctors largely expressed this idea of feeling that their organizations where they worked uh, kind of had best intentions at heart but executed diversity initiatives poorly, nurses were significantly more skeptical and they were a lot more doubtful. And they argued that the institutions where they worked often claimed to be diverse places, but these claims were usually not reflected in nurses' interactions. Nurses routinely described explicitly racist exchanges with their white colleagues, but they also observed structural processes that disadvantaged black nurses. So they were a lot more mistrustful of diversity rhetoric due to the different racial realities of their work. The similarities here are that in both occupations, both doctors and nurses felt that there was a miscalculation in terms of diversity efforts were enacted. But whereas doctors were more likely to give the benefit of the doubt, nurses were a lot more likely to see the institutions where they worked as simply saying what they needed to say in order to prevent themselves from being sued or facing any sort of other kind of legal action. Here's a quote from Stephen, an orthopedic nurse, 
who told me, when you look at the settings, the more people say that they're diverse, the more that they are not diverse. <laughs> they're diverse on paper because you have to be. But if you're diverse on paper, you ought to be diverse in practice. One cannot go without the other. And when I say that, I say that to mean that when you're stating that you're a diverse program, your nursing staff should reflect that. I know one school where in the fall of 2011, they admitted 50 students into the nursing program and none of them were African American. So that was not very representative of what, representative of what their mission is. So again, we get a sense of the type of mistrust and doubt that many black nurses described in taking stock of their program's diversity uh, initiatives. There was a sense that organizations said what they needed to say like what Stephen describes because they feel that they have to on paper, but not a sense that this actually was followed up in terms of action. So I'm going to give a quote uh, next that illustrates some of the very real differences between what uh, doctors experienced and what nurses talked about. Here's a quote from Mindy, who's a mother baby nurse. And this gets to some of why nurses were so mistrustful of the institutions where they were employed. Mindy told me, I was just kind of noticing that there was this demeanor of how dare you be in intensive care, because basically because of your race. It never starts out as things that they say right out. It's the way that they look at you that makes you notice these subtle differences. But long story short, someone actually said to me, we were talking about after work, getting together, hanging out, and said, oh, you can come to my house, but you'd have to be carrying a pail and wearing a rag on your head to come to my home. This is a really stark difference from what most of the black doctors told me. It's a lot more overtly racialized, it's a lot more derogatory, but this also gives some insights into, again, why nurses were so mistrustful of the environments that they, count, that they encountered. Whereas doctors' perspectives were much more so that organizations were trying, but maybe not necessarily quite getting it right, nurses like Mindy, who had experiences like these routinely, this was only one of several encounters that she described to me. Nurses like Mindy, who have these types of regular encounters at their workplace, have a perspective that if workplaces were actually genuinely serious about creating more racial diversity, Incidents like these would not be allowed to occur with impunity on a regular basis. So I illustrate these phenomena differently in terms of, uh, with doctors I refer to this as the that one time phenomenon, and that doctors would say, well, there was that one time where this thing happened, I didn't really like it, I didn't quite know how to respond to it, someone said something that was inappropriate, but that was one time the issues that happened for me are much more structural and cultural in terms of lack of access to mentors, general preoccupations about, uh, or assumptions about black inferiority. For nurses, the response was more, how much time do we have for this interview? Because yesterday someone said something, and then a week ago there was this other issue with my supervisor, and then a month before that there were all these other issues that happened on a regular basis. So again, it's important here, I think, to highlight the ways in which these have issues and consequences for black healthcare workers at large in the new economy, but also the gender dynamics of these issues and the ways in which they reflect the gendered and cultural compositions of these types of workforces. I think that for medicine as a culturally masculinized occupation, uh, the issues that arise from that mean that for many black women who are in this profession, they're experiencing being in the racial minority and in the gender minority simultaneously. And while that means that the racial issues that they encounter may be much more structurally present, it doesn't mean that that disappears or absence the types of overt gender issues that they experience that I described. Whereas for nurses like Mindy, uh, who shares, who has the quote that I've shared here, the nurses who were people like Mindy or uh, men nurses like Stephen described, again, very consistently overtly racialized encounters such as these. So I think that with nursing being a more culturally feminized profession and subject to some other structural changes that are happening in terms of advancement in professionalism and attempts to increase the educational standards in the profession, what that means is that black nurses are dealing with racial patterns and challenges that seem a lot more overt and upfront and visible in ways that actually create a level of gendered solidarity, uh, excuse me, a level of interracial gendered solidarity between black men and black women who are employed in the profession. I'm gonna unfortunately skip technicians, but I can come back to it in the Q&A if anyone's interested. But I'm going to conclude uh, just with a couple of brief points. Um, I've argued here that mainstream diversity talk is one example of work transformation in the new economy, and that organizations today and industries at large are a lot more likely in the present era than in the past to talk about the importance of having more racial diversity and wanting to actually achieve that as a goal. But what diversity actually means depends a lot on occupational status. How black doctors experience diversity is not necessarily consistent with how nurses experience it, and even that's very different from how technicians encounter it. This work ultimately shows that the diversity initiatives that are present in many spaces don't address the racial realities that black professionals face in the new economy, or that these racial realities are driven by both structural and interpersonal factors, and that vary by occupation and have gendered dimensions. Ultimately, this aspect of work transformation is leaving black professionals disillusioned and disengaged. But because I like to try to end presentations on a high note whenever possible and not leave people depressed and bummed out, 
I do think there actually is some hope from this presentation. I think that there are some positive insights that we can take away. And I think the biggest one is that for organizations that are really serious about creating more racial, and diverse, racial diversity and more gender diversity, this research, I think, offers a map to the types of challenges that black workers are experiencing. And I think that for organizations like those in the healthcare industry or those outside of it who do want to focus on creating more diversity, there are now pathways to thinking and talking more about what types of issues their workers may be facing and putting into place initiatives that deal with these more directly rather than more obliquely. Thank you. Guess where I'm from? That's me too. Um, <laughs> good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank every, uh, thank the organizers of this wonderful conference for um, inviting me. Um, it's. I hope to be able. Um, Adia is my role model. I doubt very much I will be as um, timely as her because I talk too much. And um, but anyway, I do have some pictures here, and I wanted. My, my, the title of my talk is Chicanas and Latinas in the Academic Borderlands, Resistance, Empowerment, and Agency. And I know this it looks self-serving, but it really isn't. It's just that I, there was a point to this picture. And the picture you know, depicts, of course, me in the middle, but the other two people were, were two of my students. They were, they were graduating at the same time with their PhD. And they have become scholar activists in their own domain. The one. Um, uh, Silvana Falcón, who is on that side, was also um, in feminist studies as well as um, sociology, and she's now a tenured professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and she's done a lot of work on global feminisms. Okay, and uh, this hit one here to closest to me is Lorena Garcia. She's at the University of Illinois at Chicago, again in sociology and Latino studies, and she wrote a. Uh, pretty much path-breaking book on Latina uh, adolescent sexual agency. So, and I could talk more about her work, but I won't because she can invite her. And you should, because she's a wonderful speaker. Um, but the idea being that these are scholar activists. Silvana was somebody who also did a radio program at UC Santa Cruz. She continues to do that um, ongoing to reach the community. And Lorena works with the local community agencies around issues about reproductive health among Latinx communities. So this, I, just, I just thought it would it was an exam example of the kind of ways in which scholar activism is both, you know, kind of rooted within our academic work as well as within our community work. And since I got to mentor them both, I got to do the academic work. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, so activism, let me see. Activism is the courage to act consciously on our ideas, to exert power and resistance to ideological pressure, to risk leaving home. Empowerment comes from ideas. A revolution is fought with concepts, not guns, and is fueled with vision. By focusing on what we want to happen, we change the present. The healing images and narratives we imagine will eventually materialize. And this is a quote from Gloria Anzaldúa, who is an important Latinx theorist. 
Today, children, cisgender women and men, queer folks, trans individuals, migrants and Chicanas, Chicanos and Chicanex, people of Mexican descent, and Latinas, Latinos, and Latinx who trace their origins from Latin American countries are all under attack. To date, thousands of Latinx migrants have been imprisoned along the US-Mexico border, and children are being torn from the arms of their parents and loved ones to be locked up where they are not cared for, fed properly, where cope, soap is not categorized as essential, and diapers a luxury by their jailers. Back-to-back -back tragedies in Gilroy, California, El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio, are sites of the murder of innocents with Mexicans specifically targeted in Texas. The proportion of people of color in prison continues to rise far above the growth of their representation in colleges and universities. As I consider these violent deployments of power, I ask myself, has social justice improved the quality of life for communities of color and leveled the chasm, chasm, chasm between opportunity and exclusion since the civil rights and feminist movements of the 1960s? Activism from these years resulted in a wide range of civil rights legislation to prohibit unequal access to the right to vote, a high quality education, employment, fair housing, and health care. I use the term prohibit deliberately because legislation and policy rarely codified equality of outcomes, but rather focused on neoliberal notions of promoting equal access, which is not exactly the same thing. Fast forward from the 1960s to the present, because I don't have all day. The, the past few years have seen the rise of important social movements. Let's see, if this, they're here, there they are, there's some of them. Um, the sanctuary movement, the transnational new and a must, not one more, movement against feminist, feminicide, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, among many others. Here's some others that are named here. In solidarity with local communities, a number of scholar activists are using their respective skill sets to affirm the voices of the oppressed and politicized others by documenting what Latina critical race theorist Terrioso calls community cultural wealth in what I call the academic borderlands. Challenging what is considered legitimate and valuable research curriculum and service in the academy motivates many Latinx scholar activists. Indeed, scholar activism is constantly developing with respect to Chicanos and Latinos. One example is the increasing use of Chicanex and Latinx to signal inclusion of gender nonconforming subjects. Scholar activism takes many forms and is not always well recognized or considered legitimate by conventional academics, as researched by people like Dolores Delgado Bernal and her co-authors, Ruth Sambran, who's on this campus, and her co-authors, and other interdisciplinary scholars have found. Part of the challenge for legitimacy lies in the activist origins of the scholars and their commitment to social justice. How many of you have ever been asked of your work, is this research or is this advocacy? Doing both is not easy, but motivates many of us here. Today I discuss how scholar activists, and particularly Chicanx and Latinx faculty, are navigating the academic to participate in the empowerment of our communities. As someone who grew up during the tumultuous 1960s and 1970s, my presentation blends, or like my son says, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, my presentation blends an autoethnographic methodology within a borderlands intersectionalities framework that critiques both key canonical explanations for social inequality and taps the insights of Chicanx and Latinx feminisms to distinguish alternative sites for empowerment that emphasize the assets of their communities. This talk is a first step in a larger study I intend to embark upon. This is my like trial, okay? I embark upon interrogating what it means to be a Latinx scholar activist. I conclude with some thoughts on the increasing significance of borderlands intersectionalities to provide new insight on women's resistance, agency, and empowerment. I first consider Chicanx and Latinx, Chicana and Chicanx scholar activism. 50 years ago, I don't know how many of you know this, 50 years ago, community activists and scholar activists, including students, university staff, and faculty, okay, gathered in Santa Barbara, California to craft El Plan de Santa Barbara. El Plan is a blueprint for institutional change to diversify higher education that clarifies processes of educational exclusion of people of color in the United States. How many of you have heard of El Plan? Okay, 
Two of us, yay, okay. Um, this is why I'm talking about it, okay? Um, and it demands programs to prepare and admit students from historically underrepresented groups and the hiring of staff and faculty from these groups to research and teach about the needs of Chicano and other oppressed communities. As scholar activists, a term used then and now by many Chicano, Chicano, and Chicanex and Latina, Latino, and Latinx university staff, faculty, and students, they, we, committed ourselves to the hard work of bringing social justice to our communities, including changing the range of legitimate knowledge claims within the university, holding the university, holding the academy accountable to include historically disenfranchised subjects was and has been paramount. While the intent of the pl El Plan was social justice, the voices of women were notably few. Surprise, surprise. And the agenda largely driven by patriarchal power dynamics. As Chicano feminist historian Cynthia Orozco ironically notes, El Plan was a manifesto. <laughs> Creating Chicana studies or Chicanex studies was not part of the agenda during these turbulent times. In the face of considerable cultural policing that privileged race and class agendas in the Chicano movement and the priority given to gender equality by second wave feminisms, Chicano feminisms did develop, focusing on challenging the walls of silence that shrouded Mexican origin women voices to reclaim their unique funds of knowledge within existing organizational spaces, as well as create alternative paths towards social and sexual agencies. At the University of California, Santa Cruz, Okay, I know there's other, there's other slugs out there, which I attended in 1972, long before you did. There were no tenure track Chicano faculty and only three Chicano male faculty. My major department sociology had only two faculty of color, both African American men. When I began my senior year, one of these faculty, Provost Herman Blake, does anybody here know Herman? Or, okay, well, he was cool called me to his office along with another Chicana undergraduate and convinced us to apply for graduate school as a political obligation to la lucha or the struggle for self-determination and empowerment for our communities. Professor Blake had been involved in the black power movement <clears throat> excuse me, and sponsored Black Panther Huey Newton to attend UC Santa Cruz. Dr. Blake told us he believed we had what it took to enter PhD granting institutions and secure faculty positions. Schooled within the Chicano movement, we questioned why he had singled us out. We were very suspicious about that, okay? We reminded him that we had worked hard to earn teaching credentials while completing our respective majors to enable us to serve our community. Dr. Blake argued that the academy needed more scholar activists of color, and if we secured a PhD, we could serve our community in multiple ways, including contributing new knowledge on our communities, as well as encourage and support the other students of color. Although as working class first generation students of color, we did not know what graduate student involved, we agreed to apply. That's because we didn't know, okay? There's something about ignorance, okay. I entered the sociology PhD program at UC Berkeley, and my friend entered the PhD program at Stanford. The challenges were beyond what we could have imagined, but I was fortunate to have a strong Chicana and Chicano support group and was able to work as a part-time teacher in the high school bilingual program, which kept me connected to the community I loved and nurtured my commitment to scholar activism. The challenges I and other Chicanas faced in graduate school to work with our communities and to do research on the understudied area of Chicanas and Latinas required us, I could name everyone if you want, but I won't, to navigate what I call, drawing on Gloria and Zaldúa, the academic borderlands. Borderlands is a concept whose multifaceted meanings and significance was beautifully theorized by Anne Zaldúa in the now classic Borderlands La Frontera, it challenges the heteronormative frame in research on communities of color, emphasizes the importance of Chicanas' diverse identities, their creative mestiza consciousness, and has inspired queer theory to reach across many disciplines, including sociology. The borderlands have spatial, social, and spiritual features. And Zaldua states, okay, what you said, that borders are set up to define, there it is, the spaces that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. Within these spaces, marginalized others voice their identities and resistance. All of these social, political, spiritual, and emotional transitions transcend geopolitical space. So it's not about 
territory. It's deterritorializing. Okay? This theoretical perspective joins intersectionalities research that problematizes the ways in which power is wielded and contested by dominant and subordinate classes, races, sex genders, structurally and in social action. A borderlands intersectionalities perspective considers structural, spiritual, and interactional forces that frame social life and pose potent barriers to social justice and well-being, but emphasize power shifts where new hybridized identities emerge. Those are some of the books. That's Borderlands Consciousness. According to this perspective, identities shift and are negotiated in response to forces far above and below and therefore are never fixed or bounded. In graduate school, navigating spaces where the curriculum did not include the experiences of community of color were often dismissed by faculty, and I'm sure some of you have experienced this, with the words, I'm not an expert on that, but if you wish to do that kind of research, you can. Fortunately, the Berkeley Borderlands included feminist scholar Arlie Hochschild, African-American scholar activist Troy Duster, radical race theorist Robert Blauner, and Chicano historical sociologist Tomas Amaguer. I mention them because they were important role models to many graduate students of color, but they also let us know that we would always be expected to do more as faculty, as our research would be heavily scrutinized for political bias, our teaching evaluated for inadequate breadth and rigor, and our service disparaged, if not dismissed. Several first and generations, several first and second generation of scholar activists of color within the academy, including Shiri Moraga, Patricia Rodondo, Yolanda Flores Neiman, have written autobiographical accounts about the complexity of navigating a system designed for white men. In their 1998 study of the academic environment for graduate students of color, Eric Margolis and Mary Romero, who just is currently the president of the American Sociological Association, wrote, quote, the department is very male, very white, very old, and very conservative. In interviews with Chicano faculty I conducted with Beatriz Pesquera in 1998, we discussed the challenges they experienced, including navigating the professoriate, professoriate from access to tenure track positions to establishing legitimacy to engaging in research on their communities. Many consider themselves scholar activists. And see, this is the study I want to do because I want to find out what people really mean by scholar activism because there's many different possibilities. And so that's a scholar that that's the study that will be, but I'm reporting on what is right now, okay? Um, across disciplinary boundaries, Chicanx and Latinx scholars and activists develop new paradigms. This is the main work that they see themselves doing that both critique tired tropes of cultural deficiency and create new knowledge claims expanding the range of feminist theories and epistemological innovation. Currently, less than 2% of full-time faculty members are Latinas. It's 1.87% to be precise. In 1999, less than 1% were Latinas. When I joined the sociology faculty at UC Santa Barbara in 1987, I was the only Chicana or woman of color faculty member. Today, there is one other Latina. Woohoo! So now there are two of us out of the 30 tenure track faculty in sociology. Um, there is men, though, so let's not get too overexcited. There is a woeful underrepresentation, given that Latinx subjects are 17% of the, of the nation's population, and in California, comprise over half of all public school students. Despite the relatively low number of Chicanos and Latinos faculty, their intellectual policy and political impact cannot be underestimated. And how, do I have a lot of time? How much time do I have left? Few is not enough. Um, okay, uh, so we can go on in terms of all the theoretical innovations, but what I really want to get to here is um, kind of the, how there's kind of this been this alternative um, kind of theoretical presentations of our culture. So, for example, Dolores Bernal, uh, Delgado Bernal, has, has presented something called Pedagogies of the Home. And this is part of what Terry Yosa calls um, community cultural wealth, given within this kind of feminist, um, critical race theory, where you look at home not just as this place that is a barrier, but it is as a potential place of what um, some anthropologists have called funds of knowledge. And it presents, especially, it's a really critical to school districts in particular who can't get past the fact that why aren't, you know, 
we need the, why aren't, why aren't parents, why aren't the Latino parents helping their kids read? And I'm like, don't get yourself worked up about this because first of all, I, a Chicana, PhD, hello, one of the top educated people in, in the Latino community, right? When my kid took advanced placement physics, and I would say, have you done your homework? He said, oh yeah, here it is. And I'm looking like, okay, it looks good. For all I know, that could have been done 20 years ago. But think about if you are an immigrant parent, 40% of every Latino parent in the nation is from a, 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 a from a Latin American country, right? So they, they feel their obligation is to get the kid to school, clean, fed, whatever, and they walk the kids to school. There's lines. In Santa Barbara, we can see lines of parents taking their kids to school, walking them to school, okay? And now it's up to the professionals. So yeah, kids will say, oh yeah, I did my homework, okay? So it's like, but how can they monitor it if I can't even monitor my kids' AP physics, okay? I couldn't monitor half of the stuff that they do, okay? But I, get, I got them to school. So I said, it's not about that. Pedagogies of the home. We teach them what we teach them within the home. And we build on this, and schools need to understand to build on it. Hence, what I did, I'm skipping now, okay, as one form of scholar activism is to build on the voices of our community, on pedagogies of the home. And in this case, I was fortunate enough to kill myself and create, get a lot of money from the Kellogg Foundation to do what's called the Enlace Program, which had as its goal to develop partnerships with community agencies and with um, several universities and, co and community colleges to strengthen the academic pipeline. I shouldn't even say strengthen, to build an academic pipeline and to strengthen it. And um, this happened, I got the funding in 1999 with two collaborators in the Graduate School of Education, and we, were, uh, we really built on the, on, the, on the concept of assets. We met, met with community members like, what is it that you want? What is it that you see as problematic? What would you like to see us doing? We went to rural communities, we went to you know, the city communities. I remember when the Kellogg um, program office came, because they didn't believe that Santa Barbara, like, come on, you guys are rich, you don't need money. Like, come on, come to our rural outposts out in the middle of nowhere, seriously, okay? And when the car broke down out there in one of our rural outposts, and it took hours for people, this, this, the, the, the foundation person said, well, just call a cab. We're all like cracking up like a cab. Got to be joking, okay? There's no cab for hours away, you know? And even the, the, the phone service was iffy. So it took a while. And um, so then they said, oh, you really are, there really is, a problem. I'm like, yeah, there really is. And I said, the, the, the best high school in Santa Barbara, okay, um, had 100 graduating students, all of which were going to college. Of those 100, three were going, were Latinos going to college. One was my son, one was the son of another professor, and one was just regular, okay? <laughs> and I say, you know, that doesn't count. So therefore, we said yes. So even in the most affluent, there's something going on. And so this program sort of built on the pedagogies of the home model, built on community cultural wealth, and engaged in kind of a feminist exercise of really prioritizing talking to women and mothers in particular. And so, and then we um, had a lot of undergraduates who we had as mentors who were from the same backgrounds or similar backgrounds, first generation college students, most of them. We had, uh, I, we had the good fortune to supervise 95 of them in the five years of the program. Every single one graduated and all, uh, about one third um, went on for their uh, teaching credentials and another third went on to graduate school and I have several who have gotten their PhDs and are doing their own programs now. So. This is to show that if you are, to me, if you build kind of from the voices of the community, pay attention to that and build into that, this is a one example of, I think, scholar activism. But it's not the only one. Um, I talked a lot about the, I didn't talk a lot, I mentioned the horrors going on along the border. Well, it's true that there's, you know, let me, let me get into this. Um, let me tell you how many there are. 
Okay, somewhere in here. I got myself all worked up on the other one. Okay, um, along the US-Mexico border, community and scholar activism abounds. Um, for example, Latinx community activists, artivistas, which are artists that are visualizing social justice. So there's a lot of scholarship and journalists, they're documenting the problems along the border. They're documenting what's happening with the children, with the families. But there's also people envisioning alternatives, you know, because it's, there's a lot of wounding going on here. But, but part of what Anseldo talks about is this kind of importance of healing. Okay, we have to heal our spirit. All right, and so what some of the artivists, the artivistas, are doing is trying to he, to to speak to that uh, that priority to heal our spirits, and the way you can heal there's many ways to heal the spirit, but one is through art, through play, right? How do we we need to remember these things? And these are children, many of them, they draw, they play, and one artivista. Um, collaborative in uh, Northern California came up with what they call the pink seesaws. I'm really hoping this is going to come out because this is the only reason I have a PowerPoint. Okay? Please. Is it going to do it? Okay. These this is a specific installation designed by architects and artists in, uh, in, some of the, in some of the universities, but also using architectural firms. And what they've done is that they're, this is their concurrent protest against what's happening at the border, but also a vision of how we should be bringing people together, how we bring children together to play. So what they did is they installed these pink seesaws across the rails of the border, and they're doing seesaws, and they're playing across with friends across the border. And so I, I saw that, and to me, that was very inspirational, you know? And it was like, because we're always, like you're talking about, we're always like, all depressed all the time about all the oppression, but in the midst of oppression, in the midst of these family separations, we're trying to heal, not we, me, but other people have this amazing vision and insight to bring play, to try to bring healing to some of the cleavages that are happening along the border. Okay, let me close this. Um, am I done? Yeah, okay. Um, so I have more, I have a lot of examples here about the way, the role of art and the role of to, to heal the spirit but to articulate our potential for social justice. Because social justice, uh, you know, it's important, yes, educational equity, bring in the voices of the community, but we also have to heal the spirit. We also have to remember play. We also have to remember the dynamics we once learned and knew and felt in our heart. And these are the things we need to remember and somehow bring to our scholarship, to our activism. And I think this is an alternative vision. That's why I'm saying there's many types of scholar activism. And I'm really excited to think that I'm gonna be doing a study on this and talking to all kinds of people about this because I know I'm gonna get more and more examples to bring to you next time. So I hope that if I've done anything today, it's to show that um, scholar activism is a highly contested field within the academy, but it's something that has broader range than we know and more potential than perhaps we can imagine today, but that people are imagining throughout, throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I'm, uh, I do not have slides, unfortunately, so hopefully my narrative and storytelling will keep you engaged for, for a little bit until our next break. So I look forward to sharing my work. This is part of a second project, a second book, 
um, which is about returnees and deportees in the city state of Mexico City and the states of Puebla and Guanajuato. I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about how I came to the project before moving on to talk about some of the gender dynamics of deportation. My second book is about Los Olvidados, The Forgotten Ones, a description of deportees and returnees that was articulated by Ana Laura Lopez, co-founder of the collective Deportados Unidos en la Lucha, Deportees United in the Struggle. Los Olvidados are, the forgotten, are forgotten by two nation states, the United States and Mexico. One, because it's supposedly not their country. The other, because it supposedly is. People encounter a US government that pretends they no longer exist in any capacity, as partners, parents, caretakers, or people living separation, even as they fight to remain active and involved in the lives of their families who remain in the States. And a Mexican government who believes that because they are citizens of said country, they do not encounter obstacles to getting identification cards or copies of birth certificates, something that becomes a Sisyphean task if anything is incorrect or incomplete. And without the proper papers, and here there are resonances to the importance of papers for undocumented people here in the United States. Without the proper papers, they cannot rent housing, they cannot rent housing, get a job, get health care, or get an education in Mexico. I moved to Mexico for six months in 2018 during my sabbatical, and then I returned again this summer. And after my six months in the field, I changed my original research question, which was, how do deportees and returnees remake their lives after repatriation? I did so because I realized deportees and returnees are doing it. They're remaking their lives and they don't need me asking that question. They do it, they live it, they fight for change. At the same time, I was struck by the number of US Southerners amongst deportees and returnees, people who grew up in South Carolina, Maryland, Florida, Texas, and Georgia. I was also struck by the numbers of so-called so homies and cholos, people who have ties or are assumed to have ties to gangs who are also part of the community. The diversity of returnees and deportees life experiences is vast, from ideal students to young people who got into trouble to people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s that lived as laborers in the United States and don't have the English language proficiency that would help them get better paying jobs. All of this led me to reformula reformulate my question to how is US-based inequality, criminalization, and stigma reproduced in, through, and after deportation and return migration? Inequality is key and speaks to issues of state and federal law that in turn range from what is a crime to is local law enforcement actively cooperating with ICE, immigration and customs enforcement? but it also addresses other arenas like whether a place has immigrant rights organizations and educators and religious leaders that are well informed about options, paths, possibilities, and possibilities open to undocumented immigrants. My project differs from much of the research that currently exists in two important ways. First, it considers, it considers deportation, self-removal, or, or forced return, and return migration simultaneously. Second, it centers how legal categorizations enacted in the United States remain relevant in Mexico as deportees and returnees remake their lives. I posit that we cannot understand deportation and return migration independently from one another, nor as homogenous processes. Moreover, some of the fault lines that existed in the United States, such as who is a good immigrant and a bad immigrant, are often reproduced in Mexico, while national policies in both countries help to define the kinds of success people accomplish upon their return. In Mexico, much like in the US, the media, state, and federal offices are largely focused on young people, the success stories, those that follow the archetype of the dreamer, someone who had promised in the United States and can now fulfill that promise in Mexico. The successes of these young people obfuscate some of the scaffolding that exists that allow them to reach their accomplishments, mainly remittances. Many of the students were able to benefit from the remittances their parents or family members who remained in the States were able to send them were able to send them. There's much less sustained attention toward deportees who are janitors or cooks in the US, folks who never learned English well and whose limited English does not help them obtain better paying jobs in Mexico. This generational divide is particularly salient because ageism is rampant and standard practice in Mexico. Jobs from busboys to dentists require the applicant to be 35 years or younger. So deportation for someone who is 40, 50, 60 looks very different than someone who's 25. 
Most of the literature about Mexican deportees has focused on the U.S.-Mexico border region since the United States frequently deports people into northern Mexico, but also because some deportees attempt to remain ge geographically close to the Mexican-U.S. border in the hopes of being able to see their families. One of the common threads in the literature is its gender dynamic. Men are more likely to be deported than women, and my qualitative research bears this out. Um, this is usually connected to police policies, officially and unofficially, like stop and frisk and racial profiling that particularly target men of color. Uh, undocumented black immigrants are a relatively small number of undocumented immigrants in the United States, but they are disproportionately deported to their countries of origin. There are also some generational divides. Men and women who are deported tend to be older than returnees who tend to be in their late teens and 20s. Deportees often have spouses and children in the States, people that depend on them for their economic and emotional well-being, versus returnees who have parents, siblings, or other family in the States, but for whom they are not responsible. The separation is hard on everyone, but the pressures exerted on individuals differ along these fault lines. My research is in line with scholars such as Nicholas Genova, who have started theorizing the deportability continuum, an intersectional nexus where an increased or decreased likelihood of deportation is based on a variety of risk factors, such as enforcement policies, racial profiling, and geographic location. The deportability continuum also names how deportability is meant to affect not just people with undocumented status, but also parents, spouses, and children with connections to an undocumented person. Moreover, the punishment or exile, as people often refer to the removal, um, the punishment or exile of a person depends on a variety of factors, whether they were undocumented in the United States longer than one year, whether they committed a quote unquote crime, whether that crime was, seri was a serious offense at that time or is now considered a serious offense and cause for removal. Immigration law then dictates whether the banishment is for 10 years, 20 years, or if they have a lifetime ban. While it is possible to appeal the first two, the appeals are often unsuccessful. The latter cannot be appealed. So anyone who is deported with a lifetime ban cannot re-enter the United States under any circumstance. On Friday, July 12th, um, 2019, Diego, Maggie, Maddie, others, and I attended the Lights for Liberty, a vigil to end human detention camps organized by Democrats abroad outside of the United States Embassy in Mexico City. At the vigil, Maggie and others spoke about what being a returnee or a deportee is like, and how terrible it is to know what people in cages experience since so many deportees had been detained themselves. They spoke with passion and conviction to the group of people there and to the media. I stood there bearing witness once again to, the experience, to their experiences and their histories, and though I was only six feet, six feet from where they stood, it felt like a chasm. My time in Mexico is full of dichotomies, living in a hipster and gentrified neighborhood, but working in and talking to folks with working poor and working class, um, in working class areas, talking about mobility, but being the one with the most mobility given my US citizenship and financial resources, and yet feeling very connected to folks because of our certain shared immigrant histories and code switching. And yet knowing my time there comes to an end when for them, there is no end in sight. Diego and Maggie lived in Dalton, Georgia, though they didn't know each other there. In 2016, Diego was taking his five-year-old son to breakfast when he passed a driver's license checkpoint, just one month after the local sheriff's office signed a contract with ISIS 287G program. Part of the Legal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, 287G authorizes the Department of Homeland Security to enter into agreements with local law enforcement agencies so they can enforce immigration laws. Diego didn't have a driver's license, which was the reason they detained him in the first place. And when they ran his prints, his case was flagged because of a conviction from 2003, something for which he had served probation that had not been cause for concern in 2003, but was now grounds for removal. His life changed in that instance. He went from enjoying father-son time to being deported swiftly with a 20-year bar. He has been providing as best he can for his son and a stepdaughter well in, well in Mexico. Diego, for a time, was part of Deportados Unidos en la Lucha and currently has a screen printing business called Fuck La Migra, or Fuck Immigration, 
where he sells t-shirts, baseball hats, and canvas bags with that sentiment, as well as others like No Kids in Cages and his more idealistic United We Stand, Divided We Fall, which was actually the first t-shirt he printed. And for some reason, it didn't take off. For some reason, Fuck La Migra is what sells, um, <laughs> what sells uh, very rapidly. You can find him online with, with that handle, Fuck La Migra, on Instagram or Facebook. And he's trying to figure out how he can sell his t-shirts in the States, not just in Mexico. Maggie was raised in the United States since the age of two and had never been to Mexico, but made the difficult decision to quote unquote return by herself in 2008. She left Georgia a few weeks after her high school graduation because she wanted to go to college. But as an undocumented American, she thought that was an impossibility. She got to Mexico only to realize that her educational goals had another set of barriers in her native country, school transcripts. When Maggie arrived, school officials, had government, school officials and government offices wanted certified original transcripts with formal translations, which can be, depending on where your school district was in the States, can be either kind of easy or very difficult to get. But in addition to that, her problem really started when she could not obtain credit for courses like social studies, since there's nothing comparable in Mexican high school curriculum. After five years of battling the system, she was finally able to get the transcripts officially translated with the proper courses and enrolled in a private university. But then the school filed for bankruptcy in the middle of a semester. This is just one of the reasons why Maggie went on to co-found ODA, Otros Dreams en Acción, Other Dreams in Action, um, a name that is purposefully in Spanglish, right? Otros names en acción. Um, in Mexico City, because she knew there were other deportees and returnees who were navigating circumstances like hers, or radically different than hers, but who needed aid and support in their endeavors. Though Maggie had good relationships with some of her teachers and community members, nobody told her that she should not leave the United States because returning would be nearly impossible or that if she planned on studying in Mexico, she should enroll while still in the United States because for some reason it's easier to do it that way. And perhaps most importantly, nobody told her that she should apply to private universities who could offer her scholarships regardless of her immigration status. Maggie was part of the migration of Latinxes to the US South in the 1990s, and as such, she lived in a community that did not have many, if any, immigrant rights organizations who could inform the public on legality issues or help guide her where education was concerned. Within my framework, this is also part of US-based inequalities because she lived in a southern state at a moment when her teachers, counselors, and religious figures did not have the necessary information to help guide her. Inequality is not just about financial resources. It is also about networks that sustain communities in a myriad of ways. Unlike Maggie, Ana Laura, and Mari were not raised in the US. Instead, they migrated in their early 20s, made lives for themselves in Illinois and Colorado, respectively, and then were deported and forced to leave their children behind. Ana Laura left two teenage boys in Chicago, one born in Mexico and now a DACA recipient, the other a US citizen, and her common-law husband. In 2000, her mother was sick, and despite being pregnant, Ana Laura decided to go see her dying mother. The plan was for her to return after two weeks, but the health crisis worsened, so she stayed by her mother's side and gave birth to her oldest son in Mexico. She and the baby eventually made it back to Chicago, but not before being caught during their first attempt to re-enter the United States. Ana Laura had no idea that the sheet of paper the immigrant official gave her was a removal order, so she just forgot about it and continued to make her life in Chicago. Eventually, she worked for a labor rights organization, and they agreed to sponsor her application to legalize. So she made plans to go to Mexico to initiate the process, because if you're undocumented, often one of the only ways you can legalize is to actually exit the country and start the process in Mexico or in your country of origin. In September 2016, as she was waiting for a plane to board, two ICE officers approached her and asked her to accompany them to another room. After running her fingerprints, the officers told her she had a prior removal order issued in 2000. Since she had lived in the country despite the order, she was summarily deported with a 20-year ban. She arrived in Mexico on the same flight, perhaps ironically, on the same flight she thought was going to lead her to her legalization in the United States. And she can't shake the suspicion that her labor rights activism is what put her on ICE's radar. After all, they were looking for her specifically. They didn't pick anybody out. It wasn't a random check. They went for her. 
um, they went for her specifically. Maddie, much like Ana Laura, also left children in the United States, three US citizens and her eldest, a DACA recipient. Though I don't have time to share Maddie's history with you, I do want to say that Maddie has gone on to participate at various moments with Deportados Unidos en la Lucha, with Otros Dreams en Acción, and with Madres Soñadoras Internacional, Dreamers Moms International. The last organization focuses on women uh, who have uh, dreamers here in the United States or DACA uh, kids in the United States but were deported to their countries of origin. I mentioned her along with Anna because both have to deal with being separated from their kids and are only able to see their US citizen children since under this administration, DACA recipients are no longer eligible for advanced parole. And Laura and Mari can only see their youngest kids if the fathers have the economic resources to pay for airplane tickets and the will to send their kids to see their mothers, something that's unfortunately not a guarantee. The capriciousness of the state then is reproduced in the patriarchal relationships they have to negotiate across borders. In addition to negotiating their interpersonal lives across the US-Mexico border, they also rebuild their lives in a country with which they are unfamiliar, and a country que los olvida, that forgets about them, or worse, chooses to ignore their needs. It is not surprising then that Ana Laura, Mari, Maggie, and Diego have all drawn from their knowledge gained in the states to organize in Mexico for a better future. Given the, trans given the transnational lives, ties, and intimacies between the US and Mexico, policies that foster lives have to be enacted on both sides of the border. And returnees and deportees are leading the way, teaching the rest of us how to enact a better world. Thank you. Thank you for what you've shared with us today. Um, we have just a few minutes for questions, uh, if anybody would like to approach one of the microphones. What I didn't understand is this, uh, um, on this last, is this something new, or did this predate all these, the more recent immigration issues? In other words, did you talk to people who deported before? I'm trying to sort of see how much to blame on the recent changes. <laughs> right, so that's a great question. Um, the United States has historically tried to remove people, but the ways in which they did it, how intensely they went after people, and how long the bars were has, is what's changing. So. Often people, and I didn't have a chance to talk about it here, but um, there are historical antecedents. Uh, most notably in the 1930s, the US government deported uh, you, uh, Mexican immigrants along with Mexican American US citizens to Mexico. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people I talked to were deported under Obama. Obama deported more undocumented immigrants and prior presidents. But the, the intensity and the, the kind of geographic specificity is part of what is a new trend. And one of the things that I'm thinking about, um, again, this is new research for the, for the book, but one of the things I'm thinking about is the expansion of, not just of the border, but of the carceral state, right? You have, you have the government has excised and removed people, and in doing so, it's, I think there's an argument to be made that it's an extension of the carceral state. Instead of keeping people in cages here, they're keeping them in cages here and then they're banishing them. Um, and so I, that's, I think, what is a, a, a particularly of the contemporary moment. Can I add to that too? Yes, please. Does, does, does this thing work? Okay. Um, I just happen to have a statistic because, um, you know, sociology, we do that. Um, in the first nine months, uh, this, uh, the ACLU filed a, a brief. Um, I mean, they're, 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 they're um, contesting the border separations right now. And they filed in um, July 30, 30th of 2019. And, what, and of course, they had to gather a bunch of statistics and experts' um, testimony. But in the first nine months of the current fiscal year, 427,881 members of families were separated. This compares with 161,000 and 113 during the entire 2018 fiscal year. So there is something to be said about the current administration too. Just adding on to 
what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I have a question for the other two panelists since we just asked a question for the third. Um, Professor Segura, mm -hmm. is that right? That's it. Can you say a little bit more about scholar activism? I know you said that you hoped that it would come up yeah. in the question and answer. And so what it sort of looks like, and you said that uh, as your research continues, you are fleshing out what mm -hmm. scholar activism looks like, how we define it, and how it should be defined. And I wonder if in your response you'll talk about what that looks like pre-tenure, post-tenure, what that looks like based on the type of institution a person is at, regionalism, all of those things. And then, uh, Professor Wingfield, if you could say a bit more about the outsourcing of this, this equity work, right? And as a historian, I couldn't help but think about if this has always existed or if this began to exist uh, when we begin to have this language about diversity and inclusion. And if you'll speak about like the ramifications, does this cost these uh, professionals in terms of promotion, in terms of family life? I'd just like to learn a little bit more. Thank you both. Thank you all. All right. Um, okay, in terms of the of scholar activism, I mean this this tradition has been around with us for quite some time. Okay. And, but I think it's gone through different iterations depending upon, especially if you consider yourself to be someone who's in the academy because as a direct kind of, there's a direct relationship with your participation in, the civil, in one of the civil rights movements, okay? So it's that generation, there's generational differences. So my study is really gonna be about generational differences. So that we're, because one of the things, and I'm not saying this is true, mind you. I'm only telling you what some of my early people are telling me who are like my age and a little older, a little older. And um, because he's like, well, you know, remember when we entered the academy, we were the first ones. Okay, so they had a whole series of challenges and barriers in terms of, you know, how they were, the relationship to the conventional canon and to bring in new research that was very steeped in the needs of the community. And this is how they saw their work. But what I didn't get to read about was how, um, like the Plan de Santa Barbara, what it did is that it held, it held faculty accountable to the, to the community and to students. So that students were supposed to be our conscience okay, in terms of how activism, scholar activism was gonna be done. Now, other generations, I'm curious as to if other generations also agree to that sort of configuration. So there's that, but there's also gender differences, how men and women, and, and maybe LGBTQ and trans folks, scholars, um, see their activism is probably, I would hypothesize, different. Okay, because they are speaking to different communities, different needs that are themselves becoming um, more and more, you know, uh, contested within the realm of the social world. So I'm just saying, so that it has potentials for possibilities. So, I mean, I had started off just thinking generational, but then people are like, oh no, it's this, this, and this. I'm like, okay. And you know, that's kind of the beauty of qualitative work. You get surprised. And so, so I think that's part of it. But I also think that this, the student accountability part is, is, is interesting. And, um, and, 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 and people, especially the older you get sometimes, the less, it, it becomes more difficult to see this 18-year-old you know, telling a 64-year-old, like, you're telling me what? And, um, but you know, we gotta, so how you think that through for some of my colleagues is, I think, was gonna be a, an interesting project. Thank you, so I was excited to hear your question because since I didn't mention racial outsourcing in the presentation and you did, that means you've at least read some of the book or are familiar with some of the ideas in it, which is exciting. Uh, so the main argument that I make in the book for people who haven't had a chance to look at it is that uh, when we think about how um, economic structures are shifting and cultural changes are happening, the argument that I make is that one of the results of this is that organizations say that they want more racial diversity, but rarely put the resources and effort and attention to actually achieving it. And as a result, I argue that they engage in what I refer to as racial outsourcing, which is basically when they shift all of this labor onto black professionals and have them do the work of making organizations more accessible and palatable to communities of color. And that what ends up happening for black professionals is that they do what I refer to as the equity work 
of having to do this work of making these organizations places that communities of color can, if not thrive, uh, enter, and if they are entering as workers, can work equitably and comfortably or some semblance of that. So I think your question about the timing and historicism of it is a really important one, because I think there's a mixed answer to some degree. I think that to some degree, yes, some element of this has always been prevalent for black workers in the sense that I think we can point to a long history of black workers who have tried to make organizations and social spaces and public spaces and so forth more available and welcoming to communities of color. But what I think has shifted in the current era and the current iteration of this is that organizations now at least talk more about that being something that they want openly to be able to achieve in ways that I don't think that they did in previous eras. And I think some of these sh shifts have to do with our movement into this much more neoliberal era, where coupled with our shift into an era where demographics are changing and the racial populations of the United States are changing, right? So I think in many organizations and in many industries, there is at least a tacit acknowledgement and some lip service to the fact that, look, the population is changing. We have to be able to address this. And in an era where there are increasing increasing numbers of communities of color whose business we want, who at least we want to be able to at least say we're trying to work with and hire to avoid getting sued. We do have to put something on paper or something out there that says that we're trying to, to, trying to integrate and involve these communities, right? And I think that's a big difference from, what we were, from where we were before. But I think that at the same time, in trying to react to and compete with the, or trying to react to and be part of the demands and the pressures in a neoliberal economy, organizations also are present to these inexorable pressures that say that the only thing that really matters is the bottom line and workers don't matter as much. And if we can continue to, to shift and extract resources from workers without actually putting uh, resources and funding and other things into their labor, then this is the model that we're comfortable with and this is the model that we have chosen. And we see this in present in a lot of the ways that work has changed, whether it's in terms of new models where worker turnover is now a part of the model rather than something to be discouraged, or new models of work where uh, organizations rely a lot more on contingent workers and contract workers so that they don't have to pay them benefits or classify them as employees. If anyone has followed the recent Uber news, you know that this has been a big scandal happening with the gig, econ gig economy right now, that organizations are really fighting this effort to make, to make workers classified as employees, because if you do that, you have to pay them benefits and maybe put in something to their health care, even though they are actually people who are working long hours of their lives to make your corporation more money, right? So I think that one of the ways that we see this manifested in the current day is that the the needle that organizations thread now is to do some of what my respondent, uh, Stephen the nurse, said. They say on paper, it's important to be more diverse and we care about this and this is something that we really value. But in a neoliberal economy, they often don't put the resources behind that. And I think that um, public acknowledgement of the where of the play, that public acknowledgement of where organizations fall and the shifting demographics of the United States are where we see a different shift than what we would have seen if we looked back 50 years ago and what these patterns of racial outsourcing and equity work might have looked like then. I think that might be all we have time for. Or one more. One more, one more, yeah. Yes, one more and then. Uh... I, well, I was gonna ask three more, oh. so <laughs> I will oh. cut, it, cut myself short. Um, and, and maybe just because it sort of tags on, on what you just asked, Denise. I am so fascinated by this question of scholar activism and um, it's a huge one for me mm -hmm. and you mentioned kind of looking at generational differences, and I'm wondering if you've also looked at disciplinary differences. I'm a UC system trained sociologist, but I'm in an international studies, political science dominated department. And the way that I operate is I somehow call my research policy relevant. Mm -hmm. it's, thus, it's then not activist, it's policy relevant. But what is, who are policymakers? I mean, the, the, the vast array of policymakers is so broad and wide that if we even trouble the category a little bit, it, it, it allows us to do a lot of work. So I'm curious, like how, how disciplinarily um, does that, do you think that shapes the conversations around on what types of activism are, are considered rigorous and legitimate and so forth? That's another question I'm going to ask, because in a prior study I did um, that I briefly mentioned on, on Latina, uh, Latinas 
faculty, they talked about the differences between the, uh, if you're gonna go into Chicano studies or, or women's studies versus uh, an ethnic studies versus the conventional psychology, sociology, blah, blah, those, you know, the, the, the big one, the big conventional, traditional. And so that the work they have to do with the, with, in terms of building a canon versus building and legitimating and contesting a canon, okay, is a little bit different. I mean, they're both, and that one seems to have more, um, like the, how do you say, the, the interdisciplinary departments, they seem to have more of a, dialogue with local communities than in the, co the conventional ones, except for the exception of education. Education is its own little world that does all kinds of stuff. Okay, they're, they're different. Um, but I'm just like saying, they, they seem to be, the barrier, it, it just seems to be more of a challenge with the conventional canon, because the interdisciplinary ones are, are constantly building and changing, whereas the sociology and psychology and all them, they're not. They're very much, let's go like, let's go dissect a brain, you know? I mean, if you're psych and you're the brain sciences, you know? And I mean, it's, it's not about that. So they have to, their work is a little bit different. And how they see their roles as activists is more policy oriented. And that's what's gonna be interesting to sort of tease that out because in what ways and how are they conceptualizing that? Because they, will, they, they use that, they say that. Okay, thank you very much. I oh, have a question of her. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, did any of your respondents um, talk about, I mean, it was interesting because, you know, male nurses make more money than female nurses. And so, um, so when, when here's, I, th I found it kind of funny that here's this guy, the nurse, talking about diversity and stuff like that. Did you ever, what did he think about the fact that his category makes more money than the women nurses um, in, his, in his workplace or in general in the mm -hmm. society? Did, did they have the awareness of that? Um, so I did not talk with respondents as much about salary and pay, but um, what I think comes up out of particularly black nurses um, is the contrast in gendered relationships between black men and black women in nursing versus black men and mm -hmm. black women in medicine, right? Uh, one of the things that I talk about in the book is how for black women, because of the experiences like what Aisha described and this very overt feeling as though every day was this constant barrage of people assuming you're the nurse or uh, sure. men, yeah, right, or not even just that though also, right? That men assuming that eventually you're just gonna go have a baby and you're gonna leave even though you've worked for literally over 10 years of your life towards getting to this, mm -hmm. this goal, right? These types of, assault, uh, of um, onslaughts were so regular that black women actually described, who were in medicine, who were doctors, described a real feeling of solidarity much more so with other women in medicine than they did with black men, who they felt experienced some of the challenges that they did, but by virtue of being men, were able to exempt themselves from a lot of those, those issues. That was not the case for black women or black men who were in nursing, because their racial experiences were so much more pronounced. There was much more of a sense of solidarity and a sense of we're all in this together because we are all going to work every day and experiencing these extremely vicious racist experiences. But to your point, it would be, and I didn't talk with respondents about pay and salary, um, so I don't know how much that did or did not factor in, but it would be interesting to know if that sense of solidarity would still be present, yeah. if there was a sense that mm -hmm. uh, we might all still be experiencing these same challenges, but black men are still more likely to make more than us in this particular profession. They are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, as we shift from a uh, panel to our next keynote, I'll just take a few minutes to make some announcements. So after, immediately after our next keynote, I'd like to ask all the presenters and speakers to please come up to the, uh, your left-hand side of the stage. We wanna do a group photo. So that's after the uh, third keynote this afternoon. Um, so I'll, we'll just, if you wanna just stretch in place, please, <laughs> for just a minute or two, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Yes. 
pop it right there, and then this one is unattached. So right. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Do you, is Coco Balnana still? Oh, yeah. She's ever yeah. seen it, but now she's keeping um, power in the, in the administration. So she's yeah. in the academic senate right now. She would know me. Yes, please. I've known her for a long time. We miss her. She's up there in Oakland and she's my headquarters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if we can put this in and then you can just remind me how to I'm I because I'm I am cognizant of time, I was thinking I'm gonna flip through the first two slides and go right to slide four. Do you want me to just start it there? Yeah, why don't you do that? Right. Yeah, that, that's this good. One? Yeah. yeah. And then it's just this button right here. You just tap that, just tap and that, that will move it forward for you. Okay. Okay. Is that, is that good? Why is there another one so there? So this is showing you what's coming next. Oh, okay. So okay. Me, I can change the view, No, that's though, fine. Yes. I'll, I'll move my stuff out there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> I should bring my book up just to show you my book. Okay, please, if you would come back. It's been two minutes. Oh. <laughs> they should have at least another It's two been minutes. at least two minutes. <laughs> it's right here. <laughs> Maybe I could, I could show the first, I could show the opening slide and then. Okay, you want Kate to come and help? Yeah. Or, okay. Or, well, your opening slide is up there. Yeah, yeah. I, I just not the title of the of the. I see. Okay. But I'm just trying to see where it is here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, our third keynote as we are sitting down. <laughs> and I suggest you stand a little close to the microphone. Though, yeah. Because, yeah, yeah will. it's hard to hear sometimes. Right. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Jane Parpart, Emeritus, Emeritus Professor and former Lester Pearson Chair in International Development at Dalhousie University, Adjunct Research Professor at Carleton University and University of Ottawa and University of Massachusetts, Boston. So she has been at all those institutions. Mm -hmm. She has written extensively and some of the most interesting uh, areas uh, of, of peace and gender. Uh, for example, she has written uh, about gender and development, gender mainstreaming and empowerment, masculinities and insecurity, as well as gender agency and silence voice in insecure sites, particularly in urban southern Africa. Her recent writings include Rethinking the Man Question, uh, co-author and exploring the transformative potential of gender mainstreaming in international development institutions, militarized masculinities, heroes, and gender inequality during and after the nationalist struggle in Zimbabwe, imagine peace, gender relations, and post-conflict transformations, women, gender equality, and post-conflict transformation, and it goes on, Rethinking Silence, Voice, and Agency latest book. in Contested Gender train, Terrains, her latest book. So today, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome her and for having uh, accepted to uh, come here and give her talk. And the title is Exploring the Power of Silence in a Troubled World, a Gendered <coughs> Approach. Please welcome Dr. Parpart. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'm, I 
am conscious of the, the need to be um, concise and not to ramble on. So I've cut off two, um, two slides, which we're basically going to talk about um, what the subject is, which is basically the issue of looking at silence, not as something that is uh, disempowerment and, and forced on you, but silence that is also can be uh, powerful, it can be um, important, it can, sorry, I was thinking I can just work from here. And so that voice can be disempowering and silence can be powerful. So this is actually a project that, that emerged, there's a little bit of a history with it, in that I was, I've been involved in writing and activism and um, basically work in Asia as well as Africa around gender and development for a long time. And um, I think that it's, most of the early work on, on gender, women, gender, and development has assumed that, a, that um, the issue was to, to get, find the voice of women and to publicize the voice of women. And to, it, it was all about women, women's action, women's public voice, public speaking. And I think that um, at the time, we were, that was the way, that was the problem that we were set to solve. You know, we were seeing the issue of women not having a public voice, not having a voice that could make a difference. We were seeing that as the issue that has to be overcome. And silence was pretty much seen as the negative that we were fighting against. And so it's, it's taken a long time for me to begin to think, well, maybe, maybe is silence always being silenced? Is silence always something that is just uh, a negative disempowerment? Can it have, does it have no character of its own that could be more positive? And so that, that began to make me think about silence as an issue. And in fact, it led to, um, when I was involved in teaching and writing about gender and development, I wound up in a quarrel with Nyla Kabir on this, because I had written about how uh, gender is, um, is a form of, of she, she defined gender as voice and agency. And she said, gender a, gen, a woman, women and power has to be centered around women finding their voices and speaking out, not only understanding their problems, but speaking out about them. And Nyla Kabir had that as a central definition of what empowerment is. And I had been involved in a, a book on empowerment in about 2003. And I, at first I, I, I thought, okay, I can see that. And then I began to think, that actually, is it always disempowering? Is silence never something that can be um, an action? Is silence something that's always an absence, a negative? And I began to think about this, and I, in, in 2010, I wrote an article called Choosing Silence. That was sort of my first, <laughs> foray out into saying, maybe we need to think about silence differently. Maybe silence is not always disempowering. Maybe it can be also a form of action, a form of agency. And uh, I got quite a bit of feedback, negative feedback to that, you know, because I was basically undermining one of the basic assumptions that voice is the thing that we have to focus on. That if women don't have voice, then they don't have power, then they don't exist. And so, 
by by getting into this uh, you know kind of arena, I then sort of began to think, well, maybe I need to think about this I the issue of women women's voices more, and I began to look at. Um, at the classic literature on develop, gender and development, which was so focused on the struggle for women's voices to come out. And this is a historic struggle, and I think I began also to see we have to ask the bigger question, how is the issue of voice and silence embedded in historic change? And look, going back to the Grimke sisters in the United States in the 1830s, they, they gave, one of them in particular was very, very um, um, profound and, and a great speaker, and she gave a talk in Boston in a public arena, one of the big halls, and the next day, a Bo the Boston newspapers had headlines saying, Grimke sisters speak in public. And it was, it was regarded, and that reminded me of the fact that, you know, all around the world there has been a tendency towards seeing um, the issue of women and voice as, as always possibly problematic or even dangerous. And so I began to look at the, at the mainstream gender literature around, um, women struggle for a better life, for a better position, and their, the role of voice in that. And was there anything in that, that where we could say that silence was not, um, silence was a problem or not? And I think that when you look at the initial struggle and then you look at the struggle picking up again in the gender and development literature in the 70s, um, 60s and 70s, you begin to see that um, the historic struggles for women's voice and women's public voice uh, was a key issue. And that dominated not only the women's movement in, in, uh, in the global north, but it also affected the way the gender and development discussions and actions uh, were emerging in the in the 1980s and 90s when we were looking for ways to help women all around the world, women in the global south, to to get what we thought was needed for women, which was to gain, to help them gain voice and to be able to speak out. So there was a way in which the assumptions that were embedded in the global north genders gender conflicts were then just put into the gender and development world as the, the assumption that this is what, um, you know, this is what was normal and this is what, and the solutions, for instance, this, get this a little closer, the, the gender and development um, institutions, and I was involved in quite a lot of gender and development activities in, in Canada, and that it was, basically about women as peacemakers. It's continued, this, this, this focus on gender and women and girls and speaking out as being the solution to everything has been characteristic of the girl effect. You know, the girl effect was this idea that you, you give a girl a cow and then, and then she uh, takes care of it and the next thing you know there are two cows and then there are three cows and then the men invite the little girl to a council and then they hear her and then they respect her and so then, then she becomes a, a, an important person and she, she makes the difference. The whole idea being a kind of um, fantasy about the ability of, of a girl, of girls to overcome um, patriarchy everywhere in the world. And so that I think became um, a very important um, to me, that, that was like a red flag. It was like saying, okay, there's something here that's missing. There's something that we're not really seeing. And so, and then also the, we see then also in the development industry a failure to really pay attention to 
to masculinities and to gender and to patriarchy. So that it's still the women, you know, the good little brave woman is going to get the money from our project, is going to go out and make a difference. Uh, but it was very much embedded in, in the assumptions about how the world works from the global north. So then, I think this is where we have to begin to ask questions about the emergence of resistance from the global south to what it is that is seen as normal for gender and normal for gender relations. And I'm not saying um, that basically I think we began, we began to get some important scholarship coming up from the global south. That, was, that has been arguing that uh, you cannot just take a northern perspective, that this, especially this assumption that liberal or neoliberal solutions are the solutions for everyone. And so that began to be questioned. And I think some people in the development world and in the gender, uh, the northern gender um, movements, uh, women's movements, began to understand that maybe we need to look at the world differently. We can't just assume, we can't read the world off our experiences of being uh, women. And uh, so I think the women and gender relations, we, we began to see that women and gender relations are embedded in economic, cultural, and political institutions and that there's a great deal of variation I think that's the thing. The, the post-colonial is beginning to really say, hey, we're not all the same. And that's very important because, especially when the global north had most of the money, you know, money talks. And often so the assumptions about how gender was to be dealt with in the north were just plunked on to the global south. And I think so we began to understand the need to focus on, um, this is difficult for me, on to require a focus on gender inequality and gender relations around the world. And I think we began the, this is not just gender and development community, but it's also the women's movement, I think, began to have to deal with some very serious, complex scholarship coming out of all over the world that raised questions that made it clear that you couldn't just read like something like the girl effect. I still, to this day, am amazed that the girl effect what didn't bring down uh, the wrath of, of feminists. But it just, you know, would, went along as this easy idea. And that yet now, as we've begun to get a more deeper, complex understanding of gender operating around the world, in different ways, in different contexts, with so many differences, that we need, we began to see that the absolute need to stop plunking northern solutions and northern answers onto people concerned with gender inequality all around the world. I'm not saying that there, I'm not say, saying that there isn't, um, there doesn't, there's still the same concern, I think, about gender inequality, because gender inequality exists all over the world. But it's, this, it's the idea that we really need to also think about the diversity. And, but the, initially, I think that it was very much of a, uh, in the feminist po post-colonial interventions, you do start getting more attention to cultural, economic, and social, and political um, institutions and practices around gender around the world. And you begin to get the development of a more comparative scholarship, which I think is very important. I think the politics of gender equality in particular life worlds becomes much more something that people are talking about and writing about, and that's very, very important. In that, I think the role of silence 
It took a while, I think, for silence to be seen as anything more than silenced. But post-colonial scholarship actually started to, to discuss silence sort of obliquely in certain ways, and it's now become much a bigger discussion. But initially, I think we looked at, for instance, the uh, scholars uh, writing on the Ubuntu movement in, um, in Africa. They managed to take apart and say, okay, you know, the Ubuntu movement in Africa reflects the continuing of gender hierarchies, but it also provides spaces where, where of difference, of ways in which gender relations are seen in different ways. And uh, I'm realizing I need to get my, can I get my glasses? I really can't read my writing. So I'm just, that's okay. I'm, I'm just starting to think about some different cases around the world where, that's much better. Oh, right? uh, shouldn't, I was gonna think I can do it without glasses, but no, I can't, right? So the thing about Ubuntu is that it begins to, um, to make the argument, you know, that voice is not the same in Africa in many societies, and that we, we have to see, and that there are times when silences are actually crucial part of the way in which gender relate to each other and the way in which gender is seen. And the most, one of the most important books, one of my most favorite books by Saba Mahmoud, she unfortunately died early, but she spent two years with the pietists in Egypt. She did the most amazing field work. She embedded herself in this organization where she, patriarchy appeared to be in charge of everything. It was very patriarchal on the surface. The leaders were men. And so at first she assumed that women in that organization were really being oppressed and really being um, kind of the classic Western notion of, of gender oppression. And then she began, it's a good thing, she stayed for two years and she got so embedded, she talked to the women in the Pietist movement and she began to see them, they began to say to her things like, well, I really have, a, I have a great uh, feeling of Goodness, goodness and, and value because of my knowledge of and attention to religious practices, modesty, and the silences, uh, as well as voice. So she, she, she concluded in the end that within this patriarchal institution, there were spaces where women were able to construct their own understanding of being there and to actually feel empowered and that this empowerment included the judicious use of silence as well as voice. So I, f I found her work very interesting. And then, so I was looking all around the place for sort of more to let me know how silence and, and power can work together. In China, I found a very interesting work about the way in which women in many Chinese families which were very patriarchal in terms of their structure. Men were the ones that were supposed to be in charge and make the rules. Yet, this author uh, discovered that there, were, that there was a way in which women developed sort of proper practices within the, within the family structure that often involved silences rather than direct confrontation. And that the women involved in this felt empowered by this, it was, an a it was agency for them. It was not just oppression, that they could understand it differently. And among the Apache people, the, the amazing work of Keith Basso, he discovered that the, the native communities of the Apache 
tribe uh, or nation, I think it's better nation, um, that, they, that they often had, in fact, that they had about six key elements in proper behavior for citizens that required silence, that silence was part of their, their life style and, and community, and that if you didn't know the rules and if you spoke out when you were supposed to be silent, that that actually could be very disempowering and you could wind up with, with uh, very negative consequences. So that basically we begin to see in some scholarship that silence is not always being silent. Silence can also be a way in which people organize their lives, understand themselves, and relate to the world and to each other. So this began my journey. I started thinking, well, I know that I'm always used to the idea that silence is being is a negative force. Silence is something you're not looking forward to. You're not trying to understand because it's just a negative thing you want to end. But actually, I think that I began to see that silence often seen as disempowering. It's often seen that way, especially in the West, but in other places too. But that it also, it can also be powerful. And that's what I began to understand. I began to think, how can silence sometimes provide an avenue for not only understanding, but also for, for acting and for making change? Um, and so I began to see, to think about a more complicated approach to silence, and I started reading across the literature. And the literature on silence is, there's some feminist, there's, there's philosophy, there's uh, um, so many different places, communications, anthropology, religion. I've been reading across <laughs> the literature looking for the way in which I can understand silence not as being simply silence, but silence also as potentially powerful. And that has been quite an interesting journey. I began to see silence as a gesture, as a form of communication. It can be as powerful as speech. It can be a source of comfort and reassurance, as well as a site for strategizing and resistance. More, it's more complicated in our complex global world, but it's, it's been there for generations, for thousands of years. So silence began to me to begin to, to have a kind of, take a kind of life of its own. I began to ask myself, now what is it about silence that, what are the levels, what are the kinds of things that can make silence a positive force? I began to realize that at the most basic level, you can ask the question, silence as cope, a coping mechanism. I mean, haven't we all felt that? Sometimes things are just getting out of hand, and the best thing is to just withdraw into yourself and spend time um, alone. Um, that, that silence actually can be a choice. It's the deliberately unspoken. I like that definition of, of silence that it can be not silenced, but it can also be the deliberately unspoken. And it can be a refuge. It can, re it can provide space for agency. One of the examples that, that uh, I like to, to talk about is, is the way in which silence, particularly in conflicts, can be uh, a safe space. And sometimes also silence as a choice on what to say and what not to say. Uh, for example, the, the very important work on the Balkan struggles where there was incredible amount of rape. One of the Z Z Zarkov, I think is her name, she, she and a number of other specialists in that region have realized that after the conflict was over and even during it too, there was constant questions being asked of, of people involved in the war. Did you get raped? Were you raped? Did you let yourself be raped? And what they discovered was 
there was a very wide consensus, an unwritten, unspoken consensus that no, there are certain things that you don't talk about. So there are certain things that you say didn't happen to you, but they did. But then is that a disempowering choice or is that a choice where you've decided to say something that you know is not necessarily true, but it's necessary. It's a, it's a choice about when to speak and how and why and for what end. And so I think that that is like the first what I call silence as coping, a coping mechanism. But I think silence can also enable reflection, healing, rethinking one's position. And I have a lovely co quote here, which I want to read, um, by Stone. This is a, a, a scholar who is writing, and she's saying, there is a silence in which you have no voice, but there's also a silence in which you have chosen not to express your voice. That's a nice place. It's a place of freedom, ultimate and total freedom, so much that it is a more spacious voice. So here they're saying silence can be a spacious voice. It can be a space where you can understand and express yourself, but not with words. And so I found that very, very powerful. And then it also can provide a space for more intelligent choices. Audre Lorde has a wonderful quote where she says, it can be a place of refuge. Silence can be a place of refuge. A time for oneself, a site for pushing away competing voices and developing new dreams and visions. So silence is beginning to emerge as a space that has great potential in many different ways. Max Picard, the famous philosopher from the 50s, said silence is spiritual rather than material. And he said, there is more help and healing in silence than in all the useful things. I love that quote. And the Buddhists, of course, have, have um, made a fine art out of medi meditation, and silence is deeply embedded in the way they see the world. But I think it's also, silence can also be a platform for organizing resistance, strategizing, organizing resistance, and healing. So it can produce calm mental and physical space to think calmly, to strategize how to challenge oppressive forces. Um, Audrey Rich has a wonderful uh, quote. She says, silence can be a plan rigorously executed I'm trying to see where is, am I on two? Right, okay. Um, sorry, now I'm on to three. Uh, silence can be a place rigorously executed. Do not confuse it with any kind of absence. And Anita Hill is a good demonstration of how silence and voice can be interwoven and also intermittent. She. She was harassed by the, the um, a person, um, yes, what is the name? I'm blanking. Yeah, Fl Clarence, yeah. Thomas, yes, Clarence Thomas. And so she constantly, she had endured a lot of, she endured a lot of um, harassment from him. And in that situation, she was junior, and she didn't feel really safe to speak out and just come right at him. So she chose silence then. So this is where we start to get into this idea of, of choosing silence. Then later on, when he was up for being, when he was being nominated and vetted for being a Supreme Court judge, reminds me a bit of Kavanaugh's story, uh, he, um, she had to really look inside herself and think very deeply about the fact that she had put this all away. She had decided to deliberately not speak in public about this. 
And she decided that she had to, that she had to speak. And so she said, Anita Hill said, her deliberate use of silence and voice demonstrates the power of both silence and voice, reminding us that purposive, purposeful silence resonates with meaning and intention just like that of the spoken word. So I think Anita Hill is a great example of the way in which silence is actually just as important as voice in terms of decisions about behavior, decisions about what to do, what to say, what to not say. And I think, I think this is... Uh, So we're beginning, I'm beginning to, this is now almost the last slide, where I'm, I'm basically laying a case for why silence can't just be seen and dismissed as something that is, you know, something only for victims, that it's something that, that women who are victimized do. And I think that um, what, what I've tried to argue is that silence is actually something that has a great potential. It can be used in many different places, some different sites, and it has a lot of power. I think in the last slide, I start to look more at some of the other possible ways that we can think about silence. For instance, performing silence, um, and Patricia Collins um, has discussed the way in which she said someone accused her, she said, the black community, women are not speaking out. And she, she just said, you know, you have to understand that we choose what we can speak about and what we can't. And she said that African American women have used silence to protect themselves and their children, but they also use it as a site for consolidating internal resources and strategic ways to deal with the impact of race, class, and gender oppression. So basically, Patricia Collins is saying, voice is important, but there are times when silence is necessary and important also. So it's another form of power. Then there's also the issue of collective silence. And that is one of the, one of the things that it, it really has made it a big impact on me. Collective silence has turned out to be much more powerful, we thought. The mothers of the disappeared in Argentina, they were laughed at in Argentina at first. They said, what good is it for you to sit around silently every Sunday with your diapers on your head to symbolize your lost children? And, and yet, we know that the mothers of the disappeared played a key role in bringing down a really dreadful sexist, militarized government. The other group that I think is a wonderful example, and there are many, many more, but the Women in Black. Women in Black movement, which is one, one time, uh, Cynthia Cockburn, who's involved with that movement herself, and I happened to be in, in London at the same time I was, and she dragged me down to one of these in T Trafalgar Square. And there were, it was very interesting because the, um, you know, it, at first I get down there and there's like several hundred people in Trafalgar Square and the, the traffic is going by and we're saying nothing. And I thought, wow, this is, this is, at first I thought, well, what is this? And then I began to feel this kind of collective power that comes with standing in silently with other people. And, on, and uh, there's a wonderful quote by Cynthia that, that I think um, summarizes it all. She says, there is something calming about vigiling, holding yourself in silence and stillness as city workers and tourists mill around you and the taxis and buses stream past. What restores me as I stand there once again in the presence of other women and men at my shoulders is the carefully thought out message we are trying to put across and feeling hundreds of similar 
such meetings are occurring around the world. And so, and so just having gone and experienced that made me realize that, you know, we, we so much assume, it's so easy to assume that you've got to stand up and shout and make a difference, but si silent uh, resistances have, uh, can be extremely powerful, very important. So we shouldn't just overestimate the need for always to be shouting and, and speaking out. And we should understand that there are multiple ways of being powerful, and silence is another way that it often is possible. Then there is the, the so collective power of silence is very important. Also, silence and voice being intertwined. And this is very interesting. Um, I think Anita Hill made very interesting use of when to be silent and when to, when to speak out. Um, the Rwandan genocide survivors are also, I have a, a student who actually went and, and was in Rwanda post genocide and actually got, was able to talk to, pe to people on the QT. Um, because people were afraid to speak out. But she, she, um, what she discovered is that certain, that the Rwandan survivors of the genocide, they will speak sometimes, and then there are other times they will not speak. That people in Rwanda have to be very careful about when they speak out and when they don't. And so that silence and voice are often sort of mixed. You can be you have to know the circumstances. When is it okay to be silent, and when is it necessary uh, or possible to speak? So I think silence and voice as intertwined, you know, as existing together in a relationship is very important. And there is, and one of the other chapters in the book, um, on, on um, my book, my Routledge book on, on rethinking voice and silence voice and, and agency is the issue of silence in voice. There's a wonderful chapter by Harel Shalev and, and Daphne Tekoa. They did, they interviewed um, women who were in the Israeli army and they began to realize that sometimes the women they were talking to would use the word I I did this, I did that, I, and it was usually when they were feeling very strong about the story they were telling and confident that they, were, they could express the fact that this is what I did. And then she found sometimes they shifted to you rather than I, because the you was used when when certain words were not sayable, when you couldn't say I, when there were kind of ways in which it, it leaves open a space for silences that, ex, that exist behind the words. So they shift to a word that is more generic, this general you, that detaches it from themselves. So the I is I, I think, I act. You becomes more it's, it, it, pulls, it pulls you, the person, away from the action. And so they've done this very interesting work saying that you have to understand that behind voice there are silences. Behind that shift from I to you is a silence about the fact that there's a sense of insecurity and that you probably shouldn't go there. Um, and so I think this is, I find this very, very interesting, and I think it's an important, um, it, it opens up for me the spaces to, to do more complicated and multi-leveled research, um, to not always look for the voice, not always look for the way in which um, what's spoken, and look behind the voice, or around the voice, or <laughs> underneath the voice. So in conclusion, then, I think that gendered power cannot be solely linked to voice. And I, and I think we're much too apt to think about uh, 
voice and power and silence as disempowerment. So I think that moving away from that is very important. It complicates, but when you begin to read the material and then you think even about your own life and the times when you chose to say or not say things. Well, I'm sure we have all experienced that. And that's, I think it's very important for us to understand that that's not avoidance necessary, it's a, it's a choice. It's an action. I think that's an action. So, so a move away or a silence can be something that is just as much agency, just as much action as a deliberate speaking out. So sil silence as well as voice, I think need to be, they need to be studied together. And I'm, that's what my book is claiming that really if we're taking silence more seriously, then don't we need to always have that in the back of our mind to look what's, what's being said? It's so easy for us as social scientists to think that what matters is what you hear or what's written down. But what about what you don't hear and what's not written down? I think if we begin to ask questions about the way in which silence can be very powerful and very important and make a big difference. I think that's very uh, crucial. And then, sorry, I, I can't read up behind me. I think we have to understand that silence is more, more powerful, complex, and communicative than we have assumed. That's really what the conclusion of the book, that, that silence is much more powerful. It's not just being silenced, and that it is much more complicated, and that it is, um, it is a form of communication that needs to be studied as seriously as we study words. And finally, the post-colonial perspective, I think, has added so much to this because we now have to understand that silence and voice is used differently around the world. And so that if we're going to understand either, we need to understand that we need to look at local contexts, historical and current, and ask questions about, okay, how, what, how does silence operate in your society? And how does voice operate? How do they operate together? And how do they operate in relation to each other. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, I'm happy to. Thank you so much. Questions? Please line up. Microphone in the back and one in the front. This is not the time to be silent. <laughs> right, of course. Did any of these stories resonate with your own? I mean, you. You come from Israel, so. I was very skeptical, very skeptical, because at the beginning it sounded like uh, what something we hear from uh, ultra-Orthodox women who've internalized their situation and say, well, yeah, well, we don't need a voice. This is great. Mm -hmm. But, um, there's no question when you got to women in black, I could relate, and uh, I, I, I bought that. Mm -hmm. the, the collective silence, we often have a demonstration without a sound, and of course right. women in black stood there with their sign saying, uh, end the occupation. Mm -hmm. Not a word, it drove people crazy that they wouldn't say a word. Um, <laughs> I tend to, th it did, it was very effective. There's no question about it. I tend to think Anita Hill is not the best example because like somebody who's untenured, doesn't speak out, I think, I don't think it was a choice out of strength. I think she was afraid to speak out. She found yeah. her voice. Yeah. But I, I, I think the, the thing that got to me in what you were saying, uh, certainly I come with a, a Northern Hemisphere uh, approach, right. and, and I'm sure you're absolutely right. We have to look to difference, but I'm not sure the difference is always as positive as, as you put it. But I, I go with you on the collective, and also okay. with Ayelet uh, Harel's uh, research. 
to dissociate ourselves. So she right. would say, you, you, mm -hmm. know, you do this mm -hmm. or you, you know. But um, I think it's fascinating to look into to more. I'm not there yet. <laughs> You'll have to play with it for a while. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's like looking at the work of, of um, Saba Mahmoud, you know, where she's describing a world that sounds very se sexist and, and very oppressive and, and really forcing uh, women into a very um, dependent situation. And yet she stayed long enough. See, this may be the issue. You see, we, we don't live long periods of time in other people's societies. And she stayed there long enough for two years, embedded in it, um, and she began, finally began to see that there were great, there's a great amount of strength and power, that the women had much more. She went in thinking these women are oppressed, and, and then she realized they were not. They, and that's, you see, that's where we can't define we, we mustn't define oppression just in terms of our own idea of what it is in our own society. We have to also understand that if people are in a, in a situation where they find strength and resilience through the use of silence, that we need to understand that. And the only way you can do that is if you move yourself away from what you think the world should look like. Yes, the rules for silence in the Apaches. And that's another thing, you know, we, the indigenous communities of North America have, all of them have a great reverence for silence. Silence is considered absolutely necessary and the senior people who are the most powerful are the most often using silence as a, as a weapon, as a, as a mechanism of rule and a mechanism of also keeping certain people in line and others not, probably, but I think, I guess, the, for me, the book is really about the importance of us looking at, at silence as, as a serious issue that can be both positive and negative, and not just assume our definition of what it is is the only definition that, that matters. Yeah. Thank you so much for your, your great talk. Um, I got a lot of information uh, to think about as I am working on my book. And I have two questions that I think are related, and I'm still sort of working it out in my mind. I think I am like others in the audience that you talked about sort of thinking through this. Mm -hmm. And as I think about silence as a tactic, as a strategy, um, also as voice, right? Mm -hmm. I think about um, silence in two ways. Silence in terms of the NFL protest with Colin right. Kaepernick. Right. And the fact that he used silence, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But he was silenced and then dismissed. So if you can speak a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. when tactics like that sort of are used against that person or what mm -hmm. happens or, and if it's colored by maybe um, race and gender yeah. and sports and all yeah. of those things. And then yeah. I also think about silence and social media and I think about the response to Brett Kavanaugh's uh, Supreme Court nomination right. and the fact that so right. many women decided to black out their social media profiles. And I think they uh, did it for like 13 hours and it was supposed to just be a black picture. But of course what happens afterwards is, is this conversation about what happened, right? And mm -hmm. there was a debate about whether or not it had its intended purpose. And so by that what I mean is there was one uh, activist who brought in a sort of racial and gendered aspect. And she said black women have long been invisible and silenced. And so she urged black women not to participate in that. And she said this sort of thing is, you know, a white woman's endeavor, right? <laughs> and so there was conversation across um, the aisle about how useful it was. And mm -hmm. so again, I just want to sort of complicate or have you sort of tell us what you think about that, both in terms of sports today, mm -hmm. but also social media, because we, we right. see that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very good questions. I mean, I think if you look at the response and the um, writing, the public, you know, in newspapers and TV and everywhere about the, the, um, the football team refusing, 
I thought that was a magnificent example of how um, you can protest silently. And I don't care. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry that Trump was able to actually hurt one of the players by publicly, you know, dismissing them and everything. But I think that the impact of that, um, that silent, is like, like a silent performance. So it's a performance that is made more powerful by being silent. If they'd stood up and started making noise, it wouldn't have been nearly as powerful as it was just by them sitting there in defiance on public television in front of millions and millions of people. And it drove Trump absolutely bonkers, which delighted me and I'm sure most of us. But uh, so I think, I think we have to weigh, you know, a lot of times when you do something that is uh, a challenge, um, you will have, there'll be consequences. But that doesn't mean that that challenge is unimportant. And if you weigh the two, if you weigh the impact of the performance of resistance and what happened to one person, it seems to me that it's really, really uneven. Um, in terms of the other, um, remind me, I'm so, I got so caught up in the first, remind me of the second just quickly. It was about social media. Right, social media, yeah. Well, social media, I think, is, um, you know, it'd be interesting to make an analysis of whether social media is just voice. You know, is it a place where we're speaking, but we're not speaking verbally, but we are speaking and being read or not read? So that's one possible way of thinking about that. But I think another way is thinking that, well, social media is also, it's another one of these mechanisms where you can do, you can resist, you can choose to close down your account if you think that what's being said is wrong. So that's a form of, of resisting by silencing your account. Uh, so that's, that's another, you know, so, so maybe this is part of my feeling that, that silence and voice shouldn't be seen as opposites or different from each other, they're co they are different, but they're connected, they're, inter they're often interconnected. And, and they, their power works together in many ways. So, but the, you know, I think we need to study silences and silencing uh, very seriously, but silencing has tended to be seen always as something that's done to people with no, like, it's disempowering. But silent strategies of resistance, I mean, it's the state, you know, the, the common saying of the silent treatment. I mean, I remember learning about that. My mother used to do that to my father sometimes. And uh, he, he went, nah, you know, completely off the rails over the whole thing, and she knew it. So, I think that w connecting them reminds us that silence has power in itself and voice has power and they are often interconnected. And, but if we have a model where we say silence is always being silenced, so it's always negative, it's always victim, and voice is always action and agency, then we can't see the way in which silence actually operates in a verbal and nonverbal world. So I'm, I'm, I'm very hoping that a lot of younger scholars will take this up and, and seriously begin to think about it, because especially I, I hope it will be done in contexts all around the world, and people will, will ask questions about how is silence managed in different contexts, at different times, among different people from different racial groups, class groups, everything. There's so many ways it can be, I think, become a powerful tool for thinking about the way in which people manage their social life and their, you know, their, their life in general. Um,
I'm looking at the statement that silence is more powerful, complex, and communicative than we've assumed. And I, I think that's so. In terms of further investigation, it occurs to me that one thing that might be interesting to look at is um, the, the uh, it seems to me that silence is likely to be most powerful when there's already equality, when there's equity in a situation because otherwise it seems like there's manipulation that if, um, and we don't want to put silence and voice as adversaries, but in terms of thinking about what it is that makes silence more powerful, I'd be interested in looking in contexts in which you start off mm -hmm. with equality. Well, I think, but there's very few societies where there's real equality, so I think that's almost an impossible uh, wish. It, it's a nice idea, but I think that in actual fact, most, most societies have, have inequalities built into them. And I think silence, like voice, has the potential to make a difference in how those tensions work out, um, how they're understood, how they're spoken about, how they're not spoken about. Um, I mean, it just for, for me, this approach raises, adds some levels of questions to ask about the way in which a given society or organization or subgroup within it understands and and understands itself, and then how does that come out in, in, through voice, and how does that sometimes operate in in relation to silences? I think I mean, I the first time I really understood the complexity of being able to keep the the power of silence is I took a course on Sufism and I, I walked in and I said, "What is Sufism?" And I get this dirty look from the professor, you know, like, never heard of it, you know. But then he said, he started out the class, he said, all right, everybody, I want you to say nothing for one minute and to keep your mind completely clear. Open your mind to just being. It was absolutely amazing. It was so incredible. I sat there, I was trying my best. I was like really focusing. Then I start thinking, let's see now, what do I need to buy for today, later today? I'm like, oh no, don't do that. I was, <laughs> you realize that our, our minds are so, there's so much stuff that goes running around. And then you realize this Sufi leader that the French were so afraid of in, in French West Africa that they, he, he collected, like, he, he was in one area and he set up 100,000 people moved in to live with him. The French picked him up and put him deep into the desert of the Senegal Sahara. And a year later, there were another 100,000 people out there with him because they were drawn to the discipline and the, the, the in, inner strength required of to do the kind of contemplation and insights that Sufism requires. And so, you know, we, if you, you have to, you look at a world like that, or you look at the Trappist monks who, who don't speak for weeks and weeks and months and months and the power, what is the, what is the power for them in that? But just the fact that it's so hard to get yourself to actually think, not, not have a thought in your mind for a minute. That really got me curious and I stayed in the course and, I, and, and it was a huge impact on me. But so I think we need to think about both silence and voice together and not separate them and not make one less important than the other. I think it depends on circumstances but I think it's very important to do that. Um, and it's a challenge that I throw out to all of you. Uh, my question is just, uh, uh, 
thinking of silence, I'm thinking what you're saying, it could be the person who is oppressed being silent. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking when you're in power and you become silent and I want you to say something, you are in power, then I'm wondering how that dynamic works, right? Like as the previous speaker said, right, there's that equality and then that's where the silence uh, interplays. How can that be? But now I'm thinking, okay, if the ones in power are silent, and the oppressed want you to talk. How does that interplay and how can that work? Uh, that's a very complicated question, I think. I, th I think we have to, um, I think we need a lot more research on this, but I think that we have to understand that there are, there are a lot of uh, religions in particular, but there are a lot of institutions that, um, think that silent reflection is a very important form of behavior. It's a, it's, they see it as just as important as speaking out and, and acting. And so I think that we need to understand that we have to think about different ways in which people understand themselves and the importance of speaking out or not speaking out. Um, and it's, it's very complicated, and, I, and I'm feeling like I'm not saying the words are not quite uh, refined enough and things, but I just want to um, take everyone with me down this journey, and I hope it won't ruin your life or anything, but, <laughs> you know, but I mean, it, it is really intriguing to be able to um, to think that, well, sometimes when, when there's silence, we need to ask the question in our mind, what does silence sometimes mean? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to the person who is using silence as a way of dealing with their life? Um, maybe perhaps this is not a question, but two things you might be able to reflect on. One phrase which has been running through my mind throughout most of your talk is a phrase I have heard, there is no ear to hear and no heart to understand. Huh. So we need to create space that will accept whatever is said. And through my investigations into Native American peoples and their talking circles, mm -hmm. in passing the talking stick, there is a required silence mm -hmm. before the next speaker begins so that there is respectful reflection on what has previously yeah. been said. And so you do not get into this intense emotional interchange. Mm -hmm. And you can, with this time of reflection, move from what one person has said mm -hmm. to another. Right. So, I don't know how that all ties together, but. <laughs> it's very fascinating, but it, it, it fits in with this notion of that we really mustn't think of silence as something is just done to you, being silenced, because it, it's used by people and organizations and in many different ways, but it can be very powerful. And if we ignore it, if we don't see it, if it's just invisible, we're missing out on a lot of how a given society is understanding itself and organizing itself. Does that make sense? I, <laughs> so I've thrown you into a very complicated world, but it's. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It so is exciting much. to be thank working on part. something new. Let me let me thank you, and let me just say this. I think I think what you've touched upon is a it is a very complex yeah. topic, and it's really multifaceted, there's so many layers to it, and so many contexts, if I may put it that way. But there's also, I mean, for me, you touched upon this concept of an inner peace, mm -hmm. or an inner place, mm -hmm. where um, it's nice to go to that place, and not to have to worry about things to say and not to say, and all of that. And also the whole notion of how, how does a society sometimes use silence rather than always voice. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I really wonder about all these different facets. So it's complex, so that th there's all this 
perplexity is a good thing. I hope you realize. Yeah. So I think more research <laughs> is needed, quite frankly. So thank yeah. you so well, much for that wonderful, <laughs> wonderful thank presentation. You. Thank, you. thank you. And if any of you want to write to me about your adventures with silence, I'm most delighted to. No, it's, it's, it's fascinating, actually. So, so we've had a very rich full day. So much to reflect on and to um, really think about. Uh, I'd like to bring this session to a close and this day to a close, but to remind you that tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. we'll have our first keynote on are there male brains and female brains and why do we care by <laughs> Professor Daphna Joel. Um, so 10 o'clock sharp tomorrow, but you can come earlier for coffee and, and uh, some sustenance if you'd like. Um, again, a reminder to the speakers, instead of this side, of, instead of the, your left side of the stage, please go to your right side because our dear photographer, Lance, has told me that that's where the better light is. So if you would please come up front, the, the presenters today. And I thank the rest of you for being here, and I hope you'll join us tomorrow. Thank you very much.